everyone, and welcome to a new episode of a brand new podcast called Rugrats View from the Crib, where we take a look at every single season of Rugrats, as well as the spinoffs and the movies. I am Patricia Miranda. I'm Ziel Coedman. And today we're going to be discussing about season two and comparing it to season one to see how it stacks up, as well as uh, comparing it to the entire franchise. Uh, a week after the uh, post of our season one recap, I posted a poll on the Rugrats View of the Crib Facebook page and asking you guys on what was your favorite episode of Rugrats during season one. And I have the results right here. And we have over 150 votes. So thank you very much to everybody who participated. And I'm just going to read it off and see where the votes lie. I'm just going to read off the five episodes that were ranked as the highest. So, the five episodes that were ranked as the highest were Grand Canyon, Incident in Aisle 7, Tommy's First Birthday, The Trial, and At the Movies. With At the Movies and The Trial tied for first place. I thought The Trial was actually my favorite episode of the first season because, because of the intensity and the tenacity of the pacing and the the setup and the final twist at the end. Yeah. And I also enjoyed At the Movies as well because of the introduction of Reptar and the wacky shenanigans that happened with the babies going around the movie theater and the little commentary on the dummy bears being saccharine to the point of getting diabetes. So it is a very memorable episode. Armor out brains is more like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Laugh without brains is more like it. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh but don't worry. Um we'll be discussing about um another episode later on about grandpa being not interested in something that's geared towards children and him being invested in it. So we'll get to that. Anyway, so believe so I looked at the episodes that were the least voted on. And the episodes that have unfortunately been at the bottom of the list, I'm gonna just read the five of them. They are Ruthless Tommy, Grandpa's Teeth, The Baseball, Monster in the Garage, and Fluffy vs. Spike. Fluffy vs. Spike was actually the least voted episode in the entire poll. I'm surprised that that's actually one of my favorites. I think probably the weakest episode is Reptile's Revenge. No offense to Peter Gaffney, it's just that it just wasn't really my favorite. It wasn't bad or anything, it just felt uneventful compared to the other episodes. Yeah, I agree as well. Reptile's Revenge, in my opinion, is also the weakest episode of season one. Uh, it's, I mean, it would have been a really awesome concept of this rundown carnival and maybe the babies would get themselves into like crazy situations, but it's nothing really to write home about. It's just, you know, some guy dressed up in a reptar suit eating cereal and that's pretty much it. There are some moments that are pretty funny, but other than that, it's just a pretty weak episode compared to the others. But don't worry, because we'll be starting to finally talk about Season 2, and we're going to be starting things off with our first episode, which is Toy Palace. Uh, Also run by Peter Gaffney, which is one of his best episodes. I agree as well. It is not only one of his best episodes, but this is another episode that was actually referenced in Rugrats Search for Reptar. So, this episode debuted in September 6, 1992. After wandering away from their fathers, Tommy and Chucky unwillingly end up playing around in a closed toy store, which they never want to leave. However, they become terrified of an electronic gorilla toy named Thorg, who wants to eat, and tries to and tries to get a get a reptar bar uh, reptar toy to help them. I have to say that you're absolutely right. This is one of the best episodes of the entire series, let alone season two. It kicks things off really intensively with Tommy and Chucky wandering around a closed toy store. This is the episode where I felt like it kind of started to have its own identity. Besides, no, actually. Well, while I don't, while it's still a rehab episode, I still feel like it's where it started to grow its legs. Yeah, I do agree. It does get get into the same old format of season one in which the babies are in some new location. Wacky shenanigans ensue. But here, I feel like there's a little bit more tensity than in 
uh, uh, most of the, in some of the episodes that we've talked about in season one. First of all, uh, it starts off, you know, very nicely with Stu and Chaz walking Tommy and Chucky around this nice toy store. And Tommy and Chucky want to stay around and they never want to leave. And it does so happen to be that way. And then things just start getting a lot more intense with activating a Cowboys versus Indians uh, play, um, a, a model toy village. Then we have the the clown room. Then we have the crazy train ride. Then we have Thorg. Um, and to top it all off with the uh, giant reptar toy, we even have a time machine. A time machine that is access for kids. Like, what? Crazy for a show that plays off of real life situation it says right the baby's talking yeah yeah uh, I, I'm just interested about I mean this is something that you would see in like Jimmy Neutron not Rugrats in which you know you have a kid who gets access to a time machine I mean I can imagine like in the Rugrats universe what would happen is like Angelica would probably go back in time to like the Queen Elizabethan era and see if she can become the princess herself oh yeah that would be so funny so, uh, this episode is really awesome, and there's even a really nice reference to Doctor Who in the form of a Dalek in the background. I think the Rugrats writers must be Doctor Who fans, or someone at KC, Klasky Chupo, probably is a gigantic fanatic of Doctor Who. Yeah, for sure. So, overall, this episode is awesome. It's one of the most memorable episodes of Season 2, let alone the entire f- series. It's intense, it's action-packed, it can be creepy at times, and it's just overall very um, intriguing from beginning to end. And th- later on, they would copy this plot point in an episode of Spongebob much later on. A lot of Nicktoons borrow similar plot elements to each other or uh, similar stories. Yeah, they do, that's true. It's like an 18 cinematic universe or something. They're all kind of like connected incidentally. Oh yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Nicktoon cinematic universe, you remember the time that we talked about the, the movie that Jared Hess wanted to do where he wanted to uh, gather up some of the 90s Nicktoon characters and make them into a film? Yeah. Oh, that would have been awful. Oh, yeah, I agree. Even Bob Camp was really, really awesome. Yeah, and Joe Murray. He hated the idea as well. Thank God uh, Nick exactly told him that they, that they turned it down. That, yeah. was kind of, that was really, really, really out of order for Jared Hess. Oh, yeah, that's one of the few things that I'm glad Nickelodeon has rejected. All right, let's go over to episode 14B, which was also written by Peter Gaffney, and it's called Sand Ho. Intrigued by Grandpa's pirate story, the Rugrats play pirates themselves. Now, I feel that this episode is slightly a uh, downgrade compared to Toy Palace, but it's still a really nice episode nonetheless. It takes this like- is the episode where I felt like it really grew its identity and started to be more like the Rugrats everybody's familiar with than the fair season. Yeah, I, I think so too, but mostly because they focus a lot more on their imagination. While there have been maybe a handful of episodes where they relied on their imagination, I feel like this is one of the, this may be like the first major one. Yeah, I think the first season was when the writers were actually trying to figure out a way to make it, the writing process work and see what they can do with them, see what sticks. But I think that in the second season, they found that niche and it became more about babies using their imagination to envision situations like, for example, them being pirates or being astronauts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, the episode does start off with Grandpa Lou reading Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lilo's story about pirates, discussing about the things that all kids know about pirates. You know, pirates finding buried treasure, X marks the spot on a certain location, all that stuff. And so, Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil pretend that they're pirates. And then we have Angelica in the mix, and she wants to play as a corporal who is after the treasure from the pirate babies. And there's some really funny moments in this episode that I remember laughing so hardly as a kid. Like, uh, especially with the moments with Chucky and Angelica. I think that the moments with Chucky where he starts getting seasick and that scene in which uh, the babies do find the buried treasure and then they throw it into the rowboat and Chucky starts flying up in the air. And uh, one moment, like, uh, where, uh, you know, Angelica is attacking the pirate ship and the the boat is rocking back and forth and they're sinking. And Phil and Lil says, I think we're going to be captured. I think we're going to be trapped. And then Chucky says, I think I'm going to be sick. 
But probably my favorite is has to be when um, Angelica is swinging a rope over to the pirate ship of the babies, and she swings too far off, and she accidentally falls into the ocean. That actually made me laugh so hard. I think that what made Angelica work is that although that she's not a bad person in general, and the the season later shows you what she's really like deep down and why she has the way she does. She always gets to come up and, and the show never insists that her baby is okay. And she's always reprimanded for it. And we're, all, we're never told to really root for her unless the plot's called. That's more than I can say for, for characters like Kaylee or DW. Mm, yeah. Uh, and kind of ironically, because Angelica is much younger than the both of them. Exactly, and she's actually and she's actually a lot more mature and less bratty than they are. <laughs> How ironic, right? Yeah. Overall, this episode is pretty fun. Uh, nice to see the babies using their imaginations, and nice to see a pirate motif. But I feel like Toy Palace was a much more memorable episode than this one. But still, I would give it a recommendation. Me too. All right, next off we have episode 15A, and it's called Chucky vs. the Potty. It debuted on September 13th, 1992, and it was written by Joe and Sullivan Chucky has a difficult decision to make, spending the rest of his life in diapers or learning to use the potty. A dream has his friends forcing him to use the toilet, which inspires him to use the potty for the first time. And here we have a relatable situation for all uh, toddlers and babies about, it's about time that you stop using your diapers and it's about time that you start using the potty like a grown-up. And Chucky is refusing to do it, he's being incredibly stubborn about it, and he wants to keep wearing his diapers forever. And we even have Angelica coming to him saying, don't you get a Chucky, anyone who's anyone is potty trained, and eventually you have to be. And we even have a little callback of Chucky's mom, which we've already mentioned in the season one recap of View for the Crib, in which um, Chucky mentions about his mom. And we already talked about how uh, you know they couldn't use, they couldn't add in Chucky's mom. Uh, the, the the plot about her either being dead or divorced because Nickelodeon thought it would be too extreme for kids. So every time that Chucky's mom is mentioned, it's actually an inside joke. Yeah, it's a little jab and reference to the fact that they weren't legally allowed to mention death around that time. But I think that they kind of loosened up, even though that they couldn't mention the word dead later on when Herb Scannell took over. Yeah, right. So, the one thing that I'm actually just um, baffled at was the scene in which when Chucky needed to go to the, uh, to go to go do his business was when Stu and Dee Dee grab him and they put the potty down by the bathroom and then he sits there for about two hours straight and he doesn't even use the bathroom at all. And so finally when he gets up thinking that he doesn't have to go, he immediately pees on the floor. And they're just, like, baffled that this happens, which, you know, it, it is weird, but, you know, sometimes it happens to the best of us. And there's even a nice little uh, notion about Stu in the fact that he wasn't even toilet trained when he was two because he had some difficulties with it, which, um, you know, it, it does speak to a lot of people that so some people can be able to learn certain things than others. I even knew someone who didn't get properly toilet trained until they were at least four and they had to wear like those uh, pull-ups for a good couple of years until they were personally potty trained so it does tend to happen yeah i think that what makes rugrats so relatable despite being a show about babies i mean like for all the kids is that a lot of the situations the characters go through are situations that they went through when they were that age so they could probably relate to how Chucky struggled to come yeah. to terms with the fact that he needed the party, but then eventually conquered his fears and didn't let his um, apprehensions get to him. Exactly. And then we have the dream sequence, and it's pretty dark, too. Like, it takes place in a prison, and it's all black and white. And we have Chucky walking by to the chair, which here's this is the second time that the chair has been referenced in Rugrats. The first time was the trial. And so Chucky has to sit down in the potty chair, and then he gets flushed all the way down to the drain. When he finally wakes up, 
he has to go and then he rushes over to the bathroom and uses his potty. And probably the shot and fright a moment in this episode is when Angelica wets the bed, which is uh, absolutely perfect. See, once again, like I said, that's what makes Angelica work as a character, the fact that she actually does get a comeuppance and the show never lets her off the hook for her behavior. And she does, and she does end up having to pay the price, which in other shows where there are characters like that or worse, they don't, they don't, and in some cases, these types of characters are people who are supposed to root for, which makes them unlikable, but that actually makes Angelica likable, given her weaknesses and, and um, flaws that aren't being rewarded. Yes. So, overall, this episode was actually nominated as a fan-favorite episode according to the Rugrats Decade in Diapers, VHS, and DVD as one of Chucky's bravest moments. And while I think that other episodes, such as The Slide, make Chucky, like, incredibly brave, um, this episode is not a bad choice, in my opinion. I agree. I think that The Slide did a better job of that, but I think that this, ironically, both were written by Joe and Sarve. Yeah, Joe and Sullivan here really focus a lot more on the Chucky-centric episodes. While people like Paul Germain were kind of like focusing on like the Tommy and Angelica episodes, and people like Steve Vixen were focusing on the Angelica episodes. Yep, those writers were perfect for those characters. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go over to our next episode. We have Together at Last, written by Jonathan Greenberg. When Phil and Lil have a huge fight, De Betty decides to separate them for a while and takes Lil to play with Tommy and Chucky. Lil soon misses her brothers, and the three babies decide to head next door, not realizing that Phil is doing the same thing. So we have another Phil and Lil-centric episode, very similar to Baby Commercial. Only the difference is that we have Phil and Lil separated and them missing each other after realizing that they can't just be without the other. They're twins, and so twins have a really close personal relationship. I actually think that they're much better fleshed out characters in this episode yeah for sure and i think that the whole brother and sister relationship plays off beautifully in an episode of all grown up which we'll talk about much later on but here we have phil and lil arguing over a reptar doll and Dee Dee makes the suggestion to betty about separating them for a little bit so that they can be able to have their own personal space their own personal freedom otherwise they'll be too intense and betty thinks that that's absolutely ridiculous but then is proven wrong when she sees phil and lil fighting so Dee Dee takes Lil over to her house and Phil is staying over at his and we have Lil immediately crying that she misses her brother, which, you know, it's definitely pretty relatable. It's like those cases in which like you feel like, you know, you, when you have a sibling, you don't, you just want to stay away from them for a little bit, but after a while you start missing them. That's relatable because I think that like, everyone who's had a sibling at least, has at least gone through that, unless they have a really bad relationship with their sibling. So I think that is really beautifully touched upon and accurately depicted. Another thing that we have to mention about this episode is that we have Larry and Steve back, and this time they're painters, and they're attempting on painting Betty's house, which I'm actually curious if they actually gotten permission from Betty or Howard to paint their house, especially the colors that they decide to choose, which is black and silver, which are Raiders colors, mentioning the, um, which is a reference to the Oakland Raiders, the California football team. So their situation is like the comedy of this episode, with um, every time that the babies walk by, they knock down some crope cables and the paint starts knocking all over them which causes a lot of wacky shenanigans so uh that is a nice little bit of humor to offset the bit of drama that we have with the separation of phil and lil yeah it provided a lot of comedic relief they were definitely parodies of slackers like bill and ted and wayne and goth yeah exactly we're, we're talking about like proto beavis and butthead here all right, so overall, I have to say that this is a very sweet episode. It's very it's very relatable, and it's very um, nice to see Phil and Lil being focused. And overall, it is a nice compliment to, you know, Chucky's episode where it was all about, like, him struggling to use the potty. So next we have our next we have episode 16A which is called The Big House and it was written by Paul Germain and debuted on September 20th 1992. While Edidi while Didi is running some errands she leaves Tommy at a maximum security daycare center desperate for freedom Tommy contemplates escaping with help from the other babies. This is one of the best episodes of season 2 for sure. It's 
it's really dramatic, it's intense, it's exciting, and having seen the daycare center as like a prison escape is actually really gripping and very thrilling to see. One of Paul Germain's best. I agree. It definitely has its trademarks. Mm-hmm. And it's adm- it admittedly is kind of like a precursor to recess in a way. Yeah, it is kind of like a precursor to Recess. Like, I definitely see, like, the elements of Recess into this episode. So, Tommy is being dropped off at a daycare center where we have three main caretakers. We have the leader, we have the guy who prepares healthy lunches, and we have the guy who changes the diapers. So, Tommy is dropped off, and he gets introduced to some of the colorful characters in this um, center. We have Wise Guy, who knows about everything. We have Big Justin, who's the biggest baby. We have Cry Baby, who cries a lot and does a lot of distractions. We have the Block Girl, who does a whole bunch of... Uh, who can make anything out of building blocks. And we have Dough Boy, who knows how to make anything out of clay. And, yeah, this is... I definitely feel like the Recess vibes in these character traits, because each character of Recess has their own distinct trait in uh, their personalities. Like, the diggers, they constantly dig, and Corn Chip Girl, she's just known for liking corn chips. Um, King Bob, who's the leader. The Ashleys, who's all named Ashley, and they're very snooty. So, yeah, they each have their own little quirks. And seeing this episode, it's just really gripping throughout with Tommy going through time out, Tommy planning the escape, the escape playing out. It's it's really good stuff. I agree. It's one of the best I've seen too, for sure. I, I, I even really like um, the way that the plan is going through and just like the tensities of, you know, Big Justin not being able to reach the door and Tommy going on Justin's shoulders and trying to open the door with the key, but the clay dough is too soft and... Then finally we have Dee Dee coming and picking Tommy up. And then J- Big Justin was questioning about, like, why didn't they, um, why didn't he get picked up either? They thought that he thought that they were all going to escape. And then his mom shows up and Wise Guy, um, you know, gives the respect that Tommy uh, pretty much deserves with helping, you know, people out. And this will play on in a later episode that we'll be talking about in a few moments. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. We have a 16B, which is called The Shot. And it was written by Joe and Sullivan here. Uh, Tommy is due to get a booster shot, but soon worries about the shot after hearing Chucky's horror story about this. I think this was the episode that made me a tribe phobic because I get terrified of needles. And when I first saw Chucky's backstory about Dr. Lecter, which is a reference to Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs, he, you know, that the, the giant needle that comes out of it and he pokes him with it. Well, we don't see it, but it's in it's 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 hinted at that he actually does get it. It it made me frightened of ever getting shots when I was a kid. And I still te- I still technically do get some fears of it even as an adult. When I got my tetanus shot a few months ago, I was still kind of like eerie about it. Me too. I mean, like I'm almost 24 in a couple of months and I'm still kind of squeamish about getting the, getting the needle shot and I'm barely afraid of anything. <laughs> Even though I do suffer from major anxiety. Yeah. So we have Tommy getting into the hospital and he meets up with a friend named Hector. And then we have Angelica in because of course we do. We need to have our little tense moments. So Angelica is basically threatening to tell Aunt Dee Dee that the babies are afraid of getting their shots. And the one scene that I absolutely thought was hilarious was when Angelica rushes over to Drew and Dee Dee and... Uh, the lady, uh, Hector's mom, and she says, Aunt Dee Dee, I have something to tell you. And then Drew immediately stops her and says, like, now, now, Angelica, when grown-ups are talking, little girls and little boys need to be quiet. Then they have to wait, and then they can say whatever they want. And then finally, when Angelica says that the kids are missing, then Drew says, you know, Angelica, this is something that you have to tell the grown-ups right away, which I thought was hilarious because she stopped her in the first place. It's that's relatable because a lot of kids try and tell one of the parents that something's wrong. Then they, then they keep insisting that they're busy. And then when and then when something's wreaked havoc, they say they say you should have told you should have told us first. And then it gets so goddamn frustrating. 
Yeah, and the one thing that I thought was really nice was when the doctor was able to distract Tommy with a lollipop and he just gives Tommy the shot and he doesn't, he doesn't get affected whatsoever. I think I saw a video on Facebook a few months ago about... I, I forget that it was a doctor who was like either showing a, a baby like a puppet or a video or something, but the baby was distracted enough for him not to even notice that he even got the shot. And it's still interesting to see that, you know, doctors are still doing this to this very day to distract babies so that they don't cry of getting a shot. So I thought that was very nice. And overall, um, this episode is really nice. It's definitely really relatable to people who are afraid of needles. And... It just goes to show you that sometimes, um, you know, what seems to be really scary isn't really scary at all. Although I do like the, once again, the schadenfreude moment of Angelica crying over the booster shot when he Tommy and Hector were able to take it like champs. Yeah, again, she again she always got her schadenfreude moments in most of the like, seasons. I mean, the only every so where I felt like she more or less got away from, with the behavior is barbecue story. After that, she always, always, always gets to come out. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 17A, which is called Showdown at Teeter Totter Gulch. And it was written by Glenn Eckler, uh, who you may know as the co-creator of Daria as well as a writer for many TV shows, such as Married with Children, The Wrong Coast, Beavis and Butthead, and... <laughs> Shut up, Beavis. Why don't you, bunghole? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he is currently a writer for The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. So, in this episode, we have... Um, Tommy and Chucky matching up with Prudence, a.k.a. the junk food kid, the local playground bully at a Wild West playground. Yeah, basically we have an episode where it feels like a Western, something akin to like Unforgiven or um, High Noon, in which you have, uh, you know, Tommy and Chucky trying to fight off against the junk food kid and everybody's running away, as well as, um, you know, with uh, Unforgiven being like one of the, the probably like like the latest Western that came out at the time that really made a lot of people praise Westerns at a time in which Westerns were kind of dying out. And even still to this day, Westerns are still kind of a niche uh, genre of movies. But I think that thanks to Red Dead Redemptions 1 and 2, they started getting back into the mainstream. So we have Tommy and Chucky, and they go inside this brand new Western-themed playground, and they meet up with a little girl named Belinda, who shows them around. And this is really distracting for me, because Belinda is clearly voiced by Kath Susie, and she doesn't really change her voice as you know when, when you listen to her as Lil. I wish that they would have gotten somebody else to play as the, the character, because it's pretty distracting. It more or less sounds like Lil with a little bit of a different inflection. Yeah, for sure. And so then we have the introduction of the junk food kid, who, believe it or not, is voiced by Nancy Cartwright, who wouldn't be in the Rugrats series for another 10 years as being the voice of Chucky. The junk food kid is absolutely relentless. The fact that she was able to hit Chucky with a candy bar, branding him, and sticking a popsicle into Tommy's diaper, and finally blowing bubble gum into Belinda's hair, forcing her to cut it. And her haircut looks awful. She makes Angelica look like a saint by comparison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, it actually makes me question about why they didn't reuse the character again. But then again, there's been a lot of one-shot bullies in Rugrats that never come back. But yeah, she can give Angelica a run for her money in terms of being really mean and nasty and the overconsumption of junk food. So uh, then we have Tommy, who's willing to stand up for the junk food, uh, stand up against the junk food kid, and protecting the babies, including Belinda. And we have this high noon ver um, reference with Tommy and uh, the junk food kid walking side by side towards one another, about to pull off their weapons. With uh, the junk food kid being the bubble gum and 
Tommy being a popsicle, but uh, the junk food kid knocks it over. And so uh, earlier in the episode, she dropped a candy cane and she uses it to pop it. And then she, the junk food kid gets completely covered in bubble gum. And then the following day, she's really nice. And she starts eating carrot sticks because she is forbidden from eating junk food. And one of my favorite moments in the episode is when Tommy starts slowly getting up. And he starts saying to Belinda um, what they're going to do after they leave. And he said, I'm going to go and get myself some juice, crawl into my bed and go nap nap. Which I've been seeing that quote a lot lately for, um, you know, people on Twitter and Facebook for like memes. It's like, what are you going to do after work? Or what are you going to do after you finish with this? And then they say, I'm going to get myself a juice, go into my bed and go nap nap. I feel like whoever else is second Spongebob, the most meme Nick to never that isn't ironic yeah exactly like nigel thornberry from the wild thornberries like come on i mean i think that in my opinion if it wasn't for the fact that nigel thornberry was played by tim curry the character would be nowhere near as endearing yeah (laughs) so overall this episode is it's pretty awesome it's definitely really unique and very different from your typical episode of rugrats gets very intense at times especially with the introduction of a new bully and uh, very nice Western references. So I do really like this episode a lot. <laughs> Me too. It's a classic and definitely one of my favorites of the season. Yeah. So now we go over from like an, ep- uh, an epic gripping Western to a really trippy weird one. We have episode 17B, which is called Mirrorland. And it was written by Michael Ferris. Chucky and Tommy decide to go through a mirror to see Mirrorland, where everything is the same, only different, with Dee Dee and Grandpa's ex- examination of various antiques making them believe that they really did cross over. What a weird episode this was. I agree. Season- it really played off the weird factor. Wow. Yeah, if you thought that season one episodes were just absolutely trippy and weird, my goodness, did Mirrorland take it up a notch with just the fact that it's actually happening as opposed to being in the baby's imagination. And so Dee Dee went antique shopping and she brings in a whole bunch of junk. One of my favorite moments was when she decides to buy a $15 box and she doesn't even know what the contents are inside, which definitely remind me of like loot crate boxes and also uh, mystery boxes in like anime conventions in which like if you pay 10 or $15 for something, you get to have a secret mystery prize, and you don't even know what it is. It could be good. It could be junk. You know, no. But, yeah, that was actually pretty relatable. And probably the most funniest moment uh, with uh, the beginning is when Grandpa Lou sees that the mirror was made in Taiwan when Didi claims that it was from France. So, that was pretty funny. Hey, great. <laughs> So yeah, now we go over to uh, when Tommy and Chucky go into quote-unquote Mirrorland, which is basically, it's the opposite of everything. In Mirrorland, you get to walk on your hands. In Mirrorland, you get to wear shoes, and uh, you get to wear shoes on your hands, and you get to take, uh, dogs take people out for walks and stuff. And so we have Grandpa Lou trying on on these wigs, and there's this really red, there's a red afro that Grandpa Lou's wearing, and Tommy and Chucky think that Grandpa Lou's hair is on fire. Then we have Dee Dee wearing a ballerina outfit without, with her glasses missing, and Tommy thinks that she's a robot. And then we have Spike with Dee Dee's glasses, and having a beard and thinking that spike is like some sort of monster which man this stuff is just so crazy yeah it's really 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 out there it's as crazy as you like as the babies view it and we even have like this one moment where phil and lil constantly argue with one another saying about that tommy and chucky are not in maryland that maybe that tommy and chucky got lost in the laundry mat uh the laundry basket or something and then we have uh, Tommy and Chucky trying to escape Maryland by going back through the mirror. And then just when they are back, everything is back to normal. You know, Dee Dee got out of her ballerina outfit. Grandpa Lou's not wearing his wig. And Spike is getting a bath after being covered with dust from the antiques and get, removing the glasses and the beard. So overall, this episode is just weird, like really out there. It's trippy it's crazy and i just really love it my favorite scene was when grandpa lou was trying on the wigs and he pretended that he was a rock star that crapped me up 
Yeah, that was awesome. And once again, uh, this would be a, a refer- This episode will be a reference in Rugrats Search for Reptar as a mini game where Tommy's just upside down collecting balloons, which is nowhere near as trippy and hilarious. So, yeah. All right, so we go over to episode 18A. Well, we're beginning discussing about a classic episode. We have Angelica's in Love, written by Paul Germain, and it debuted on October 4th, 1992. Angelica falls in love with Dean, a biker-type kid who is described as a four-year-old's dream on a five-year-old's bike. However, her heart is broken when he pledges love to someone else. This is definitely one of the best Angelica episodes, bar none, especially with the introduction of Dean. I actually felt like it showed us a glimpse of the real Angelica, what she probably is deep down, if it wasn't for emotional insecurity, to show that she can actually be a really, really, really nice person, like, yeah, for sure. It comes down to it. Yeah, and it actually tells in, like, a first-person perspective where she's narrating what's going on in her life. She was saying, like, it all started when Daddy dropped me off to Uncle Stu and Aunt Dee, Dee to play with the babies, and it was going to be just a regular day. And, um, you know, then we have Tommy coming along saying that, um, you know, he better not make fun of him or Phil and Lil and Chucky because a big kid's coming over and... Uh, Angelica's not threatened by it at first until she sees Dean for the first time. And he's another reference to, you know, James Dean with the slick back hair and the motorcycle jacket and the fact that he's riding around in a uh, tricycle as opposed to a motorcycle. Um, the first time we've seen this reference is with Rocco in a, um, in the season one episode, Little Dude. So this has happened before. So we have Dean and he sees Tommy and he introduces himself to him and he hears about the escape that he tried to do with the daycare center. And the one thing that I really do like is when Tommy's saying that it wasn't a big deal, that he wasn't able to get out, Dean says, it's not the things that you do, it's the things you think. Mentioning that... You he- see, I think that Rugrats having continuity was actually really groundbreaking and really something for its time. I mean, like, The Simpsons was the first cartoon to ever have continuity, but Rugrats was the second. Yeah, I would say that this would be played off, uh, you know, continuity-wise, this would definitely be a lot more better in their other shows, like with, as told by Ginger and with Avatar The Last Airbender. But this is definitely one of the first moments in animation, especially in America, where they actually reference um, episodes that happened previously into current episodes. Now, this is something that you would see common in anime, but for an American cartoon, it wasn't like that. I, I think I remember a long time ago that... Uh, Rob Renzetti, the creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot, when talking to somebody on Twitter, saying about like how he wished that he would have had continuity and an art, uh, go- ongoing story arc in My Life as a Teenage Robot, but Nickelodeon wouldn't allow him to do it because um, that was pretty frowned upon in the 2000s. So uh, it's nice to see that you know shows that could get away with it much earlier on is something to be really commended for. I concur. Yeah. So one of the things that I do love is in this episode is Angelica trying to get attention from Dean and trying all that she can that she can be able to get Dean away from the babies and towards her. We have her playing hard to get. We have her dropping Cynthia on the floor and saying that she can't pick it up. And we have her just saying hi and none of those plans work. So she decides that she's going to pretend to be in trouble with uh, tying Spike into a wagon and her being dragged around. And it actually does happen when a bee stings Spike's neck, uh, tail. And Dean rescues her, and so they have this really cute love moment together where they're spending more time with each other, looking into each other's eyes, and um, even Dean reading poetry and singing songs with his giant guitar. And I thought that that was really sweet. I mean, the, the thing that really, like, Top, like is the icing on the cake for me is when you know there's the bongo music playing while he's reading run spot run uh you know the the classic uh children's book of the same name and i actually i'm actually thinking it's like you know you can probably take about any poem regardless of how juvenile it is put some bongo music and it'll sound incredibly epic like if you were in a coffee shop i'll yeah? beat next though yeah, and Beatniks. I'm actually going to get my poetry book right now, and I'm actually going to see if I can read something. Uh, I have a copy of Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shil Silverstein in my bookshelf, so let me see if I can find something. Okay, here we go. I think this will be perfect for this themed episode of um, the, the episode that we're talking about, so here we go. I'm going to put some bongo music in the background and post. Ricky was L, but he's home with the flu. Lizzie R.O. had some homework to do. 
Mitchell, he probably got lost on the way. So I'm all the love that could make it today. Yes, uh, snap your fingers. Okay, <clears throat> so continuing on. <laughs> so... Uh, Dean and Angelica are slowly about to have their first kiss when Dean has to go home and Angelica says, is it another woman? And Dean says, yeah, it's my mom, which I thought that was really sweet. And we get a first insight of Angelica feeling the heartbreak of a relationship, which I thought was actually pretty interesting to see. This this would later similarly happen in an all-grown-up episode, except she'd take it far, far worse. Oh, yeah. I mean, it does make a lot of sense because she would be a, she would be like 13 at that point and, and experience what true love is. But here we have, like, you know, kid love. So, it's, obvious why the, it's obvious why that didn't happen because they're toddlers. Exactly. But you do definitely still see the heartbreak of Angelica. And, you know, her saying that she feels like a toy without batteries and that her heart is broken and vowing that she would never fall in love again until eventually she does see her new next door neighbors, one of them being Jean-Claude, who's uh, just A.G. Daly with a French accent and a raspier voice. And, the, and then she immediately starts falling in love again, which uh, sadly we don't see Jean-Claude ever again. So overall, I do have to say that this is one of the best episodes of Rugrats in season two, as well as the entire series. It's still memorable to people this very day. Uh, it's just interesting to see Angelica falling in love with somebody as opposed to being like mean to the babies. Dean is a pretty awesome character and just uh, relatable things such as love being played out is just really awesome to see. I even like the adult perspective perspective in which when Betty tells the story to Dee Dee about how she met Howard and how she would constantly poke him and make fun of him and uh, how uh, she said that it took a long time for Howard to th to realize that the reason why Betty was doing it was because she liked him. So I do love this episode. One of the best. Definitely check it out. I concur. It's definitely on my top favorites for sure. Yeah. All right, so now we go over to our next episode, 18B, which is called Ice Cream Mountain, and it was written by Chip Johansson. Uh, Stu and Drew intend to take the Rugrats out for ice cream when they pass Funland, a miniature golf course. They decide to play a round of golf. While there, the Rugrats try to reach Ice Cream Mountain, a gargantuan Sunday, not knowing that it's made of plastic. Here's another very memorable episode of Rugrats, especially in reference to Rugrats Search for Reptar, in which it was actually a level in the game. And I believe that some people even say it's the best level of the game, other than Reptar 2010, where the babies are playing mini golf. So, I have to say that this episode is pretty um, interesting to see from both the baby's perspective as well as Stu and Drew's perspective while they're having a golf competition. I agree. It kind of makes the two worlds together perfectly. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we have Angelica who sees Ice Cream Mountain from afar. And then we have her, and, you know, convincing the babies to go after it. And... Then they start walking around, they see the entirety of the golf course with pyramids and um, windmills, a giant gingerbread man, and finally they go over to Ice Cream Mountain where they're disappointed that it's not made out of real ice cream. And then we have Stu and Drew competing against each other with these fancy new golf clubs, and they're kind of holding up the line because of their constant arguing towards one another. And then finally, when they reach over to Ice Cream Mountain, we have the golf owner, who is a complete cheater, by the way, because we see inside of Ice Cream Mountain that the hole-in-one is completely blocked, which I can understand why it's blocked, because, you know, if, if people were to win all the time, they would get, like, constant free games and he'll be out of business, but still, that's kind of pretty cheap. So... And the babies decide that they thought that the ice cream was on the other side, so they clear out the paper, and then Stu and Drew and pretty much all of the customers get holes in ones, and the golf and owner the golf is just owner is completely problem. miserable. I felt really bad for Angelica here. I mean, season two really showed off her more human traits and really showed what a character would eventually turn out to be. Yeah, and also I think that uh, the f the fact that you know they were able to um, have an ice cream store, which is right across the street from the golf course, is actually pretty clever. The fact that that's what they wanted to that, that's where they wanted to go to in the first place. And when Stu and Drew decide to use their free golf games for the babies, and the golf owner is like saying, "No, please, anything but that. I'll do anything." And now, so they pro he probably just you know led them across the street, paid for the ice cream himself, and then the babies got to enjoy it. And oh, 
overall, this is a pretty nice episode. You know, we have the babies wandering around at the golf course, Stu and Drew competing against one another for golf. And yeah, I thought it was actually pretty nice. Um, definitely, I it's probably not as memorable as Angelica's in Love, but de- still, it's definitely a pretty good episode. I agree with you. It was a nice episode to compliment Angelica's in Love. So now we have episode 19A, which is called Regarding Stewie, and it was written by Guy Max Stone Graham, and it was released on October 11th, 1992. Stew falls off the roof while attempting to install his new quackomatic weather vane. Suffering from a strange amnesia, Stu reverts to his childhood as Stewie and becomes one of the Rugrats. The babies have fun with Stewie for a while, but Tommy soon starts to miss his father. This episode is pretty decent, I must say. The One of the highlights for me is just Stu acting like a baby when he falls down from the roof after installing the Quackomatic. But, um, yeah, it's actually a really interesting case for Tommy to see Stu as both a playmate and how he sees him as a dad. So I thought that this episode was, like, really nice development for Tommy and Stu. It actually showed off the father-son relationship perfectly. Yeah. So the episode has Stu installing the Quackomatic, which is a weather vane, and we have, um, you know, Grandpa leaving to go play with his friends, and we have Dee Dee doing some errands, and so while Stu is installing the Quackomatic, he accidentally falls down when the duck is attacking them, and I really like the fact that the, the, the babies think that the Quackomatic is like some sort of god who, if you want to know something, you have to fight it. And that uh, when Stu fell down and he becomes Stewie, he starts acting like a complete baby. Like, he starts talking in baby talk. He can even talk to the babies, which is actually pretty interesting. It's like, you know, as, apparently if you have the mindset of a baby, even as an adult, you can still talk to the babies. Even as a regular adult, you can't do that because you don't understand what they're saying. So it actually just makes some interesting questions come up. Exactly. I mean, I used to think that the babies kind of, talked secretly while the dolls were around our Toy Story, but which one is it? Yeah, your your guess is as good as mine. I'm sure that there's some Rugrats theory going on about, like, how the babies talk, and if uh, if a, an adult were to revert back to a baby, you know, do they get their cognitive understanding of how babies talk? That's actually a really good question. I'm sure Matt Pat from Game Theory is probably going to come up with something like that. I don't know. Anyway, so... Yeah, there's not really much to this episode other than just, like, those little highlights with, you know, Stewie acting up as a baby and Tommy and Stewie having this really nice relationship, both as father and son and as, um, you know, baby friends. And also, um, the one thing that I really do appreciate is just uh, kind of like a different perspective. Like, when you see, like, um, the adults and the babies interacting, the adults interact with the babies as parents. But here we have the adults, uh, we have Stewie interacting with the babies as if they were their own, which I thought was actually a pretty interesting change of pace. And they would revert this, they would actually bring this plot back in a subplot of Rugrats, um, Rugrats Goes Wild, in which uh, Nigel Thornberry gets amnesia, and then he starts acting like a baby. Which... It's actually a huge detriment to the character, and I will have a lot to complain about when we finally reach uh, Rugrats Go Wild. I did laugh at some scenes at Rugrats Go. You know what I mean? Like, when Nigel had uh, amnesia, when he said, look, I'm a froggy, and I'm froggy. That, that one was admittedly funny, but I felt like it was portrayed best here. Mm, yeah, I guess so, but still. I mean, R- Nigel Thornberry can be funny even without the amnesia. I agree. Anyway, let's go on to our next episode. We have episode 19B. We have Garage Sale. And it was written by Steve Vixen. So now we have Steve Vixen writing his solo episode. And, you know, uh, previous episodes with him have Joel and Solo Behar being writing partners. But here we get to see the first inkling of his dark humor, which would play off later on in episodes such as Angelica Breaks a Leg, which we'll be discussing about uh, next time. To make room for new stuff, including Stu's new stereo, the Pickles sell their unwanted goods at a garage sale. However, thanks to the babies, they end up unintentionally selling everything in the house. Now, this episode is just absolutely brutal at point, and kind of, like, shocking to see the adults selling their items for pretty cheap, especially when you see items such as, like, a TV and the, the, the stereo system that we see later on. Just sold for like 5, 10, 15 bucks, as opposed to being sold for much more higher prices. And, uh, you know, the baby's trying their very best to help the grown ups. And just the fact that when Stu finds out that they sold everything, he's just absolutely depressed. And Dee Dee tries to make it 
um, a more positive outlook, saying that material possessions are bad and that the most important thing is family and love. Put a sock in it, Dean. Yeah, <laughs> put a sock in it, Dean. Uh, yeah, this definitely showcases Steve Vixen at his absolute funniest. See, this is where I feel like Doc Humor can actually work, and episodes that are realistic in tone can, actu- can actually really, really, really balance well. And I feel like Steve Vixen is one of the rare writers that actually manages to I mean, man, just to pull this off. Yeah. yeah. This episode is pretty decent, but it definitely is pretty messed up when you look more into it. Uh, but I feel like this is, like, the starting point of his writing, um, you know, his solo writing career. But um, in my opinion, he does get a lot better later on, especially with his writing on Hey Arnold, where he would write one-third of the series, and he wrote some of the best episodes of the entire run. And with Rugrats, um, you, the episodes that would be focusing mostly on Angelica are his absolute best. Definitely. I mean, like, I really feel like he really delved into the nuts and bolts of a character. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 20A, and it is called Let There Be Light, and it was written by Pam Wick, and it premiered on October 18th, 1992. While working on the anti-gravity playpen, Stu blacks out of the neighborhood. Being afraid of the dark and wondering where the light is hiding, the Rugrats look for the light in the most logical place, the refrigerator. Uh, This is actually a really sweet episode. It's, you know, definitely relatable for those who had been through a blackout. Like, literally, just today, I went through a blackout because uh, it was storming up really badly outside. And, like, the entire neighborhood blacked out because of the thunderstorm. So I relate to this more now that I just watched this episode episode um yeah so basically we have Stu working on an invention which is pretty dangerous by the way an anti-gravity playpen like the the percussion the repercussions that that could happen to a child and his invention does work but it does turn out that it causes a lot of power to be released and there's a blackout and so the babies decide that they're going to go to the place where they think that the light is hiding which is the refrigerator and the reason why they think this is because when tommy was a young baby his mom went to go downstairs for milk and she you know he saw a bright light coming out of it and that's where he thinks that the 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 light is hiding and so it's just basically a very simple episode with the babies going downstairs to getting the light back. And there's not really much to say about it. Believe it or not, when I was in elementary school, we had a Rugrats VHS that I would always watch after I did my work. And I had this episode on it. So I have this episode engraved into my brain. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it, it is definitely a very sweet episode and definitely one that plays into the imagination of the babies about like where does the light go when the when the power goes out so yeah and we definitely do have the rugrats in their element being at home having an uh, having a little adventure and going off to find something so uh in this uh, and this episode will be referenced in an uh, in a level of rugrats search for reptar so yeah there is this episode is remembered by a lot of people for being just a really sweet simple uh episode so i definitely recommend you check it out i concur so actually is one of my favorite regular episodes it's actually one of the few episodes that i really love that doesn't have angelica in because a majority of my favorite episodes feature angelica all right, so we go over to episode 20B, which is called The Bank Trick, and it was written by Earl Klasky and Gary Gurner. Uh, is Earl Klasky uh, related to Aline in some sense? Maybe. That could be a possibility. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'll probably look into it later on. Uh, so the episode is about uh, Dee Dee taking Tommy and Chucky to do her errands after ruining Grandpa's chess game. Uh, while looking at while at the bank, Tommy and Chucky wander around looking for the M M&M and M machine, otherwise known as the ATM machine, while inadvertently foiling a bank robbery that involves with two crooks posing as bank examiners. And uh, we have another episode where Tommy and Chucky cause some crazy mayhem at a different location. This time we're at a bank, and um, yeah, it's it's run of the mill uh, stuff that you would see in any Rugrats episodes throughout the first season, and. Um, there are some interesting things that uh, are in it. Like, for example, we have these bank examiners walking around and looking around at the bank. And, you know, the bank teller is giving this elaborate tour talking about the great things that it has. And the examiners are not impressed whatsoever. However, the one thing that actually confuses me is that throughout this episode, they're being referred to as either men or gentlemen. And one of them is clearly a woman. 
That's a mistake on the script. Yeah, writing, it, I guess. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that they did that intentionally. Yeah, I don't think it was intentionally. I think there was definitely a miscommunication between the animators and the writers for this. Probably due to the fact that there was deadlines to be met. Yeah, for sure. So. Yeah, they, they pro- it was probably in the original script that they were men, but maybe one of the storyboard artists or one of the animators decided to make the one of the bank examiners a woman. And so they decided to, maybe they couldn't correct the mistake in time, and so they had to just add that in. So, yeah, um, it is a bit of, it is a, it is a mistake on that end. And uh, we have uh, Tommy and Chucky looking around to the ATM machine to see if they can get candy because they think they call it an M&M machine, which... I'm actually curious if, um, you know, Viacom or Nickelodeon was able to ask the Mars Candy Company permission to say M&M's. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think they just said M&M just for the... I I mean, this would actually be referenced in another episode we'll be talking later. But yeah, they do mention M&M's a few times in the early seasons of Rugrats. Um, maybe, you know, maybe the fact that, uh, maybe it actually kind of helped a little bit with, like, um, candy distribution, I'm not sure. Kind of similar to how E.T. used the, uh, Reese's Pieces. So, anyway, so we have, uh, just Tommy and Chucky looking around to see if they can find candy. They go over to a safe, and they see a woman who invests all of her money in jewelry, and then they accidentally trip over the alarm to let the police in, and they actually help capture the uh, the, the the crooks unintentionally. And they do get their candy in the end when they're sitting quietly and they're behaving, and the bank teller sees that they're um, just sitting down and... Um, and the bank teller does actually give them lollipops, which is uh, really nice to see, especially since the fact that they do deserve it for capturing those crooks, even though they didn't know about it. So, yeah, this is another nice run-of-the-mill episode of Rugrats, just them causing wacky shenanigans in a location. Uh, not one of my favorites, but it is pretty nice. Yeah, I think that is a decent episode to watch on Rady Days. All right, so we go over to episode 21A, which is called Family Reunion, and it was written by Peter Gaffney, and it debuted on October 25th, 1992. The Pickles Family Reunion is held, well, I'm just going to correct the, the, this uh, description here, because it is not in Iowa, it is actually in Ohio, because the town that they are going to, uh, Willoughby, is in Ohio, and there is an episode that we'll be talking about in season three, where Stu and Dee, Dee are from Dayton, which is in Ohio. So, yeah, it's in Ohio that the the family reunion is taking place, not Iowa. Anyway, uh, hosted by Hugh Pickles and his wife, Dottie. Angelica tells Tommy and the other babies that the reunions are swap meets for babies, with the babies being swapped to different parents. So, um, it actually does... This episode is really interesting with the fact that we're introduced to other Pickle family members, because with the family reunion, um, you know, that usually does tend to happen, but we do get to see more of, you know, Stu's side of the family. And uh, the fact that they come from humble beginnings of being farmers is actually pretty hilarious. So It is a little bit on the nose when... Angelica thinks that she's lost her family because I think we've all been through that situation once. When I went to a farm as a kid, I thought I'd lost my I thought I had lost my family and I, I was really freaking out. I, I did find them though, thankfully. Yeah. It it is definitely relatable, especially with a big place like a farm. So we have the so we have Tommy, Angelica, and their parents going over to this family reunion. They get there by train, and they meet up with all of their aunts and their uncles and their cousins, which pretty much every cousin, with the exception of the big cousin Edmund, is voiced by E.G. Daly, and it's just basically phonetically different uh, accents. So we have. Timmy, who is, uh, you know, basically like a southern accent. We have Tom, Tony, who has this New York accent. We have Tammy. She has a girl voice. And, yeah, it's just basically the same complaint that I had with, um, you know, Belinda in um, the previous episode we just talked about, where Kath Susie doesn't really change too much of her acting with uh, Belinda compared to Lil. It sounds exactly the same, just slightly different. And here is no exception. It was pretty distracting. All right, so Angelica starts discussing to Tommy about what a family reunion is. A family reunion, according to her, is when all the family the, all the family members gather together and then they swap 
mothers and dads and to other aunts and uncles. And then she tells Tommy that he'll never see his mom, dad, or dumb old dog ever again. And Tommy becomes really concerned. And so he and his cousins then have this huge journey around the farm so that they can be able to look for their parents. And even Angelica is starting to think about what she had told Tommy was true because that was when Drew got separated from the family group. And then she's with her aunt and her uncle and they were talking about like redoing her hair and taking her home and having her do chores and stuff like that. So yeah, Angelica starts becoming really uh, concerned and paranoid of the fact that she's not going to be with her parents anymore. And we even have that scene where she's being chased by a goat. I just felt so bad for Angelica that, that I actually got kind of weepy myself. I mean, it is kind of scary to think about, to be quite honest, especially with, you know, being separated from your family members to being with a bunch of strangers that claim is your family, but you don't even know who they are. So it, it, it does play into a literal family reunion when the parents and the babies come back together and uh, we have Grandpa Lou coming out of the taxi truck, uh, the taxi cab after going to Chicago and seeing his family reunited. So it's, uh, it's a family reunion in a sense in which the kids are reuniting with their own parents, not with reuniting with other family members, which I guess it's a literal family reunion. Yep, yep. So accurate over- to the title. Yeah, it's very accurate to the title. So overall, this episode is pretty. Th- this episode is pretty nice to see. Get an introduction. Get introduced to other family members from the pickle side, and we get to see uh, Tommy and the rest of his cousins walking around in a giant farm, and Angelica, um, you know, going through the dilemma of being separated from her dad, and just seeing the family together at the end. It's actually very nice. I agree. It's has a heartwarming end and everything is resolved really really nicely yeah so now we go over to episode 21b which is called grandpa's date and it was written by steve vixen and joan salabahir grandpa's night of watching lonely space vixens is ruined when after 40 years his long lost girlfriend named morgana pays a visit to him lou not wanting morgana to know that he's a grandpa rushes tommy and chucky to bed early naturally the babies try to figure out why and end up causing trouble with Stu's mechanical couch when Morgana finds out about the baby, she's delighted to know that Lou is a grandfather. So yeah, this episode, I really was dedicated, I was really more focused on the adult's perspective as opposed to the babies. Not to say that it was bad, but it was just Tommy and Chucky causing wacky shenanigans to Grandpa Lou. But Grandpa Lou's backstory with um, an old flame was very fascinating. I agree. This is one episode where, where the adult fragment of the episode is the most interesting yeah so it all started with grandpa talking to tommy and chucky they're gonna have a nice time watching reptar videos and eating ice cream and staying up late and we have reptar come home and reptar redux which you know you get you get to see reptar in a vhs tape with a bunch of kids which i take it that this was kind of like an homage to like how godzilla during the 1970s was geared more towards kids you know, with like Godzilla being surrounded by children and um, other Godzilla films, and there's the Hanna Barbera Godzilla TV series, and it also kind of reminds me a little bit of Gamera, where he's like the defender of the the universe and he's the guardian of all children. So I guess at that point, with you know Reptar being so popular with the movies and Reptar cereal and Reptar bars, I guess it was leaning more towards a kid's perspective, which we'll talk about a little bit more down the line. Um, so we have Grandpa getting a phone call, and it turns out for it to be his old girlfriend, Morgana, from 40 years ago. And we see a flashback, and I have to question something here in this flashback. So the very same conductor from the previous episode we just talked about, Family Reunion, is the same one in this flashback. I mean, they're, they're the same person, they look exactly the same, they sound exactly the same. So you're trying to tell me that the same conductor from 40 years ago is the same conductor from the previous episode we just talked about, and he hasn't aged a bit. It's like, uh, that is like major, major continuity errors right there. He must be a model or something. He's, he's probably, he probably keeps spreading the pound of youth, and he keeps getting younger. Yeah, exactly. He he must be like Dorian Gray. His picture's up on a wall somewhere where he just continues to be young and not age a day. 
So yeah, we have um, gr you have Lou rushing over to catch up with his girlfriend because she's leaving and never coming back, and you know Lou is reminiscing about him losing his girlfriend, and uh, Morgana's talking about how she's going to come back to town for the evening and that she wants to go see Lou, and Lou decides that he wants to keep Tommy and Chucky in their rooms because he doesn't want. Morgana to think that he's old and so Tommy and Chucky are just concerned about what's going on they do a little bit of investigating they see Grandpa Lou putting on a nice suit and his, he has a wig on and cologne and he just thinks he's acting really weird and then we get the introduction of Morgana and she brings up um, some she brings a photo album looking back on you know their times together where Grandpa Lou was in the debate team and when Grandpa Lou was a soda jerk, and then finally when, you know, he rushes over to meet up with Morgana and he was too late. Now, I'm actually curious. Who took that picture, by the way? Who took the picture of Grandpa Lou trying to go after Morgana that was in the photo album? It, I doubt that she was able to take it because that would be kind of mean. It's like, oh, my ex-boyfriend who I saw cheating on me. And, you know, I'm going to actually take this picture as a moment and just put it in my photo album. It's like, I'm actually curious about where that picture came from. Then we find out why she decided to leave, and that was because she thought that Grandpa Lou was cheating on her with a girl named Trixie McGee. But instead, it, it was the um, it was a misunderstanding. It turns out Grandpa Lou was actually saving Trixie McGee from an asthma attack, and he was doing mouth to mouth resuscitation. Now, the name Trixie, I what, I'm actually curious if this is the same Trixie that Lou would end up marrying and having Stu and Drew, or maybe this will be a different Trixie. Maybe it might be the same one. Who knows? It could be the same one. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe when he was doing um, the, maybe when he was saving her from the asthma attack, maybe they actually started getting closer together. So I would. It, it's actually interesting to kind of see that uh, happen. I'm actually curious about like you know having a what if situation if um, you know Morgana would have been lose love life as opposed to a Trixie. In fact, I kind of wish that Trixie, w uh, that um, Morgana would have stuck around in the later seasons of Rugrats, especially later on in which, you know, Grandpa Lou got married. Other than just one episode from a later season, we never see Morgana again after this. So, yeah, that's a shame. There was a reference to her made in a later episode, though. That is true, but after that, she's never mentioned again. So, uh, then we have Tommy and Chucky just causing a whole bunch of mayhem, bringing down toys, and also, um, you know, just uh, playing, you know, the Dummy Bear's Happy Happy song, and then we have Tommy and Chucky pushing the button to the mechanical couch, and then flying up in the air, and then Morgana sees that, you know, she, T Lou has grandchildren, and he confesses on why he decided to hide it from her. And Morgana says that, you know, she'll always see him as the same young guy that from 40 years ago. And the one thing that I really did love about this episode was the final scene with Grandpa Lou talking about Morgana and about, you know, looking back on the past, saying, you know, you can't change the past, so you might as well accept what's going on right now and appreciate it, which I thought that that was a great message. I agree. It's a really, really, really great moral. And... Yeah. So overall, this episode is really nice. Uh, I, I do think that it's kind of like a nice follow-up to Family Reunion because, you know, we have the reference that Grandpa Lou was originally from Willoughby, Ohio, and, you know, focusing more on his backstory and um, having a really great uh, Lou storyline involving with an old flame from 40 years ago. And Tommy and Chucky's antics were pretty funny, but the heart of this episode belongs to Grandpa Lou and Morgana. They made this episode for me. I agree, they're the ones that made it memorable and really, really, really cemented it as one of the greatest episodes of the season. Yeah. All right, so now we have episode 22A, and it's called No Bones About It, and it was written by David Benefente and Michael J. Benefente, and it premiered on November 1st, 1992. Grandpa takes the Rugrats to the Natural History Museum. Later, the Rugrats dismantle it while looking for a bone for Spike. Meanwhile, Grandpa locks horns with security chief Sally Payson while rushing around the museum looking for the Rugrats. There's not really much to this particular episode. It's just another episode, once again, where the Rugrats characters are going through wacky situations in a different location. And this time around, it's in a museum. And this episode was ranked as, like, one of the fan-favorite episodes. Like, the biggest adventure, I believe, uh, according to the Rugrats Second in Diapers DVD. 
And we actually talked about this episode briefly, saying that it's not the most grand epic adventure that the Rugrats characters have ever been in. We just thought that this episode was just simply okay. I agree. All right, but nothing spectacular. Yeah, it's nothing spectacular. So I'm actually, you know, we have we have Tress McNeil playing as the the security chief, and she thinks that Grandpa Lou is a hooligan and a troublemaker. When in reality, he's just trying to get the babies to the museum with them uh, wandering around, getting lost. It would have been it would have made a lot more sense if he would have actually asked the security chief, saying, "Hey, my babies went missing." But no, we just have him running around and trying to cause unnecessary wacky mayhem. The, mo- the most memorable part. A security guard. That was uh, hilarious. Yeah, the security guard moments were pretty funny. And then we have, um, you know, Tommy and Chucky. Then we have Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil wandering around a jungle exhibit, uh, c- collecting some African masks. And then we have them getting the dinosaur bone. And they get a tiny little toe bone, like a little tiny claw bone. And it pretty much decimates the entire display. One tiny little bone was able to just make the entire T-Rex display just fall into the ground. I just thought that that was just really hilarious. Me too. Just seeing the, the security guard tries to go through all that trouble and then and then ends up being the part of the death. It's just, it's just so funny. Yeah. There's not really much to say about this episode, except that it is your stereotypical episode of, you know, the Rugrats characters going through wacky shenanigans in a different location. And there's not really anything to write home about. I think that, I thought that this episode was okay, just nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah, I agree. All We're right. So here that. Yeah, so now we go over to episode 22B, and it's called Beach Blanket Babies. And it was written by Mark Trevicante and James Grant Golden. The Pickles and the Finters go to the beach. Chucky has a personal mission, which is to free the sea monkeys or sea monkeys that his dad gave him. So Chucky gets some sea monkeys from his dad as a pet because his dad is mostly allergic to everything and he doesn't want to take the time to clean up any unnecessary messes. And so Chucky decides that he wants to free the sea monkeys and he wants them to live happily in the ocean. And it just so happens that they are going over to the beach that day. I saw this episode quite a lot as a kid and it was really one of my favorites because of how creative and adventurous it was. And I didn't overly rely on the baby's imagination, but what goes inside the, but instead what goes inside their heads and how they perceive things. It actually, it actually works as a simple concept. Yeah, and I, I can, I can recall watching this episode a lot as a kid as well because I think that whenever Nickelodeon did like a summer, you know, marathon or like a summer special, this episode would be playing a lot because it's the Rugrats characters and they're at the beach. And at the time, Rugrats was their flagship show right before SpongeBob came along. Time will tell if it will become its flag, it will become a flagship show. Again, it doesn't have to be a third SpongeBob, but it, if they reboot successful enough, then I guess it could reclaim being a flagship show without dethroning SpongeBob or the White House. Like it, it could be a third wheel. It could be a possibility. You're absolutely right. I mean, if Rugrats really generates toward the new generation, then I would think that Nickelodeon rebooting the series to much longer than 26 episodes that would be like the first thing that they would do. Exactly. It would be like a third wheel between SpongeBob and Loud House. Yeah. So I have to, this is probably going to be like really cruel of me to say this. And, you know, speaking from a logic perspective, Chucky killed his sea monkeys from the beginning of the episode when he dropped them into an ice cold cooler filled with ice cold water and ice and uh, ice cubes because sea monkeys need to be in like warmer temperatures and they rely on seawater to survive and the fact that it was fresh water and it was freezing cold yeah i'm sorry they're dead so the fact that you know the mission was to drop them off into the uh ocean it was kind of like um, inevitable that they weren't going to meet a happy ending. I mean, we even see in an uh, a earlier scene when um, you know when the the adults are getting drinks and Dee Dee gets a glass of water and she grabs one of the sea monkeys and just like grinds them, thinking that it's dirt. 
they're not moving at all. They're not swimming around. They're just stand. They're just like floating up on the water. So yeah, they're dead. I'm sorry. A dark and grim tale for all. Yeah, and it was un- and it was unintentional too. So damn. Anyway, but there are a lot of funny moments in this episode. We have, you know, Angelica, um, you know, suspect, uh, Angelica decides to bury Chaz in the sand, making it look like that he's the Sandman. And we have... And I've been decaffeinated, <laughs> as Chucky would say. Yes, yeah, I was surprised they got away with that, actually. But then again, this is early 90s Nickelodeon. Yeah, exactly. So then we have, um, you know, Tommy and Chucky trying to push the cooler into the ocean. We have Grandpa Lou and Grandpa Boris arguing about a card game. And then we have Stu and Drew arguing about the makings of a sandcastle. So there's a lot going on in this episode. But the main focus is, you know, Tommy and Chucky trying to push the cooler over to the ocean so that they can free the sea monkeys. And while it is a pretty sad yet satisfying note, if you don't, like, think about the logic for five seconds about Chucky freeing the sea monkeys... Uh, I feel like, you know, episodes involving with, like, letting, uh, about, like, tragedy with a pet is done much better in a later episode that we'll talk about later. I agree. And that that comes within the next season. Yes, that will come in season three. So overall, this episode is really nice. If you're in the summer mood, especially since uh, summer here is almost over, then it is actually a classic episode to tune into and watch. So I recommend it. All right, so let's go over to actually one of my favorite episodes of the entire series. Episode 23A, and it's Reptar on Ice, written by Peter Gaffney, and it premiered on November 8, 1992. After finding a lizard while the Rugrats think it's Reptar's baby, they try to present him at Reptar on Ice, an ice capades type show. The problem is that the actor playing Reptar is afraid of lizards and isn't too fond of children either. Remember when in season one we were discussing about Reptar's revenge and a guy dressed up in a Reptar suit and it's just a pretty weak episode just with him being obsessed with cereal? This is so much better. I agree. It It has an actual plot besides that. Yeah. So, and and also, you know, it's kind of ironic that we have a guy who's afraid of lizards and he's playing as the main lizard who's like so popular amongst kids. And this, uh, the whole Reptar on Ice thing is kind of like a spoof slash parody of those Disney on Ice shows that were like really popular around the 80s and 90s. When Disney was having their huge renaissance era with the likes of Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and uh, The Little Mermaid, those ice shows came back in full force. And even still to this day, you know, ice shows in Disney are still popular with the likes of Frozen. So, yeah, seeing the, the a, a parody of this is actually pretty hilarious. And, oh man, this episode is this episode was like probably my favorite episode of Rugrats when I was a kid. I just loved it so much. I watched it over and over and over again. It's definitely, it's definitely one of the most endearing, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I watch it constantly as well, and I still laugh every time. There are kids on the ice. Somebody call their mom. I just learned that about scene. <laughs> yeah, and similar to at the movies, we have Grandpa Lou who is just completely dismissive of the idea of going to see an ice show because he thinks it's so incredibly juvenile. But then he gets really invested in it. Very similar to at the movies where he was kind of invested at the Dummy Bears movie. But... Um, we have uh, Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil wanting to give the, the lizard back over to Reptar because they think it's his baby, and they get into the ice show, and then they start participating in it by skating all around, and um, then we have, you know, the actress and Reptar, uh, you know, seeing uh, the babies, and they're wondering what to do, and so... Uh, we have um, Tommy showing the the lizard over to Reptar, and he just screams and cries. And um, then we have Stu rushing over to save Tommy, and it got a lot of people like invested in seeing it again because there were a lot of people who were actually falling asleep during the Reptar and I scene. So yeah, this episode is so funny, and it's it's very memorable. And this is one of the episodes that I agree with being on the Rugrats and Diapers uh, DVD, uh, uh, Rugrats Decade and Diapers DVD and VHS as the best Reptar episode, because I think it is. I think it's, I think it is the best Reptar episode. Me too. I just think that, I just think that the scene where Tommy drops the lizard in his pants is just classic. Yeah. 
it's so hilarious and uh it's the music is amazing like uh, you still remember like the reptar theme song and and you know all that sappy saccharine you know song about falling in love and stuff like that it, it's it's amazing it, if you haven't seen it what are you waiting for go watch it i think that the songs are so bad that that they definitely need to be released on I think they are. I think that the the I think the Reptar music is released on a CD. Uh, the Nicktoon CD that came out around 15 years ago, I think that has the Reptar music in it. So I I don't remember what the CD was called, but yeah, it's there. And if you want to go check it out, you know, go do so. Uh, but yeah, still one of the best episodes of the series. What are you waiting for? Go watch it. All right, so now we go over to episode 23B. It's called Family Feud, and it was written by Michael Ferris. After a game of charades between the Pickles and the DeVilles end up causing a huge argument, the families abruptly end their friendship and wage war, upsetting the babies. While Chaz is caught in the crossfire, having to return everything that the neighbors borrowed from each other, as well as listening to their constant bickering, Tommy is upset that he is not allowed to play with Phil and Lil anymore. Now, this is an episode that really gets into more of the adult's perspective more than the kids, because, man, like, the argument is over something really stupid. I agree, it snowballed from something so minor that it really really got out of control so yeah so it so it, the, so as mentioned earlier so basically the episode starts off with them playing charades and it's supposed to be like guess that movie and we have um howard you know trying to charade dances with wolves which i take it that 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 was probably like a, a movie that um was more relevant at the time because it came out around the early 90s and it was a movie that you know won a that was like nominated and i believe won a few academy awards and and um golden globes and stuff like that so it was pretty prevalent in the pop culture and also, um, I, I mean, I don't understand, like, why nobody was able to guess it, because it was actually pretty obvious, but uh, they thought that he was doing, like, a really bad job of, um, a, that, that they thought that Howard was doing a bad job of doing the charades, and then we have um, Stu and Howard arguing with one another, and... Um, then he thought that, um, you know, that the music, that the, the movie was a musical when it, it's not, not even close. And then they have, um, you know, uh, Didi and, then we have Didi and Betty laughing about how stupid that the, uh, that, um, Stu and Howard were arguing, although that they started bringing up the fact that Howard probably hasn't seen a musical since Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which is a classic, uh, musical from the sixties. And, um... You know, and it's kind of a shame, too, because I feel that there were so many amazing musicals that came out afterwards. But I can understand, you know, that kind of, um, uh, you know, the fact that there hasn't been like a relevant musical in like the like, a, you know, like toward the 90s at that point. I think that Lindsay Ellis did a really amazing uh, video on YouTube discussing about the death of the music, the movie musical that you should check out. But uh, then they start arguing with one another, and they no longer want to speak with one another. And so now they start building this huge wall, dividing the neighbors. And they don't want to see each other. They don't want to talk to each other. And Stu refers to them as the fatheads. Foreshadowing another negative with the characters called the fatheads. Oh, yes, indeed. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, Chaz is caught in the middle, and he has to go back and forth constantly to return their items, and Tommy and Chucky want to be friends with Phil and Lil, and then we have, um, <laughs> then we have them, meet, you know, play, then there's this one moment in which they're playing at the park, and, you know, they start arguing with each other um, constantly, and then we have Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil wanting to separate from their parents. And then they said, we need to go somewhere where there's, like, peace and nobody argues. And then they were like, oh, where do we go for that, Tommy? And then uh, Tommy's like, I don't know, let's check out the trash. It's like, <laughs> what? Yes, let's go check out the garbage. I'm sure that, you know, we'll be able to find peace and happiness all over the world going there. Yeah, trash brings everybody closer together. Yes. Exactly. Garbage brings everybody close together. And and their arguments, uh, the, the arguments with the adults is just so freaking hilarious. I mean, like, you have, 
Stu and Howard's arguments towards each other are like the funniest. And it gets even worse when they find out that the babies are gone and then Chaz puts them in their place, which good for him, by the way, you know, because Chaz was always seen as like incredibly timid and doesn't like to go above and beyond, um, you know, the, the, you know, choosing a side. So when he sees them arguing and not even caring about watching over their kids, he puts them in their place, which, you know what, that's good for him. I, I really like that scene. He always, he, he was always the adult with the most common sense. Yes, he was. And, and that was like one of his best moments in the series for sure. And so they basically decide to, um, you know, give up their differences. And eventually Betty helps Stu climb a tree and finds Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil by the garbage. And then the babies get reunited and that's pretty much it. So overall, I have to say that... Well, it's not as memorable as Reptar on Ice in terms of, like, its entertainment. It is a, a really awesome episode to see the adult's point of view about constant bickering over stupid, petty, um, you know, arguments. All right, then. So our next episode is episode 24A, which is called Superhero Chucky. And it was written by Douglas Petrie, and it premiered on November 15th, 1992. Now, it's interesting to note that Douglas Petrie has uh, written uh, films and TV shows such as uh, Fantastic Four, Harriet the Spy, and is currently working as a showrunner for the Defenders TV series, which is a Marvel property. And it's kind of interesting that we're discussing about a superhero-centric uh, episode with him with his future stuff. So... Uh, in this episode, Chucky thinks that he is really a superhero after seeing a taping of Captain Blasto. And Captain Blasto is actually voiced by Adam West. This was one of my very first introductions to him, uh, one with the original Batman. I actually thought this voice acting was quite hit. This was before he became a regular on cartoon. And the exchanges between him and Angelica were priceless. Especially, especially Angelica's delivery <laughs> and observation that... Wouldn't it be e easier without the rope? Exactly. She's so, very clever. Yeah, she is very clever. So the episode does begin at a TV studio where Stu, Drew, Ch um, Chucky, and Angelica are watching Captain Blasto. And apparently it's based off of like some... It's, it's very similar to like you were saying about Batman in which, you know, he's been doing it for a very long time. He's been playing the character for so long in like this public access TV show. And... Uh, he is calling for volunteers for uh, Captain Blasto to be flying around, but it doesn't turn out as well as he had hoped. And uh, Stu and Drew just have this gleam in their eye discussing about how, you know, that this was a superhero that they looked up to when they were kids and how he still has the gleam in his eye, even though that he's not the same as he was all those years ago. But that gives the inspiration for Chucky thinking about whether he was a superhero and then Tommy, Phil, and Lil kind of push the idea that maybe he is one, but he just has been hiding under his secret identity. And so they put in all these like weird clothes, which kind of reminds me a little bit of the outfit that Harold Smith wore in the Powerpuff Girls when he was turning to the, be the villain. And he has like this towel and this big hat and these socks and all that stuff, and he looks just ridiculous. Ironic, ironic considering the connection between PPG and Rugrats, EG Daily. Yes, very true, exactly. <laughs> and uh, then we have, so Chucky is like not convinced that he's a superhero at all, and he tries so many things like using the x-ray vision to point out that his, um, that Tommy and Betty's mom are drinking coffee when it's true, and then Stu is working on some inflatable furniture, which is a brand new invention, which nowadays, I mean, most people kind of use like easy lifting furniture like bean bags and such and Chucky lifts it thinking that he has strong powers and he accidentally deflates it thinking that he has laser um, that he has heat vision and then Angelica comes along and steals his world ball that he had gotten from the Captain Blasto uh, TV viewing and then we have Chucky trying to defend you know the babies and protect them from Angelica and Angelica just constantly makes fun of him saying that he looks like he had just fallen down the, the laundry pile and then Chucky I hate, to, I hate to admit it but even though that Angelica's not exactly being the nicest person to Chucky I really think that what she's saying is actually kind of funny 
Yeah, it is pretty funny for for sure. And then we have Chucky at his mo one of his most heroic moments in which he actually pushes Angelica and she falls into the floor, slipping through the fire truck, and she starts crying and w walking away. And then everybody, and then Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and then Tommy, Ch Phil, and Lil call him a superhero, and basically he saves the day. And the interesting part about this thing about an uh, uh, interesting thing is that apparently capes give you superpowers when there have been many superheroes who don't even rely on capes at all to save the day. And they were saying like, oh, you used your, you didn't need the cape. You used it with Chucky power. And, you know, I think that the whole cape thing has kind of become archaic nowadays, similar to how it is even referenced with Edna Mode in The Incredibles when she said no capes and how capes just cause more trouble than actually save the day. Yeah, what? Well what an incredible twist yeah yeah exactly finally we just have chucky picking up the towel anyway saying you know what i'm just going to you know save the day and whatever and then um yeah I, i'm gonna use the cape anyway and then he basically just has this heroic climactic uh, finish which is actually pretty nice so overall this episode is actually pretty nice we get to see uh ch we get to see a nice chucky centric episode that shows off his bravery similar to chucky in the potty and uh there'll be a little bit and there'll be some more episodes showcasing that along the way so um and you know it's nice to actually see chucky have his um triumphs as opposed to him just being a constant scaredy cat so i actually did like that and you know seeing adam west in an episode of Rugrats was actually pretty neat, especially during a time in which um, he felt that being in a lot of these kids' shows was like a downgrade to his career. I remember there was a documentary a few years ago talking about how during the 90s he had trouble getting work because he was typecasted as everybody just knew him as Batman, and so he had difficulties trying to get a job. And so he was in a lot of these kids' shows, like Rugrats, he was the principal in The Adventures of Pete and Pete, he was in Batman the Animated Series as the Grey Ghost, which is actually one Not of... changed in 1999, though. Yes, it did. It did change in 1999 when he appeared in Family Guy as Mayor West. I'm going to miss him. He was one of the funniest parts of the show. Yeah, agreed. I think that it's actually kind of interesting about his mentality about that, you know, being in kids' shows was like his, his low point. Because you take somebody like um, Vincent Price, for example. Vincent Price, who yes. was also being typecasted as like, oh, he only just does horror movies and they're like be great at horror movies that nobody can take seriously but he was the kind of guy that he took every performance so seriously and everybody loved and respected him for it and he was in a lot of you know he was in a lot of movies and tv shows that were geared towards kids he was in a canadian kids show where it was making fun of horror movies and cliches he was in the 13 ghosts of scooby-doo he was in the great mouse detective edward scissorhands so he was in a he he loved being in um, kids, you know, media. And he even said this in an interview about how even though that he was well known for his horror movies, he enjoyed just as much in being in kids shows and kids movies because that way the new generation could be introduced to his work and his legacy would live forever. And that's true for the most part. And I can say the same thing for Adam West. Same here. I actually think it introduced the younger generation to him and made it them appreciate him a lot more had had that not happened. I remember that Adam West said that his... It, I, I mean, like, it was said that Adam West's career was kind of tanking in the 80s or, and such until, basically, he had a resurgence, resurgence in the 90s and 2000s and 2010s, and, and people appreciated him a lot more. Yeah, exactly. So, let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 24B, which is called The Dog Broomer. And it was written by Gary Glassberg. You may know Gary Glassberg as um, he was writing for various shows such as Rugrats, Power Rangers, All Real Monsters, and Duckman. But you may know him as the creator of NCIS and NCIS New Orleans. Um, so, in this episode, the babies try to protect Spike from the dog broomer. Now, one of the first things that I noticed right off the bat was the movie that 
um, Stu and Dee Dee and Grandpa Lou are watching. They were watching The Merminator, and they were talking about how um, there were some really good reviews on it, saying like, oh, the bald guy gave it a thumbs up, and then Grandpa Lou said the fat guy, I'm sure the fat guy hated it, which is a reference to Siskel and, Eel, uh, Siskel and Ebert, in which how... Um, you know, Siskel tends to be very analytical and pointing out, like, things, while Eber tends to, you know, be a little bit more open-minded to certain things, but at the same time gets incredibly harsh criticisms. So, yeah, that's a really nice reference there. And they and Siskel and Eber would be referenced in so many cartoons throughout the 90s, such as Animaniacs and um, The Critic. So, at this, it was at this point in time in which their career was starting to get really high. It's a shame that one of them died, though. Yeah, it is a shame. For sure. Uh, So, we have Spike rolling around outside in a puddle that's near garbage, and he starts having a strong smell. And they decide that they're going to call a dog groomer so that they can be able to not only get him clean, but give him a, a nice makeover. So Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil over here, dog broomer, thinking that uh, do- Spike is going to be broomed away. And so... Um, we have Dee Dee looking through, a f- um, uh, the yellow pages on a dog groomer and, and she, a dog groomer, and she decides to hire some sort of, um, European lady by the name of Ilsa. And she comes by and she has this accent that, uh, she says that she's from Helsinki, which is in, uh, Finland. And... Then all of a sudden we have another person who comes on in who is this guy who's trying to sell real estate to Stu and Dee Dee. And we have Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil trying to save Spike from being dog broomed. And, like, I have to say that some of the... I mean, you know, Tommy is the one who's fearful of it, but Chucky, Phil, and Lil think that that Ilsa is very nice and that Spike's just being a scaredy cat. But then when they see... Ilsa's, um, you know, tools and her items to do the dog grooming, you know, for a, for, for a baby, it does look terrifying. Like the blow dryer looks like, um, a ray gun and the steamer looks, I mean, seriously, the steamer, you expect to put a tiny little dog in that steamer, which is supposed to be like for curling up hair and such. How would a dog breathe and survive in that kind of intense heat? The baby's fear of everything is supposed to be usually exaggerated, but that is actually kind of scary if uh, you had a pet who was subject to that treatment. Yeah, and so then Ilsa shows off a book of different designs for dogs, one of them being a reference to the... um, Again, we have another Arnold Schwarzenegger reference with... Um, you know, the the wiener schnitzel or something like that with, like, this bulky dog. And then Dee Dee decides that she wants to make Spike look like a poodle, which I think that it will be referenced a little later on about her love of poodles. But then Spike runs away, and then Issa decides to go after Spike, and then Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil are like, yeah, this lady's scary, we need to rescue her. And it just goes into, like, this way, this wild, crazy chase scene where Ilsa, poor Ilsa, is being dragged around and then lands on the tub filled with water and soap. And then she just starts crying and starts to quit, saying that she's going to go back to her home country and peel potatoes. But then when Dee Dee gives her a tip for $20, she changes her accent to normal, saying, like, oh, it's a star, saying it, it assumes that she's not really European at all. She's just... It's just a facade. Yeah, that's a, that's a con job play. Yeah, and then the guy, the, then the insurance guy was like so scared of everything that happened that he just took the contract and he ran away, saying like, "Oh no, I'm not going to give these people insurance whatsoever. It's going to be probably too much for my book." So, and then we have uh, you know Tommy celebrating with Spike that he's not going to be broomed, and uh, that's pretty much the end. So it is a pretty decent episode, I must say. Nice to see a, a Spike centric episode. But, yeah, I mean, just, it gets a lot crazier towards the end. And, it, you know, with the perspective of the dog broomer, it can be scary, especially for a little kid. So, I do enjoy this episode. It's um, not one of my favorites, but I do think it's pretty decent. Same here. I think that while it isn't one of the all-time classics, I think that is a solid episode that definitely ranks up as one of the 
finest episodes of the season. Yeah. All right. So next we go over to episode 25A. And this it's called Aunt Miriam. And it was written by Peter Gaffney and premiered on November 22nd, 1992. Visiting Aunt Miriam is mistaking for an evil alien by Tommy and Chucky. Now, Aunt Miriam is voiced by Andrea Martin. No, most people would nowadays know her as the voice of Miss Fowl from Jimmy Neutron. So technically, in other words, she had some Nicktoon his- history going back to the early 90s. Yes, she does. And she would play the character over the years, especially with a few episodes down in the later seasons, and as well as, um, you know, the, the Rugrats movie. And she has appeared in other Nicktoons, such as All Real Monsters as well, where she plays as the Grombles' mom. It begins with Stu and Dee Dee receiving a telegram saying about their Aunt Miriam is going to be coming over, and Grandpa Lou is furious because he never liked Aunt Miriam about all the trouble that she causes. And Aunt Miriam is definitely like one of those characters in which she is like really over the top and very bombastic and loud. I'm sure that everybody uh, has at least one family member like that at some point, especially when she, you know, um, constantly gets Dee Dee's name wrong and she's trying to um, you know, smother her cousin Lou trying to say about like how fun they had together even though Lou said he was absolutely miserable and then um, Tommy and Chucky assume that Aunt Miriam is an aunt from outer space because they were just watching a B horror movie from like the 50s about a giant ant crawling around and destroying a city I always loved how they misinterpreted Sam words as being literal, that was one of the best and most defining parts of this show. Yeah. Uh, and and it actually does become pretty valid for Tommy and Chucky because then they actually see, you know, Aunt Miriam pulling out her hair as a wig and putting it to the sidelines. And they thought that the radio that she was listening to was actually a, uh, was her communication to outer space. And then when she walks in, then when she comes in with her beauty mask and, you know, being bald, they think that she's an actual alien, which would be pretty scary for anyone if they were to see her. But the thing that I really enjoyed about this episode was the uh, final confrontation between Aunt Miriam and Grandpa Lou, in which they were talking about how... um, you know, Aunt Miriam was always jealous of Lou because, you know, he was kind of like the leader of the group and everybody was kind of fearful of her when he thought that everybody respected her. And then they had an understanding towards one another when over time they had this disagreement and they didn't really connect with each other for a very long time. It's funny that you bring this up because I bring this up because I actually kind of, well, I don't know if it pertains to the... Uh situation but i actually recently made up with somebody who i had fallen out with for like a decade Mm -hmm. and it was so weird because i this is why one person who i never thought i'd make amends with yeah i mean life kind of throws you a curveball sometimes but we both agreed that there was no bad feelings in that uh, and that that we wished each other the best sure well, that's good to hear, ZL. I'm glad that you were able to make amends with your friend. So, yeah, o- overall, this episode is... Um, it, this epi- I actually do enjoy this episode. The fact that we were able to in- be introduced to a new family member, Aunt Miriam, especially since we had a previous episode that was about family reunions, and it's, a, a, once again, another character from... Um, you know, Stu's side of the family. Except that here, I actually remember Aunt Miriam a lot more than pretty much any other members of the family from that ep- the from the family reunion episode. So uh, we were able to um, get to have a little bit of insight towards Grandpa Lou and Aunt Miriam, and you know, Tommy and Chucky thinking that their uh, that Aunt Miriam was an alien was actually pretty funny. So I I enjoyed this episode. I agree. It's one of the all time definitive episodes of season two and i actually i actually thought it was really funny i couldn't stop laughing throughout the whole episode but i also loved that it had a heartfelt ending and conclusion to all of this and it shows that despite their squabbles as uh, kids that they still that they actually do love each other deep down and that there is a genuine bond between them yeah for sure all right, so let's go over to our next episode. It's called The Inside Story, and it was written by Holly Hunkins. After-
After Chucky swallows a watermelon seed, the babies are forced to shrink down with a laser beam to enter his body to retrieve it after Angelica tells him that it will grow inside his stomach and explode. However, it turns out the entire journey was a dream and that the babies never shrunk down. Now, this episode definitely reminded me on that Magic School Bus books and that was made into an episode in the 90s where the Miss Frizzle and her class had to go inside Arnold's stomach because they wanted to explore the human body. And it's kind of funny enough that we have an episode, we have two, both of these episodes had a lot in common in which, you know, they shrink down, they go inside a body of a boy with red hair and glasses who's very timid. I mean, I'm sure that that is a huge coincidence, but I just thought it was pretty funny. Same here. I actually think that this more or less started the trend of uh, key plots featuring this type of um, story. Yeah, the Fairly Odd Parents have done this, Spongebob has done this, So, and uh, Teen Titans would do this as well, so it's nothing new. So, yeah, basically we have another callback to a 1950s B-horror movie, except, well, more like a science fiction movie, where they're watching a film about a scientist who's going to be um, going over to um, going over to a shrink ray and shrinking down him and his colleagues so that they can be able to retrieve something from the president's brain. And then we have this, you know, cliched villain speak from one of the scientists saying, everything is going according to plan. But what those fools don't know is that I'm not going to take out the bomb from the president's brain. I'm going to detonate it. So... Then we have, uh, you know, the babies going over to a huge watermelon and they start eating it. And Chucky accidentally s swallows the watermelon seed and he's afraid that a watermelon's going to grow inside his tummy. Then Tommy gets the idea that they're going to go inside Chucky's stomach so that they can be able to take the watermelon out. And Angelica even has this nice callback from the movie saying that, you know, she's not going to remove the seed from Chucky's stomach. She's going to let it grow so that he'll explode from the inside out. I think another part that I have to say that is really funny is when Angelica finally grows the seed into a gigantic watermelon and Tommy says, oh yeah, well, you know, how do you feel about the watermelon exploding when you're still inside it? And then she's like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about that. Let's get out of here. And so they run, they row away and then the watermelon explodes and then it turns out to be a dream and Chucky burps out the seed. And then finally, uh, the, the episode ends with Spike eating the seed and then Angelica looks up to the audience, kind of like breaking the fourth wall saying, has anybody ever been inside a dog before? So yeah, overall, this episode is actually pretty good. Well, um, you know, it definitely takes a unique twist into like those 50s uh, science film, you know, those 1950s B science horror films, and it's able to give it like a unique twist with the Rugrats involved. Uh, it definitely is akin to like the Magic School Bus episode in which Miss Frizzle and the rest of the class go inside of Arnold's stomach. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one. All right, our next episode is episode 26A, which is called A Visit from Lipschitz, and it was written by Jonathan Greenberg and premiered on November 29th, 1992. Uh, the episode is about Dr. Lipschitz, the famous child psychologist whose advice Dee Dee always follows, visits the pickles, but he's not prepared to encounter with the babies. This episode cracked me up simply, simply because of all Lipschitz gags and everything. The fact that, the fact that they li literally thought he was a baby. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, not, and I mean, like, he was going to be their new mommy. Yeah, exactly. As, as, as they put it. Yeah, they thought he was going to be a mommy, and then they thought he was a baby. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but yeah, so we have a... So we so Dr. Lipschitz is voiced by the legendary Tony J, who... Who passed away in 2000s. Yeah, he passed away in 2006. So yeah, um, yeah he, he was very well known at the time for voicing various characters. He was Megabyte in Reboot. He was uh, Frollo in Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, he was Shere Khan in Tailspin and Jungle Book 2. So, yeah, he would he would did a lot of voice acting roles in the 90s. That was because during the 80s, he was very well known for being... Um, he was very well known for theater work and um, very well known for theatrical movies when he was in England. But when he moved down to the States, that was when he became a more prominent voice actor. And this was actually one of the first roles that he... Uh, partake of her, he had in television not the very first but definitely one of his first and it definitely helps him and mm -hmm. yeah for sure so basically he also did a few voices for recess i think 
yeah, he, he did a lot of cartoons back in the day. So basically the episode begins with Dee Dee um, in, you know, going over to the to her house really quick and getting everything ready because she had just invited Dr. Lipschitz over for dinner. And, you know, Dr. Lipschitz, uh, I'm, I, I'm just surprised that Dr. Lipschitz was just so willing to go to this complete stranger's house for dinner. I mean, I don't know if he does this very often in which every time he goes around through his book readings or, you know, whenever he goes to do autographs, some random stranger's like, oh, can I invite you over for dinner? And he'll be like, yeah, sure. I mean, a guy's got to eat, you know. <laughs> So anyway, so yeah, so basically, uh, Stu is not interested. He wants to go over to a game alongside with Grandpa Lou. And Chaz is like, is so ecstatic by it because, you know, he's read every single Lipschitz book. And then finally, um, you know, Dr. Lipschitz shows up and he gives off his usual bit of advice about how to raise a child, like, you know, not t tying up a bib uh, too tight and also you know, having quiet time when the babies start crying. And Tommy and Chucky are wondering about who the Lipschitz is, and they think that he's a mommy. And it gives a bit of um, explanation on why they think that, because he's carrying a briefcase filled with diapers and formula, and they assume that that is the reason why he's a mommy. I thought the shenanigans that they went through because they assumed that Dr. Lipschitz was, was their mommy was just... Was just really uproarious and cl and really clever would ensue. All the gags and insanity that would ensue made this episode really, really, really memorable for me. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, then we have the scene in which when Stu, Lou, and Chaz sneak out to go to the game... And Dee Dee was so disappointed that she that her husband left her behind, and Dr. Lipschitz recommended that she go pick him up and drag him back home. And so while she does this, Dr. Lipschitz takes advantage of Dee Dee's hospitality by making himself a corned beef sandwich and taking a bath on their bathtub using luxurious bubble soap and stew and wearing Stu's robe. It's like, wow, this guy must really take advantage of people. I mean, like, I already knew that he was a deconstruction of scummy psychiatrists, but I didn't think he was that bad. Yeah, exactly. Like, this is, like, really up there. If I was invited by someone uh, who looked up to me, or if I invited somebody who I looked up to for dinner, I would be really uncomfortable if they were to do something like this like you know strip down take a bath in my house and wear my clothes that would be weird well it would also carry a lot of germs and they would need to and they would need to wash it out well yeah that that that's for sure too yeah i wasn't offending you that i was just saying in general anybody oh no 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 i know i know that i know yeah exactly like I mean, can you imagine just how, can you imagine just like when you're walking in and then all of a sudden a person that you look up to is just like wearing your clothes and dripping wet and you they have to explain about what's going on? Oh man, that would be really creepy. And anyway, so um, Tommy and Chucky are crying because he spooked them. And then he starts panicking because he doesn't know how to take care of them, which is ironic because he wrote a bunch of books about taking care of babies and he himself doesn't know how to take care of them. And so he starts crying and panicking. And that's when Tommy and Chucky decided that, uh, made the decision that he wasn't a mommy, he was just a baby. And so they play with him and they have fun with him. And then. Fun fact. Yeah. Dr. Lipschitz actually dro name drops the show's name. Yeah, yeah, the little Rugrats, exactly, that's true. Although, Rugrats is a term, that it's an actual term for, like, little babies, so... They, they never, ironically, the show's called Rugrats, but they barely refer to, refer to the babies as Rugrats in the show. Exactly, yeah, this is, very, this is a rare time in which they would actually call the babies as a term that would be normally called by babies. So I thought that was pretty clever. So, yeah, basically, Dr. Lipschitz calms them and covers them, and while they're taking a nap, he decides uh, when, when Dee, Dee, Dee Dee, Stu, Lou, and Chaz come by, they see him in his robe, they're asking a whole bunch of questions, but then he, um, you know, says that he'll explain it later and says that because of Tommy and Chucky, his experience with Tommy and Chucky, he decides that he's going to basically rewrite everything from scratch, and he's going to write a brand new volume dedicated to pr 
proper care of raising your child. And I thought that that was actually a pretty interesting idea that, you know, now that he's gotten a taste of the experience of how to raise children, that he wants to do it the right way. And because of that, he said that he would, they would um, be the first ones to get a copy. And I thought that that was actually really nice. Me too. It really brought a satisfying um, finish to the episode and brought everything full circle. Yeah, for sure. And we would see much later on throughout the series that Dr. Lipschitz's impact on raising babies becomes even more massive than ever. So I take it that he had like a lot more experience with actual babies and child care than he did when he was just first starting out. So we'll be discussing more about that much later on. So overall, this episode is one of the more memorable episodes of season two. The first introduction of Dr. Lipschitz and the fact that we actually do get to see a character that was mentioned so many times throughout the show, who he really is and Tommy and Chucky's thoughts on him. Uh, whether he was a mommy or a baby, and just that creepy moment in which he decides to take advantage of their hospitality, which makes it just very memorable to discuss about. I agree with you 100% on that. Yeah. All right, let's go over to our next episode, which is called episode 26B, and it's called What the Big People Do. And it was written by... <laughs> this, is one, this is one of my all-time favorites. Oh, yeah, this is a great episode. Yeah, so it was written by Patricia Marks. And she is actually really well known for writing a lot of humorous uh, books as well as columns in newspapers and uh, TV shows such as Saturday Night Live. So she knows a thing or two about humor. And She also shares your name. First yes, name. exactly. She also shares my name for sure. That, that's actually pretty cool. All right, so the episode is about Tommy and Chucky imagining their lives as babies, but realizing later that it's better to be young. Now, this has been a stock plot in a lot of cartoons in which, um, you know, kids wish to be grown-ups or grown-ups wish to be younger. But here, it's taken to an extreme level where Tommy and Chucky pretend to be adults and they're going to work and they see the massive... Um, you know, changes from being a baby to a grown-up, and um, it's still played at a kid's perspective, but it's more or less what's going on in real life for adults. I thought that this episode actually put a clever spin on that trope because all the visual, all the visuals, and all the and all the gags just really just work really really fine. Yeah, especially since it is taken to a kid's perspective. So Tommy and Chucky are constantly saying that they wish to be a grown-up, so they decide that they want to wish that way. So we have essentially this creepy imagery of Tommy and Chucky having their dad's head bodies in their heads, which... You know, when when a, when basically when um, you know people imagine themselves to be grown ups, it's basically an uh, older versions of themselves. But this is taken to a big, uh, a different level. So we have Tommy and Chucky waking up to go to work and having Reptar cereal and drinking uh, mud as coffee. And uh, I I actually like a little. It's, it's actually a bit of a clever joke about how when Tommy is speeding because he wants to get a ticket. And ordinarily, that would be a bad thing because usually tickets means that you have to pay like a fine of like a few hundred dollars. But in this case, it's a ticket to go see Reptar on Ice. So I wish if only if only we got more. I think if we get actually got spinning tickets like that, then more people would actually be trying to get fined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would be. I would. I definitely agree. I think we'll be getting. I. I mean, it would be interesting to see about like if what would happen if I sped over through uh, the interstate at about a hundred miles an hour and people will pull me over saying that I was um, going to be receiving two tickets to go see a baseball game or something. That would be pretty hilarious. But no, it doesn't work <laughs> like that in real life. Please don't try this at home. Ugh. Anyway, so Tommy and Chucky head over to work. And they decide to push papers because that's what his dad does. And we see Phil and Lil pushing papers. And then, of course, Angelica is our boss. And she takes the black boss to a whole new level. Oh, man. Like, I mean, the, 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 per, the presentation of the boss is really accurate. Just how incredibly dark... <laughs> And the long hallway leading up to her office and just 
everything filled with fire and just the fact it that seemed he, really it seemed really intimidating especially for a show of his nature oh yeah there's a lot of like creepy imagery in this one so we have her yelling saying that how she's the boss and she could do everything anything she wants when she's acting mean to tommy and chucky and so she <laughs> fires them and the previous boss's paintings come to life and robots are chasing after them and so eventually tommy and chucky wake up and then we get a really it was like something straight out of a treehouse of horror episode of the it, simpsons it does actually it does feel like something out of treehouse of horror for sure and then finally tommy and chucky decide to um you know ring the time clock so that they can be able to get out of work for the day and they re they are back to normal as babies and they decide that they're not going to worry too much about being grown-ups but to stay as babies for the, for the meantime. And then we have another creepy moment with Angelica coming over to Tommy and Chucky saying that they're going to play house and she ha there's this like lightning strike and her pigtails turn into devil horns and it is beyond creepy. I agree. That's, that's the stuff that would give you nightmares for months. Well, yeah, for sure. So overall, we have another great memorable episode of Rugrats that a lot of people seem to re um, recall on fondly. Um, everybody has that dream about whether they want to become older or younger and the there's a lot of repercussions of it especially if you're not at that point in which you can reach it so it's definitely a really intense and creepy looking episode that teaches a very valuable lesson about you know appreciate the age that you are right now and um you know uh, just enjoy the and enjoy the time that you have for being young i concur and the, that this episode hits on that message greatly yeah so next up we're going to be discussing about episode 27 and this is our first uh 24 minute episode of season two the first one that we had in a while since uh, tommy's first birthday so it's called the santa experience it was written by joan sullivan peter gaffney paul germain and jonathan greenberg and it premiered on december 6 1992 after a traumatic Santa visit in the mall, the baby's parents rent a cabin in the mountains in which to spend Christmas. Meanwhile, Chucky is scared of Santa and wants him to stop him from coming, while Angelica tries to right a wrong involving with Phil and Lil's toys and presents. So now we have the first Christmas special from Rugrats. There will be another Christmas special down the line. But uh, this is one that uh, is, I mean, out of the Christmas specials, this is my favorite. I know that a lot of people prefer the other one that comes out in the later season, but there's just something about it. That I gets actually me prefer this one. I mean, I don't hate the the second one, but I think this uh, this one is much better. Yeah, I think so too. I, it really gets me into a bigger fester. Uh, it gets me into a much more festive mood, and also it brings upon um, a bit of an interesting le uh, a bit of an interesting arc with Angelica. Because it starts off with her wanting to um, tell Santa what she wants for Christmas. And she gives this huge long list like she always does. And then all of a sudden she thinks about the fact that Santa should know about this because he's Santa. He knows everything. And then she realizes that Santa is a fake and starts running away and exclaiming it to everybody. And, you know, the, the toy store is so shocked by this that they decide to give her every single toy in the toy store and she's still not satisfied whatsoever. I think that being and being as young as Angelica is and the fact that she doesn't understand about, well, about, about the, um, courtesy or anything like that as much as, say, an eight-year-old one, I think that she took it the wrong way and didn't see how grateful she was yeah and i think that the fact that um down in the line we'll do know a little bit more about how angelica is treated by her parents i think that um you know something like getting every toy store in the entire uh, every toy in the entire store is pretty much nothing for angelica so um and now we have another side plot in which when uh you know chucky is exclaiming to tommy on why he's afraid of santa that he finds him to be really scary and he wants uh, Santa to be away from the chimney and that way that he won't get him. But Tommy is trying to tell him that Santa's good. But, you know, Chucky's still not listening. And he, you know, as always, he's afraid because, I mean, let's be honest. You have a guy coming in in the middle of the night dropping off goodies without your consent and without your knowledge. I mean, I guess for some people, they do kind of find him creepy. And I guess... I actually, know, found, I actually found it funny because... because 
no kid is ever scared of Santa for the most part. I don't, I, I didn't know any kid when I was a kid that was scared of Santa. So it, it was a really funny twist. Yeah, I mean, unless it was Krampus, you shouldn't be afraid of Santa whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah. Krampus, I can understand, but not Santa Claus. So, yeah, now, uh, so we have this uh, moment in which, um, while looking through the amount of toys that um, Angelica got from the toy store, there is a reptar helmet and a coloring book. And Phil and Lil want the reptar doll, the reptar helmet and the coloring book so they can give it to each other as presents. So Angelica pulls off a gift of the Magi in which she decides that she's going to take reptar um phil's reptar in exchange for the coloring book so that he can give it to lil and she takes uh lil's um crayons in exchange for the reptar doll so that she can give it to phil so basically they'll be giving each other a gift and they don't even have the stuff that is complementing the gift at all because they gave it to angelica and so she's doing this on purpose because she wants to feel really bad. But that is, but she starts changing her mind when Grandpa Lou starts telling the story about how Santa Claus can sometimes give kids a lump of coal for Christmas if they behave, if they're on the naughty list. And then that's when she decides that she wants to be good throughout the Christmas trip that they're going to, which is they're going to go over to a log cabin so that they can be able to feel the festive mood. And for the most part, it doesn't really work at all because she never could have time to spend with Phil and Lil because they're so busy with Betty and Howard. I actually appreciated how Angelica went from just trying to make things right because she wanted her present to actually genuinely feeling bad. I actually thought that was great character development at as the episode progresses, Angelica, uh, Angelica's remorse becomes genuine. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that is why Angelica is a very um, is a very popular character amongst the Rugrats community. Because, yes, she could be really mean and nasty, but at the same time, she does have a good side to her that wishes to be good. And, that, and she also has some sympathetic moments that she feels genuinely sorry. I've said this many times before when I talk about Ren from Ren and Stimpy, in which he acts really mean to Stimpy. But at the same time, he has a lot of genuine moments where he misses him when he's gone or when, you know, he is not around and he appreciates um, the fact that Stimpy is always taking care of him. I've always stated this a lot of times, and I think it's apparent here with um, Angelica. I agree. Angelica is actually the character I relate most to because I feel like in some ways my personality is actually similar to her, except I don't have the baggage with my parents that Angelica has with hers. I mean, my mom is a workaholic and I don't have the issue with being spoiled and everything. Yeah, exactly. Although I don't think Angelica's like DW or K. Lou or any of those types of characters. So I, I just find it hard to call her a spoiled brat because, because I don't view her on the same level as those characters. Yeah, for sure. And I think that um, Angelica trying her trying her hardest to be a good person is actually a really relatable lesson that it's never too late to be good around the holidays. I mean, we look at Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol, where he started off as like a curmudgeon who only cares about money. And then the next day when visiting after he was after his confrontations with the three spirits, he becomes a good person and he stays that way. So it's, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think that's a great lesson for anybody who, you know, who feels a little bit grouchy around the holidays that it's never too late to become wholesome. So uh, this episode is actually a really interesting one because, so this episode gives us the very first appearance of Charlotte, uh, Angelica's mom and Drew's wife, who is voiced by Tress McNeil. And she showcases her busy self right away because constantly she's on her cell phone talking to her assistant, Jonathan. Yeah, I think that pretty much exhibits why Angelica has the way she does because of her relationship with her parents, her parents being constantly busy and not really spending any time with them. I think in many ways she's like an infant version of Helga, yeah. like Helga before Helga. Yeah, except that Helga's is a lot more traumatic. She, But yeah, you're right, in which the reason why Angelica acts the way she does is because her parents are basically overcompensating her 
for the fact that they're being for the fact that they're incredibly busy you know uh, you know Didi is I mean we have Charlotte who's the president of a company and we have uh, Drew who works at this huge bank as an executive so they're constantly busy and they're leaving um, Angelica with Stu and Didi to take care of and every chance they get they spoil her with a bunch of toys and uh, call her princess and all that kind of stuff and saying that she should be an independent girl who shouldn't rely on men to take her down i mean she has headstrong parents so you can definitely see- i think that i think that's honestly why i, I like angel as a character in the sense that she's not like a stereotypical female character i mean like she is strong she doesn't take any crap and she lets people know where she stands yeah like she is like a like a mini version of a mother yeah, for sure. And I guess Klasky Chupo liked Angelica so much that they pretty much just made her a caricature in pretty much every single one of their Nicktoons. And All Real Monsters, we had the Gromble, which it makes a lot of sense for the Gromble because, you know, he's a headstrong teacher and he constantly yells, but he has a sweet side. So I can give that a pass. Um, Rocket Power, on the other hand, I cannot. Because Mackenzie is essentially Angelica 2.0, except that she's just has none of the characteristics or the um, sympathetic moments that makes her a great character. I think that that's definitely at the point in which I felt that they were stretching the constant re- um, the constant recycling of characters way too far, and. And and I, I guess maybe Debbie from the Wild Thornberries might be a case, but she's nowhere near as similar to Angelica because she's a teenager. I felt like I felt like Reggie was a better Reggie was a better example, ironically, even though she's like twelve years old. Yeah, she's twelve years old, and but she's not a spoiled brat, and she doesn't yell just so she can get what she wants. She's actually, oh no, I didn't mean I don't I I didn't mean it like that. I meant like she's headstrong and everything. Oh no no no! I, there's there's a huge difference between like being headstrong, you know. There's doing it the right way, and then there's doing it the wrong way. Anyway, so yeah, Debbie um, is nowhere... I mean, Debbie would ha- probably have, like, similar characteristics to Angelica, but it, it's much different. She's 16 years old, and she's acting like the stereotypical 90s moody teenager who reads off, um, you know, grunge magazines and listens to rock and roll and doesn't really care too much about her parents' uh, jobs as being, um, you know, working in, a doc- uh, working in a nature series. And for, as told by Ginger, we would have... Miranda, and we would have, I guess, maybe Mrs. Dave, but again, you know, they're teenage. Miranda's a teenager, and Mrs. Dave is an old woman, so I guess that is a pass. I think that out of all of them, Mackenzie's definitely the worst example of recycling the same characters over and over again. I mean, it's just, I, I feel like she's pretty much the same thing as I, I felt like after Arlene Klasky fully embraced Angelica as her favorite character later on in the series, she tried to do the same thing again with Emma Kenzie, but didn't understand what made Angelica work in the first place. I think that Angelica worked because while she had flaws, she was well meaning and did have her ha- did have a heart, whereas Mackenzie just felt like a just felt like a caricature of a spoiled brat. Exactly. Without any of the charm. Exactly. So yeah, I think that um, yeah, no, because that Paul Germain created the character, and a lot of people like Steve Vixton, Paul, Craig Bartlett, and others had written you know episodes that showcases Angelica's mean yet sweet attitude. Arlene, I felt like tried to do the same thing, but just couldn't replicate it as well as she could have. But anyway, we're getting way off topic. Let's let's go back to the um, the discussion of the Santa experience. So the one thing that I really do appreciate about this episode is that um, you know after Angelica finds out that the, the 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 Santa from the mall was a fake, he does his very best so that um, everybody can have a really nice Christmas. And even Chaz discusses about how every single one of his Christmases was a disaster, which actually is true because it would be referenced in all grown up in the episode uh, in the christmas episode where every year they seem to have this really crappy looking tree and their christmases would turn out to be a disaster and the fact that talk would- about a lot talk about getting continuity right yeah exactly that is really excellent continuity uh, we'll be discussing about that episode much later on so they decide that they were going to rent a. Uh, so they they did, so the idea of the log cabin is actually pretty perfect because 
you know, when you go over to a log cabin and it's snowing and you get to get your own tree, it does give you that festive mood. And, you know, then D Drew decides to hire a Santa that would come over to the house and greet the kids with birth uh, with Christmas presents. And Angelica um, is fearing that because she wasn't, you know, try because she wasn't um, able to make Phil and Lil, um, she wasn't able to give Phil and Lil the presents that she took from them, that she was basically going to behave bad and she was going to get cold for the rest of her life. And then the Santa comes along and gives her a Malibu Cynthia um, model, um, um, dolls, uh, a Malibu Cynthia home set. And then Santa gives her a lesson about like trying to be good is just as well as trying to be as, uh, as just as well as somebody who is already good. And uh, then th then you have that sweet moment in which um, Angelica does give um, uh, Phil and Lil their present, uh, their, you know, their stuff back. And then, you know, they, they give her a hug. And uh, the, then you have that beautiful uh, schadenfreude moment in which while trying to look for a car in the Cynthia Malibu home set, it's instead a lump of coal. So I thought that that was actually a pretty nice lesson, and then I felt I felt sorry for Angelica considering, even though I felt sorry for Angelica, I actually thought that twist at the end was hilarious, and I get that it was supposed to be ironic, but yeah, I still felt sorry for her, but I still laughed my ass off. Yeah, for sure, it's it, it it is a beautiful shot in Freud a moment for sure, and. Um, then we have then we then we have this last scene in which when um, you know Drew is very thankful for the Santa and he was uh, received a phone call talking about how the Santa that he hired wasn't able to make it because of traffic and then they're thinking about like who was that guy who dropped off the presents so maybe it could be the real Santa hmm? I don't know Santa actually exists in the Rugrats universe yeah he does I guess so. So yeah, overall, uh, the the Santa experience is one of my favorite episodes from this season, as well as one of my favorite episodes throughout the entire series. It's actually one of my favorite Christmas specials in Nickelodeon. It's it gives you into the it gets into the festive mood. It has a great uh, classic tale telling of Gift of the Magi with a Rugrats twist, and it, sh it you know we get to see Angelica trying to be good when she's been seen mostly as bad throughout the series so i thought that this was fantastic and tommy and chucky's plot about like trying to prevent santa from coming in was it was pretty cute but i felt that the angelica um plot was much more memorable i concur with you angelica's kind of the story was far more interesting and gripping and gravitating i think especially as you get older yeah i i agree all right, let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 28A, and it is called Visitor from Outer Space, and it was written by Paul Germain, and it premiered on December 13th, 1992. Tommy dreams that he and the other Rugrats are captured by aliens that resemble his parents and his grandfather. Angelica steals a planet automatizing remote uh, from Stu Vaughn, Stu is an alien, and escapes, help from a talking, escapes with help from a talking fish. Meanwhile, the babies wander into the spaceship's control room and play with the controls, thinking that they're toys. So we have this really weird episode where there's uh, where Tommy is dreaming about his family being aliens and wandering around, like if um, and wandering around this huge spaceship. And uh, it, I guess, it does kind of like start off with like talks of aliens, and then Tommy is dreaming about it. And the alien depictions are like really weird looking. Stu and Dee Dee are the aliens, and Grandpa Lou's the robot. And it's it, it reminds me of the trippy moments from Mirrorland. It's just like really out there. Yeah, I agree. But I thought all the different all the different designs and everything and caricatures were really 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 creative and amazing to look at yeah they are really creative to look at for sure and then we have angelica who's trying to find a way to escape and she meets up with this talking fish who's from fishyokia and um you know discussing about like if he helps her if she helps him get free then he can be able to show her a way out 
And so that's when she decides to set him free. And he kind of betrays her, in a sense, in which he decides to take the spaceship and go away. Uh, some of my favorite moments were definitely with uh, the anti-gravity scene in which they're floating around and uh, the babies are playing with um, the, the main control room and thinking that it's toys, which it kind of does look like toys, you're getting into the baby's imagination. And, um, yeah, I think that um, it's very, it's not really much of an episode filled with plot. It's just, like, it's very similar to Mirrorland. It's just an episode that has, like, some really trippy moments. Like, definitely classic Klasky Chupo vibes right here. I agree, and that's why I love their animation. It, it kind of has, like, a Bob Clackett type of aura to it. Yeah, there's not really much to say about this episode. Um, the only thing I do have to mention, though, is that this is another episode that was referenced in Reptar, uh, uh, Rugrats Search for Reptar, that was a, a level in the game where you get to actually uh, play as Angelica and you shoot the remote as um, as like a laser and then you get to float around in the anti-gravity section. So I thought that that was pretty neat. But yeah. Me, um, me too. So yeah, this episode is just like really weird and really trippy, and I think that that is why um, it's pretty memorable to um, a lot of Rugrats fans. All right, it's also worth noting that 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 it's actually that Rugrats is a show basically that um, it's rather driven more than story by driven, but at times it feels like a mixture of both because even though it is clearly writer centric, there's a lot of fluid and flu and flowing animation and i think it's because the writers connect so well with the artists that there's that there's um a mixture of both worlds yeah and, and you can definitely tell that it was script uh, script driven as opposed to storyboard driven because uh this was uh, very common at the time for a show to be script driven even the simpsons was mostly script driven uh, it wasn't until when Ren and Stimpy came along that they brought back the storyboarding uh, driven shows back. And that was when a lot of shows throughout the 90s, and even still to this day, use a lot of storyboards to tell their stories. So, um, and I, I guess because that Rugrats had animated. Um, what were you know had animated the first season of The Simpsons that they probably took into the script driven phase and utilized a lot of their writing for the episodes. Maybe they did move over to a storyboarding phase later on, but you can definitely tell that this was more script driven in the early seasons. I agree, but it's but it's an example of how uh, script driven cartoons can have as much strength as storyboard driven because it, it has similar animation and similar squatch and stretch techniques yeah and and something like Klasky chupo does tend to lean towards a lot towards their animation as opposed to their storytelling especially in the earlier run of rugrats exactly all right so let's go over to our next episode episode 28b and it's called the case of the missing rugrats Grandpa uses his skills from working as a detective in the 1930s to look for Tommy after he winds up in a mansion home of two eccentric sisters. So it starts off with Grandpa Lou shopping around in a grocery store. And um, while he's looking at some old car, because he's reminiscing about the days where he used to be a detective, I'll just let you know, Grandpa Lou was a lot of things back in his day. We'll be talking more about some of the stuff that he used to do much later on. This is a reference to Charlie's Angels, which David Doyle was a part of. Yeah, that is true, actually. Uh, some people don't actually know that. But, yeah, he was a member. Of, uh, yeah, he actually was in Charlie's Angels. Uh, but, um, so basically, while looking at the car, um, there's these two old women who come on by and take Tommy, and then they go away. They think that he's actually a gift that, um, you know, they think that he's actually, like, a gift for them, saying, oh, uh, we've been looking for an heir for our estate for so long, this baby has come to us, and we're going to raise him as our own and call him Boswick, and then they, they just drove away, and, Boswick. yeah, Boswick, what a name, <laughs> so Grandpa Lou is looking around for Tommy, he doesn't know where he is, and so he decides to use his detective skills and thinking all the way back toward that car, when he finds out who the car belongs to, he is led over to this huge mansion, which is which belongs to the Pendragons, which I really like the last name Pendragon, because Pendragon would be the name of a book series written by DJ McHale, the creator of Are You Afraid of the Dark? 
This was after he finished his run and he decided to write off all of these fantasy novels with the same name. So I'm actually curious of where, if maybe this is where he got the name from. So yeah, so basically, um, Grandpa Lou, um, he does his... Um, so he, he arrives over to the house and it, it's a really weird looking house. And these women are really weird. Like they're really crazy. And the reason why they're raising Tommy as their own is because they never got married and they need to continue on the Pendragon legacy. And so they think that he is, uh, that Tommy is the one who will continue on the lineage and they will not let him go whatsoever. And so then uh, Grandpa Lou has to prove to them that that is his grandson. And one of the things that he tries to prove them with is with the pickle's birthmark where, he op- where he's showing off his chest. And then they're like, oh, no, do you have any pictures of him? And then he shows off that he has a ton of pictures of Tommy. And then, uh, you know, then they believe him and then they give Tommy back to him. And then they still call him Boswick. And we even see, you know, Tommy, like, following in the rich upper class side when he actually crosses his arms um, together, which I thought was actually really funny. Yep, he imitated what they were doing. So, yeah, this episode is um, another weird one. It's not one of my favorites, but... Uh, the fact that you have these two old ladies who take a baby that isn't theirs and raise them as his own, it is actually pretty terrifying, especially if you were to go out with your family and then you would just no- notice that your child is missing and, you know, for whatever reason. It actually does bring up a repercussion that you have to take care of your child at all times. But it also could be a lesson for Grandpa Lou saying, hey, Watch over your kid. You never know what can happen in this crazy world, especially with all the stuff that your grandson and his friends have done over the course of the show. Exactly. But the cra- but I have to say that the ladies were just like really out there, like really crazy and just really over the top. So, all right. Uh, the next one we're going to be discussing about is episode uh, 29A, and it's called Chucky Loses His Glasses. And it was written by Rachel Lipman. Now, this is actually the first episode that she wrote, and she would write episodes for many um, episodes of Hey Arnold, and she would pretty much work with Craig Bartlett throughout his entire career. She would write episodes for a lot of his shows, such as Dinosaur Train and Ready, Jet, Go. This is one of her first moments where she gets to show off her writing and her career. So, um, so we have, okay, so the episode is about Chucky's glasses disappear during a game of hide and seek, and he has trouble finding his friends without them. So, yeah, it's a basic episode with Chucky, um, you know, losing his glasses, and Angelica takes them, and she starts fooling around with them, and we see the scary things that Chucky sees without his glasses. He thinks that there's, um, a huge... He thinks that there's a huge monster. He thinks that Tommy, uh, Phil, and Lil are bushes when he goes outside. And Angelica treats him really cruelly, like basically taking his glasses, pushing him outside when it's raining, and getting Spike after him. So, yeah, Angelica is like acting really cruelly in this episode, but she does get her amazing shot in Freud a moment in which when she's wearing the glasses and she's spinning around dizzy because of the heavy prescription on Chucky's glasses, which is really heavy. Well, it's funny that Angelica has that problem because her voice action certainly doesn't. Well, I mean, it's up to a different interpretation, I suppose. I was joking. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we have this wonderful schadenfreude moment with Angelica where she, while she was wearing the glasses, and Chucky's prescription looks like it's very high. We could assume maybe it's like a, I don't know, maybe like a 2.50 or a 3.0 where you know she where it's like really um blurry and she's spinning around with them and she becomes really dizzy and so she becomes sick and she actually throws up on drew's sweater and you actually get to see the vomit it's not implied you actually get to see it firsthand and it is gross i was uh i was surprised that they got away with that yeah for sure but then again this was early nice nick Yeah, exactly. I don't think you can get away with it nowadays. I mean, I'm sure that you can, but I'm sure you have to be really clever about it. So, so we have, um, so, so basically Tommy, Phil, and Lil are concerned about Chucky, uh, Chucky because he hasn't been, uh, finding them lately and he's, um, been gone for a long time. And so then when Angelica gives Tommy his glasses, he starts wearing them and he sees 
um, from Chucky's perspective, all the creepy monsters that are around, and he says, wow, no wonder he's scared all the time. And then he thinks that Chucky is a bag of vegetables, and uh, then when he... Uh, finally goes outside, they finally find Chucky and they give him back his glasses. I also do like the moment in which when Chucky was outside and he steps on a pair of glasses, he thinks that that was his own, but it was actually Grandpa Lou's glasses, and it plays off wonderfully at the end, where he's wandering around, he can't see anything, and he um, acts, um, uh, you know, he asks like a lamp saying, uh, Didi, have you seen my glasses? So, I thought that that was actually pretty clever. Uh, overall, uh, this episode is pretty decent. It's not one of my favorites, but um, this episode w- will once again play as a reference in Rugrats Search for Reptar, which you play as Chucky and you have to find your glasses and such. So, um, overall, I mean, there are some pretty funny moments, but it's not one that I'll probably watch over and over again. I agree. It's just okay. It's yes. not bad, but it's not best. Okay. But we have another Chucky-centric episode here with episode 29B, and it's called Chucky Gets Skunked, and it was written by Peter Gaffney. A skunk sprays Chucky, and both the grown-ups and babies try to do something about the terrible smell. So there's a skunk in their in Stu and Dee Dee's backyard, and they try to go after it, but they're afraid because they don't want to get skunked. Now, the reason why a skunk would let out its odor is because it feels threatened, and... I actually found I actually saw this uh, video on Facebook the other day of the police force running away from the skunk after um you know the after the owners of the backyard were calling saying can you please get rid of this and while the skunk is running away into the front yard all the police officers are running away too because they don't want to be skunked so I thought that that was pretty funny and that is still apparently a thing I agree this episode was a crack up yeah, and I think that uh, with Chucky getting skunked, it's actually pretty, um, it's it's actually pretty sad, especially since he's already going through enough stuff as it is. So um, we have, you know, Chaz constantly, um, you know, trying to get rid of the skunk smell, and he does the classic remedies of a, of getting rid of the smell, which is tomato juice and tomato paste. Uh, apparently, it involves with like because of the acidity of the um, the tomato juice, uh, uh, the, the acidity of the tomatoes, as well as its texture, can be able to get through to your skin, and it can be able to remove the oils from the skunk, uh, the, the the skunk spray. He tried it, but it didn't work. And he tried soap and water six times, but Chucky's skin started to peel, and the smell was stronger than ever. Which that's a good lesson: never ever use soap when you're trying to get rid of the skunk odor, because. <laughs> It just makes it worse. Exactly. It makes it a lot worse. It doesn't get rid of the oil that is in that is seeped into your skin. It gets it worse. Chucky is like really depressed that he can't play with his friends because he smells like a skunk. And uh, we have Grandpa Lou coming up with an idea of, uh, you know, giving Chucky like this soaking mud bath that will last for a few weeks, but then um, last for only 20 minutes instead. And it doesn't work at all because obviously when you take something that only lasts for weeks as opposed to 20 minutes, it's going to be much, much quicker and the results wouldn't seep in as well. And then we have Stu having the idea of, you know, you know, spraying Chucky with a bunch of cologne and a bunch of perfume, but that doesn't work either. It just makes him smell like a skunk going on a hot date. And then we have... He Bor- literally says that. No, he, yeah, exactly. He does say that. Then we have uh, Boris and Mika coming over and they bring a pot of borscht. Uh, borscht is a cold beet soup from Eastern Europe, um, from Eastern Europe descent. And... Uh, basically, they decide that they were going to, um, you know, when they hear the news about uh, Chucky being skunked, Bink- Minka comes up with the idea of getting of an old remedy on how to get rid of the skunk smell. And uh, then Chucky, uh, Tommy decides to have an idea about how Borscht can be able to get rid of the skunk smell because he heard his uh, dad talking about how he can get rid of grease stains on the car. And so they decide to dunk Chucky in to the borscht, and then they constantly, um, you know, splash him with it, and it gets rid of the skunk smell. Which, I'm actually curious, would borscht get rid of skunk smell? Because I know that, um, you know, borscht, with its preparation of beets, I don't know if it's as acidic as tomatoes, especially the way it's prepared. I know that it is very sour. So I'm actually curious if, it, if anybody actually tried this, and if it does work. 
Me too. I mean, like, this plot device has been used so many times on cartoons since this episode came out that I'm wondering if it actually this technique does work in real life. I felt like this episode actually did the character get sprayed by a skunk a lot better than other cartoons because I feel like it added new twists and suspense to keep you on your toes. Yeah, exactly. It does keep you on your toes. And I think that... Um yeah, so basically, um, since then, there have been a lot of recipes out there for getting rid of the skunk smell. And, the you know, the most common recipe nowadays is like, uh, you know, f- basically it's one quart of hydrogen peroxide, a quarter cup of baking soda, one teaspoon of liquid soap, and you just bathe yourself with it, un- you know, thoroughly until the smell is over or you do it multiple times until the smell is over. So the whole, they they pretty much debunked the tomato juice slash tomato paste. But I'm still actually curious about the borscht. I'm act- I want to, for, for anybody who is skunked, uh, first of all, I'm sorry. And if you ever do borscht and it works, please let us know. Uh, let us know on our Facebook page, uh, the Rugrats View from the Crib Facebook page. So yeah, overall, this episode is, again, not one of my favorites, but... Uh, just seeing a different perspective of Chucky once again going through some um, catastrophes with him being skunked this time. Um, it's different, I have to say, and the resolution of how he gets unskunked is unique. But again, this is an episode I really don't want to like rewatch over and over again. I just thought it was okay. Me too. I mean, like, if I'm binge watching the show, I'll catch it, but I wouldn't go out my way to watch it if I was going to watch a Rugrats episode sporadically. I mean, not sporadically. I mean, like, out of the blue. Yeah. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 30A. It's called Rebel Without a Teddy Bear, and it was written by Jonathan Greenberg, and it premiered on January 3rd, 1993. When Tommy's favorite stuffed lion plush gets filthy, Dee Dee confiscates it. Tommy is greatly upset about this, thinking he'll never see his stuffed animal again. And Angelica helps Tommy to go bad when he get to get what he wants. So this is actually a really interesting tale of, you know, if you don't get your way, you have to act mean and nasty. And you know, we have Tommy. I actually liked epi- I actually liked episodes like this because it actually. Show there's another side to Tommy and show that he wasn't all good natured and perfect like other protagonists are and show that even he cannot be one hundred percent at times. Like he, even he's capable of doing bad stuff. And I feel like that added a lot to his character. Yeah, exactly. And I think that and and believe it or not, this plot point would happen two more times throughout the series. It would happen with Lil, and it would happen with Chucky. But we'll be discussing more about that later on. So Tommy has a stuffed animal by the name of Henry, but it's actually Herman. But he has a, a, the lion is a, a, the lion is absolutely filthy, and they decide that they were going to give him a bath. So they couldn't reach the soap, so they used mustard instead. And Dee Dee takes the, the toy away, thinking that it's completely ruined. And Tommy is really upset because... He says that everything that he gets, his parents take it away, and he gets really angry. And so Angelica convinces him to start acting bad. In order for him to get what he wants, he needs to act nasty. That way he can be able to get his toy back. So the first thing that Tommy does is that he goes over to the kitchen, and he sees a, and he sees a cup of juice on a table, and he's going to knock it down. But what he does is that he actually drinks the juice and then knocks the cup over because he didn't want to make a mess. Then Angelica he's gives just him... just too good-natured. Yeah, he's... He, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, Tommy is a good kid, and I don't... And, you know, I mean, we even talked about this, like, throughout season one, but all the times that he would be acting like a baby, like, you know, him coloring on the walls and him pulling on Dee Dee's ear and him getting lost and stuff like that... He's not doing it because he's being bad. He's just doing it because he's a baby. And we can see here that Tommy is just a good-natured baby. He was raised by good parents, and so he doesn't want to do anything that would cause his parents to get upset. So, In a way, I think he's actually kind of like the baby version of baby equivalent to SpongeBob. Yeah, maybe. Like, very pure-hearted and just the fact that he wants to be good to every, to everyone. And Angelica decides to teach him how to be a nasty baby, uh, teaching him how to throw clothes away, breaking things, causing things to be a mess. 
And Stu and Didi are really concerned about it. They say that, you know, uh, and Didi says, oh, don't worry, he's just going through a phase that'll probably last for a few months. And uh, he still doesn't get his toy in the end. And so Angelica decides, you've been doing kid stuff. We're going to go to a, a, a much more extreme level. So they go over to Didi's room, grab her necklace, and he says uh, he's going to throw it away in the trash. And Chucky's like, no, Tommy, don't do it. If you do it, then you're going to be doing even more things. You're going to end up in prison eventually. And Angelica says, no worry, because, you know, Tommy's not afraid of prison. And then eventually, um, you know, Tommy doesn't do it. And Angelica just basically Tommy walks crashed. away. And then Angelica says, uh, you babies, not even have any guts. It's, I mean, it's true because, you know, he didn't throw Dee Dee's necklace away in the garbage. But it was a good thing that he didn't because the lion is restored back to normal, who's completely clean and is completely full again because before we saw him completely shrunk over because of the water. So... Um, so Tommy gets his lion back, Dee Dee gets her necklace back, and, and it basically ends on a happy note, with Angelica basically huffing and puffing that she saw this happen. So it just goes to show you that the life lesson of people behaving good will get you what you want. So kids, don't behave bad to get what you want. You'll just end up getting into trouble. Exactly. I love how this show brought us morals without being too preachy and hitting your head with a hammer over it yeah and i think that um episodes like this are actually pretty good with teaching kids uh proper life lessons without having to say remember kids you must do this and this and that so you can be able to get this and this and that i think that um you know the fact that they would make fun of this kind of teaching and like the dummy bears and whatnot it um, goes to show them that they wanted to teach kids lessons in a more subtle way as opposed to um, in ordinarily in like kids shows in which like they hammer in the message so that kids can be able to learn it but being incredibly just not just being not subtle with their lessons whatsoever so let's go over to our next episode it is episode 30b it's called angelica the magnificent and it was written by michael ferris Angelica experiments with magic and Lil goes missing in the process. This leads to the belief that Angelica made Lil disappear. So Angelica purchases a magic kit and she decides that she's going to try to make things disappear, but it doesn't work for the most part. Um, so then she decides that she's going to ask her daddy for help. And we have, um, you know, Drew sprinkling in some magic dust when he actually just takes the ball from her cup. And then Angelica believes that she is a magician and that she's so good that she can make one of the babies disappear. I thought the Taj Mahal joke was really, 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 really well written. <laughs> I mean, like, I didn't get that as a kid, but as an adult, I understand it a lot more now. Yeah, and, and and one of the things that I didn't notice when I was a kid is that um, what instead of saying like abracadabra, she said "En Agata de Vida," which is actually a song by Iron Butterfly. And I, uh, you know, this there's a, really... a Simpsons joke about that. Exactly, there was a Simpsons joke about that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got it from there, as because as mentioned before, Klasky Chupo did work in animating the first season of The Simpsons. Exactly, it's like Klasky Chupo was really impressed. Yeah, and yeah, this actually does remind me of an episode of Hey Arnold in which um, Arnold is, uh, you know, a magician and he's trying to make Helga disappear. And so she decides to walk away and then she has that crazy um, It's a Wonderful Life moment in reverse in which nobody misses her. And so then she decides to help Arnold out with his magic trick. So we have uh, Angelica making Lil disappear and they actually think that she was gone for good, which I thought was actually pretty funny. Me too. You guys have been watching too many cartoons. Yeah, that's actually... I, I, I think I remember that um, that was a line that my mom would say all the time. Um, you know, that I would be it watching... Really, that's really matter. Yeah, exactly. For sure. And I think that, um, you know, the fact that, um, you know, Lil is not... Uh, she doesn't even know what's going on because when she was in the box she was chasing around a butterfly and Tommy, Chucky, and Phil are trying to convince Angelica to bring her back and he, you know she he, she tried so many times but she couldn't and then she's like, oh well uh, you know, that's, that's how it is, you can't do anything about it and so uh, then, you know she thinks that she's like really good 
at you know making things dis uh, th disappear that she decides to um, make her dad disappear with her magic and then they decide to drag her into the house because they thought that she was cranky and needs a nap and so then we have Tommy picking up the wand and trying to perform a magic trick and the magic trick ends up with the shed that Stu and Drew have been working so hard into building. It completely crashes and falls down. And then he throws the wand saying that there are some things that even a baby shouldn't fool around with, which is magic. Which, that's actually pretty true. I mean, sometimes when you get, like, power, there are some things that, you know, not everybody should even have the power to do. Which I thought that that was actually a pretty nice lesson. Exactly. They should hold back. Mm -hmm. They should hold back. All right, so overall, this episode is actually, um, this I actually did like this episode. It, you know, seeing Angelica as a magician and that little side plot with Lil disappearing and, um, you know, Angelica thinking that she has the power to make everything disappear. I thought that that was actually pretty funny. Me too. And the, the answer she gets into, uh, yeah. really, really, really something. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we go over to episode... 31A, which is called Meet the Carmichaels, and it's written by Steve Vixen and Joanne Sullivan, and it was created on January 10th, 1993. New neighbors move in from across the street from the Pickles, where Tommy helps the youngest member of the family, Susie, find her room. Now, this is our first introduction to the Carmichael family, which will play out throughout the rest of the series, and according to the Slime book, Steve Vixen claims that he was the one who created the character of Susie because they wanted to bring more variety into the show. Oscar Kokoschka technically created her. <laughs> yeah, very true. Because later on, Steve would play as Oscar in Hey Arnold. So, yeah, basically, um, the new neighbors started moving into the, uh, to the new house. And Stu was concerned about the fact that the house that they're living in, apparently there's some legend going around that, you know, it's home to, like, this Native American curse. And so Dee Dee thought that it was ridiculous, and she brings in, like, jellos to welcome the neighbors, which um, I don't think, I mean, that, that used to be a thing back then in which, like, you know, you brought jello over to a neighbor's house, but they don't really do that anymore. But the fact that you get to see something traditional like that is actually pretty funny, looking back on it now. But uh, the the jello that, you know, they brought in... Um, uh, so you have them entering into the house and we get introduced to uh, Lucy Carmichael, who is she is like the most overachieving mother ever. She's a doctor. She was in the Peace Corps. She knows how to make, um, you know, stuff from scratch like that. She was the one who created the lamp and she went to the she went to the court on blue where she learned how to do various things. It's like this woman knows how to do a lot of things. And then we have Randy Carmichael, who happens to be a writer of the Dummy Bears uh, TV series. And Stu is bombarding him with so much facts about the Dummy Bears that it's actually pretty hilarious. And it will play on much later on in an episode where we'll be discussing about, you know, the Dummy Bears and the creation of it. So then we have Tommy meeting up with Susie. And Susie talks about, like, she has her room with all her toys, but she doesn't know where her room is because they haven't moved in her stuff yet. And I have to say that, you know, first impressions of Susie were not good to me because she ends up as a big crybaby. And she would become much better as a character. She would essentially become the anti-Angelica, where she's nice to the baby, she gives them good advice, and she stands up to Angelica when the babies are, are being picked on by Angelica. Her personality is slightly different than it would be in later episodes, where she becomes more assertive and stand up. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, you're right. Exactly. Her her personality would be much la uh, different later on. But this is her first introduction as the character, so they were probably just tweaking the character around so that they can be able to shape her into the character that she would become later on. So yeah, there's not really much into this episode. I mean, there are some nice little references, like um, there's the there's a scene in which when one of the movers was dropping a box and it says fragile in it, and he asked one of the movers, "Hey, what does fragile mean?" Which is actually a reference to a Christmas story in which um, the old man receives a box that says fragile in it and he says fragile must be French and it actually turns out to be the leg lamp and then we have them sitting outside while they're taking a break and they're looking at the M&M saying how do you think they get the M in M&M's which is the second time that M&M's is referenced in Rugrats the first time around would be when um, Tommy and Chucky are with Dee Dee doing her errands at the bank 
So there's not really much to this episode. It's just Tommy and Susie looking for the stuff in her room, which I thought that was actually pretty nice. And, you know, the I, I but I actually enjoyed the interactions with the adults a little bit more. Dee Dee with Lucy and uh, Stu with Randy. I thought that that was pretty hilarious. And yeah, especially as people can relate because not, especially nowadays as people have more social media access to animators and writers whereas back then they but then the best you could do is basically live locally near them in LA or write them or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Overall this episode is really a nice introduction to a brand new family who will play a huge role throughout the rest of the series and um you know Tom and basically just a nice little adventure with Tommy and Susie but the stuff with the adults are much better in terms of entertainment so um Susie would become a much better character later on but her first introduction here was a little bit rocky for me me too i think that she got better as a character as the series progressed yeah Episode 31B is called The Box, and it was written by Michael Ferris. Stu buys a self-assembly theme park toy for Tommy, but finds it to be too complicated. Meanwhile, the babies quickly find something even more fun, the box that the toy came with. And this is clearly a plot point that SpongeBob would use much later on throughout the series, in which a box is able to bring out the character's imagination. (laughs) I think that... A lot of cartoons use this plot device since this episode. I mean, like, a lot of people think Spongebob started it, but it's actually regrets. Yeah, not only that, but they started it, like, what, like, seven or eight years before Spongebob? So, yeah, this plot point was done before. And uh, basically that Stu purchased this huge theme park assess- uh, theme park toy which kind of like reminds me of those old Kinects toys from the 90s in which you got to put them together except here it's a lot more complicated the instructions are super complicated there's some pieces that look really funny and um you know there's just so much of it that Stu had decided that he was going to try his very best to um make it look really nice for Tommy he saw the kitty carnival and like some sort of catalog and he heard some stories about it being complicated to put together but because he's a toy inventor he wants to actually take on the challenge and um tommy is actually having a lot more fun with the box when he enters the box it turns into a race car which is something that squidward would imagine when he got into the box the first time so he got into so basically um You know, that was when, um, you know, Stu threw away the box outside and we have um, Chaz using the box so that he can be able to put some stuff in so he can return it to Betty and Howard. Chucky gets into the box and he imagines himself in a spaceship and he imagines himself with aliens and he's a space invade, you know, he... He sees a space alien about to eat him, and he is shaken out of the box when Chaz decides to put in the sports equipment that belonged to Betty. And then we have Betty's perspective, and then we have um, them going over to Betty's house, and Phil and Lil see the box, and it's opened in two, and it's split in half. So we have Phil imagining that it's a house, with Lil imagining it's a cave, which would actually be interest, which is actually interesting because for Phil and Lil, it should be the other way around, but. It's actually nice to see that, you know, Phil is more into a neat house while Lil is into a smelly cave with a bear in it. So I thought that that was actually a pretty nice reversal. Yeah, it was like a, it was like a, it was like a deconstruction. Yeah, it was definitely a deconstruction. And so then the box is taken away and then eventually Stu finds it, you know, outside and he decides to bring it back in because he thought that maybe there would have been a missing piece or there would have been some instructions that he wasn't able to find. But no, it's not the case. And so then the car- then we have Tommy, Chucky, Phil and Lil seeing the box and saying, like, it's my spaceship. No, it's my race car. No, it's my house. No, it's my cave. And then Angelica says, it just looks like a stupid box to me. And so then we have Angelica picking up the box and just putting it into the air and the baby's grabbing it and it just shreds into pieces, but they still have fun with it. They were able to take something that was a disaster and make it into something entertaining. So we have Phil and Lil playing with swords and we have Chucky, um, you know, imagining that there were butterfly wings and we have uh, Tommy imagining that it was a mask and Angelica just doesn't get it. She takes the pieces and just stomps it saying that it was a stupid box, which means that... Angelica clearly has no imagination whatsoever. 
I think she is pretty much a Squidward of uh, Rugrats. Yeah, so she is the Squidward of this episode, in which she doesn't believe that a box can be able to bring in so much imagination towards these babies. She just sees it as just a piece of junk. So... Sue and Dee Dee are actually looking outside and they notice that the babies are having more fun with the box than with the kitty carnival that he's trying to put together. So he decides to just scrap the whole thing and his new invention for Pickles Toys is a bunch of boxes. You know, kids are able to have more fun with playing with boxes as opposed to playing with something like a toy, um, as opposed to like a toy carnival set that is a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated. And Angelica just clearly doesn't understand why the babies are having fun with the boxes. So yeah, overall, I do enjoy this episode. I, I think that it would be, I mean, it's essentially the catalyst of a lot of episodes that would come in the future. And it shows off more of the baby's imaginations, which we'll be getting a little bit more of in this season as opposed to the last season. All right, so let's go over to our next episode, and it's uh, episode 32A. It's called Down the Drain. It was written by Joe and Selbeher, and it was released on February 7th, 1993. Tommy and Chucky are afraid of being sucked down the drain, so they clog it in various ways to avoid having to take a bath. Now, it does come into a very common fear for a lot of uh, children that you have a drain and people are afraid of being sucked down on it. And I remember that there was a commercial in the 80s for Nickelodeon about some guy who actually is um, pulling the drain from the ocean and all of the water and the fish go under, including himself with the Nickelodeon logo popping up. So I guess that something like this common fear would be showcase something uh, would be a showcase in Rugrats. I agree, and it really plays off for that situation perfectly. Like it really takes you into the world of a baby and what they fear and what they think is terrifying. Yeah, so the episode starts off with Tommy in the bath by himself, which at his age, he shouldn't even be there alone. But Dee Dee is on the phone and she's talking and he's playing with his um, his little toy soldier and the toy soldier gets sucked down the drain and he is afraid that he might go down there. And so he has a fear of going into the bathtub. And so Chucky comes along is and he's actually the one who's telling Tommy that you don't need to be afraid of going down the drain. And he says that he was able to find this out because he was shown the light. And it turns out to be a song called, you know, you can't get sucked down the drain. And then Angelica comes along and says that, of course you can. And she tells this story about some kid who actually did get sucked down the drain. And Tommy and Chucky are fearful of being sucked down the drain all over again. So then they decide to come up with the idea of clogging the drain up. They use sand, they use clay, they um, they use um, oh, they basically just hide away from Chaz when they are being called in to take a bath. And the plumber comes in multiple times to fix the problem, and uh, he is more than excited to because he gets paid every time that he's fixing up uh, the bathtub. And so then we have the third time where the plumber comes in and he's retrieving Cynthia from the from the drain when she was accidentally flushed down the toilet. And then Angelica gets another great shot in Freud a moment where she is actually scared of going into the bathtub herself because she saw firsthand that Cynthia was able to go down the toilet drain and she confer and she says, It's true, you can get sucked down the drain. And so now Tommy and Chucky are more terrified than ever. And they have to go into the bathtub, and eventually Tommy's like, I need to conquer my fear, I need to find out once and for all if you can get that sucked down the drain or not. And you can't, and they were able to conquer their fears, and everything goes really well for them. And so I have to say that this episode is very cute. It's very nice to see a common, uh, it's nice to see a, a fear such as going down the drain being played off in, a, in an episode of Rugrats, especially since it does make a lot of sense if you were a young baby and experiencing something along the lines of being sucked down a drain. It does seem like it's a pretty scary notion, so... Yeah, I do have to say that this episode is pretty good. I agree. It actually does play off with the fears of going down the drain really well because a lot of people, when they were babies, and even young kids, still have that fear of being sat down the drain whenever the plugs pulled from the bath. Yeah, for sure. 
All right, let's go over to episode 19B, which is called Let Them Eat Cake, and it was written by Steve Vixen. The gang attends a relative's wedding where Tommy and Chucky see cake. So we've, we we now get introduced to Dee Dee's brother um, named Ben, and according to what Drew says, that is Dee Dee's half-brother. So Fun I'm, fact. Yeah, go ahead. He's voiced by Johnny Bravo himself. Yes, that, that it, it, yeah, you're right. It is true. He is voiced by the voice actor behind Johnny Bravo, Jet Bennett. And this was one of his very first roles because this was when he was starting to get like really popular as a voice actor throughout the 90s. And he would be in and so here's another And here's another fact. He also plays Dexter's dad from Dexter's Laboratory. So he and Christine Kavanaugh, uh, how do you say her name? Yeah, that's right. Christine Kavanaugh, that's right. So basically they've crossed press past here before years before Dexter's laboratory no I mean before Dexter's laboratory. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's true. So anyway, so Drew mentions that um, Ben is Dee Dee's half brother, which I'm actually curious to know if um, you know whose parent is Ben from. Is he from Boris or Minka? And looking at the resemblance, he kind of looks like he would be either either or. I can't really tell. Me neither. It's a surprise. It's a mystery that I think the rise keep us guessing. Yeah, I- I- exactly. So Ben would actually be a very, very minor character. This episode and an episode that later down in the line are the only ones who is where he's ever seen. And it's a shame, too, because he's going through a situation that is pretty relatable. He's going through wedding jitters. He's afraid of commitment, and he's afraid of getting married to the love of his life, Elaine, even though that he loves her so much. And then we have, you know, the subplot with Tommy and Chucky, and they hear about that there's going to be a giant cake at the wedding, and that's what they want to go after. But I am much more invested on the adult's perspective, having been so preoccupied, having been so paranoid of the wedding, and Elaine eventually just gets cold feet and she doesn't show up whatsoever. So I, I'm really invested, although there are some really funny moments with the, the babies and the adults. The, the, probably my favorite moment that I just crack up every time is when Tommy and Chucky end up in the Jewish wedding and they're seeing the, the bride and the groom being lifted up in the chairs like you tr- like it's traditionally done. And Tommy and Chucky are just like wondering what is going on. They're acting crazy. And then that's one that's always been my favorite part of the show, right? Because they wouldn't understand why people were doing certain things in the situation and uh, it just makes it all the more humorous. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the next scene that follows that is when Stu and Dee Dee are looking for Tommy and Chucky and they end up in another wedding where the bride throws the bouquet and Stu actually catches it while Dee Dee throws it away saying that he's already married. But, yeah, basically, um, we have, uh, you know, Angelica, who's the little flower girl, and she's looking all cute and throwing flowers everywhere, and, and Charlotte looking all proud and such. And then we have, um, you know, Tommy and Chucky, they see the cake over and over again throughout the course of the episode, and eventually they, they are in the cart where the cake is, and then it just, like, zooms away. And then they find Elaine. This, oh, go ahead. This is actually the first episode with the with the word cake in it. There's another episode down the line with the word cake in its title. Yeah, we'll be discussing about that later on. But I think that um, the fact that we have Tommy and Chucky finding Elaine and she talks about how she feels scared and that she's wondering if Ben ever felt scared, if he ever had any doubts about the wedding. And then when Ben does find her, they confront each other and they say that they're afraid, but at the same time, they really do love each other. And then the episode just ends off with the wedding going nicely, the reception parties going on and Tommy and Chucky are eating the cake. And I have to say that this is one of my favorite episodes in in season two because it tackles in a great problem that adults go through, you know, wedding commitments. I think that a lot of people, if they're in love with a person, they do have wedding jitters and, you know, the term runaway bride is a thing in which they just so, they're afraid of commitment, they're afraid that maybe something will go wrong with their relationship, they don't want to be able to you know, dedicate that much time to it. And I think that that is a pretty normal fear, especially if you're an adult. I agree. It is really relatable and it touches upon a situation that adults really do face. Like some adults do fear commitment and 
do worry that getting married could have disastrous consequences. Yeah. Why? Why? And either that or they get nervous and don't know whether or not they're going to say the vows in a meaningful way. Yeah, that's true. All right, let's go over to our next episode, which is called episode, uh, which is twenty A. It's called the Seven Voyages of Cynthia. Uh, it debuted on March fourteenth, nineteen ninety three, and it was written by Craig Bartlett. Believe it or not, this will be the very last episode that Craig Bartlett would write for, because afterwards he would be working on the pilot for Hey Arnold. So in this episode, Tommy and Chucky accidentally lose Angelica's favorite doll, Cynthia, while Stu and Drew wash Drew's boat. While Angelica holds a funeral for Cynthia, Spike manages to find the doll. Now we have another episode that was referenced in Rugrats Search for Reptar, and this is an episode that um, would make a lot of sense for Craig to write because, as mentioned in the Graham Canyon episode, he was the one who created Cynthia. That would explain why Cynthia looks a little bit like Helga, like, resembles her a lot. Yeah, for sure. So Just he- in classic YouTube art style. Yeah. And Craig's own. Exactly, yeah. So the episode basically starts off with Tommy and Chucky, and they see they see Stu and Drew washing the boat, and then they decide that they want to make their own boat. And so they decided to make a boat, and they needed a captain. So they decide to borrow Cynthia as their captain, and taking a page something similar to you know it they basically sail the boat and it lands all the way down into the sewers now unlike in it in which we have um pennywise you know asking them if they want to see a balloon and if balloons float the we get to see the process of cynthia getting filthier and filthier as she goes deeper down in the sewers for you younger viewers the 2017 movie it is actually a remake it was actually spawned off of Stephen King's famous novel, but it was originally adapted as a TV mini movie back in 1990, a whole year before Rugrats would ever premiere. Right, right. And it has Tim Curry as Pennywise, and we've gone full circle because Tim Curry would pretty much be in almost every Klasky Chupo property. I think the only exception would be as told by Ginger and Rocket Power. I don't think he was ever in an episode of Rocket Power. I don't think so either. He was in Our Real Monsters, I know that. Yeah, he was in Our Real Monsters. He was the Stitch. uh, No, the Snitch, I meant to say. He was the Snitch's assistant. And also, he uh, was Nigel Thornberry in uh, The Wild Thornberries. And he was Rex Pester in the Rugrats movie. So, yeah, we got full circle with Tim Curry. He really cut his teeth with Koski Chupo. Yeah, he did. Well, Well, he already did with Rocky Horror Picture Show, but even further with KC. Yeah, I'm actually curious about his relationship with Klasky Chupo during the 90s. Maybe when, you know, he's well enough that he can be able to do proper interviews again, because we know he suffered from his stroke a few years ago. I'm actually friends with him on Facebook. Oh, nice. Maybe you can ask him. Probably. That'd be great. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, continuing on. So, um, so basically, Tommy and Chucky are afraid to ask uh, to tell Angelica that they lost Cynthia, and because that she couldn't find Cynthia, she assumes that Cynthia is dead, and so they decide to throw a funeral for Cynthia. And Tommy and Chucky then slowly confess that they were the ones who lost Cynthia. And then throughout the entire episode, we have Spike trying to find Cynthia, and he, you know, goes out of his way to even go into the sewers and even to the dump. That way he can be able to retrieve Cynthia. And you know what? That's good for him, you know? Um, because we've seen Spike being treated horribly by Angelica and Fluffy. So he probably shouldn't even deserve it. But I guess because of Tommy being petrified of what Angelica would do to him, he decided that he wanted to be a loyal dog and find Cynthia before Tommy got into I think serious maybe, trouble. I think maybe deep down, as Angelica does deeply care for Spike, despite insisting otherwise. I mean, like, she pretends to kind of hate him and be grossed out by him. She really likes him. I think that's vice versa with Spike. It could be a possibility, you're right. And we do see kind of a, you know, and we see more of that relationship in the Rugrats movie. So I I guess you could say that you're absolutely right. 
So, yeah, basically, uh, Angelica, you know, gets Spike, uh, you know, Angelica gets uh, Cynthia back from Spike, and she's completely filthy, and then Tommy and Chucky are relieved that they were able to not be pummeled by Angelica, and, you know, Tommy gives Spike a major thanks, and that's when Stu and Drew decide to bathe Spike because he smells horribly like the sewers and the dump, which is, you know, giving me the flashback of the dog broomer all over again. So... Overall, I do have to say that this is a very well done episode by Craig Bartlett. Uh, for him, for this being his last episode that he ever wrote, it's actually he really went on. He really went off on a high. Yeah, it, absolutely. He really went off of a high right before he decided to dedicate all of his work to Hey Arnold. All right, so let's go over to the next episode, episode twenty B. It's called My Friend Barney, and it was written by Peter Gaffney and Paul Germain. In this episode, Chucky has an imaginary friend named Barney, and yeah, I think that um, at some point everybody has an imaginary friend. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, created by Craig McCracken, was able to showcase about how personal and how customizable imaginary friends could be. And Chucky like really thinks that Barney is real, and I would. Be surprised if they base off of Barney out of Barney the Dinosaur. That's what I thought when I first saw the episode. I think that because Barney was such a very popular, you know, TV show for it, children, then maybe that, that, that they decided to use that name. It came out in 1992, and this episode premiered in 1993, so I think that this was when Barney and Friends was starting to catch on. Exactly. So that was when, you know, it was starting to really catch on. So basically, um, you know, because of Barney, Chucky's personality is turns into a huge 180. We have uh, Chucky becoming incredibly fearless and coming up with some really crazy ideas that Chucky wouldn't ordinarily think of. And that just goes to, I mean, that is a kind of an interesting thing about how, you know, imaginary friends are the complete opposite of who we are. Uh, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the of a Powerpuff Girls episode in which, you know, a kid who has an imaginary friend and he makes him do awful things, and then eventually the imaginary friend turns out to be real. Another connection, because E.G. Daily is also, and that's also another series that E.G. Daily is well known for and famous for. Yeah, that's true as well. And so, basically, um, Chucky is bringing out some really fun games for everybody to play that ordinarily he wouldn't think of because Chucky is always the kind of baby who would like to play quiet games and maybe just, like, behave in front of the grown-ups. But no, here we have them playing basketball and what's under the rug and stuff like that. And then eventually, um, th they start liking Barney even more than Chucky. And Chucky tries to make up excuses saying, like, oh, Barney's tired, Barney doesn't want to be bothered, or Barney needs to take a nap or something like that. Or Barney went to prison. <laughs> right, exactly. And so then they decided that they were going to have this... Um, then they decided that they were going to put Barney back into the moon because apparently that's where he's from. And, uh, you know, basically Chucky says that you can't do that because, you know, since he made up the character, you can't just take him back to where he was before. I guess that kind of makes sense if you have an imaginary friend. But uh, I think that when you grow out of it, it kind of like is indebted to your mind, like a portion of it, kind of like an inside out. So, yeah, it's very complicated to think about. But... Then he always, uh, then eventually Chucky um, basically told um, everybody saying that Barney isn't real, that he just completely made him up. And everybody was shocked by it. But in the, but at the end of the episode, Chucky men uh, apologizes for him to, to Barney saying that he had to apologize for saying that he was a lie because he wanted to protect him from his friends. So... Yeah, I guess that at that point of the episode, you know, Chucky decided to have Barney as his own personal friend as opposed to introducing him to his other real friends. I guess I could understand that because Barney's like a personal thing and he didn't really want the babies to find it. He, he, he regretted letting the babies find out in the end. Yeah. And there's not really much to the adults' perspective. It's just, um, you know, Dee Dee and Betty going through uh, training for a 10K marathon. And also... Um, you know, uh, that's, I mean, there's not really much to it. So overall, it is a pretty interesting premise to have an imaginary friend play off in Rugrats. Uh, I, but, you know, I guess they wanted to do it in a more realistic manner in which you actually don't get to see it. But um, it would have been interesting to, if we would have had like an imagination kind of moment in which we actually get to see what the friend looks like. But I guess they decided to play it more realistically, which is fine. I agree. Well, 
Rugrats is a show that dives into realism after all. True. All right, let's go over to our next episode. It's called, uh, we have episode 21A, and it was called Feeding Hubert. It was written by Jeffrey Townsend, and it premiered on March 21st, 1993. The babies mistake a garbage truck for a monster that eats trash. So, yeah, so basically uh, it starts off with Tommy waking up really early in the morning and seeing the garbage truck coming on by collecting the trash, and he hears the name Hubert. Now, we can assume that Hubert is the name of the driver of the garbage truck, but Tommy assumes that it's an actual monster named Hubert. And he tells his, he tells Ta- uh, Chucky, Phil, and Lil about it, and they uh, they've heard about the you know about Hubert as well. And then we have a side plot with Stu and Dee Dee who have to make sure that you know their garage is clean from the recyclables and their garbage because a news report is going to be coming over where Dee Dee has this. Um, reputation of being an incredible neat freak who constantly recycles and who wants to take care of the environment and the community. So it becomes a bit of a situation for Tommy because he hears that they're not going to be taking out any garbage for Hubert because they think that, oh, if you don't take out garbage for Hubert, then Hubert's going to be angry. And so they decide to like gather up all the stuff in the house and throw out everything so that they can be able to accommodate more trash. And Stu constantly forgets about taking the stuff to the recycling bin and the trash just piles up and it becomes even worse. I really like that this episode dealt with the fact that babies and young kids really view uh, garbage trucks as monsters because believe it or not, I think I did as a kid and I think so many other kids did as well. Yeah, I think so too. I think that um, when you, especially if you're a baby and you don't get up that early in the morning and you see something that you're not familiar with, because depending on where you live, the garbage uh, truck can either come really early or really late at night. And so seeing that coming in, I'm sure that would bring a lot of questions for somebody who's really young. And... Then we have the, 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 the ending in which when they decide to open up the garage because they see Hubert out, uh, because they want to make sure that Hubert gets his food. And so all of the trash comes sliding down like if it was an avalanche. And the news reporter is completely shocked where she basically concludes the interview with Stu and Dee, Dee who are just, you know, trash collectors. And, you know, their, their house was filled to the brim with garbage now gave the inspiration for these um, new garbage trucks that collect only recyclables. And the babies are excited because they think it's baby Hubers that are coming on by. So, yeah, uh, Huber would only be mentioned a number, uh, what, like maybe like one more time in a later episode down this down, down the line, but yeah. the I think it's one of those things that uh, only really appears in one episode and doesn't really get much of a mention anymore. Yeah, you're right. It does get mentioned one more time in a later episode down the line, but other than that, that's pretty much it. Uh, So overall, this episode is pretty decent. It's nice to see Stu and Dee Dee trying to, you know, give awareness to recycling, even though that they don't do a really good job at it. And it's nice to see another perspective from the babies that you know, only would come from their mind. So I thought this episode was pretty good. Me too. I thought that it was definitely one of the strongest episodes of the second season. And I could easily put this on my top favorite list of Rugrats episodes as it at all instead of just the season. All right. Uh, okay, now now we go over to our next episode. Episode uh, We have episode uh, 34B, which is called uh, Spike the Wonder Dog, and it was written by Steve Vixton. Uh, after watching a TV show about a superhero named Oodles the Talking Poodle, the babies wish Spike can talk and be a superhero as well, and they get their wish when Angelica fools them with her toy ex- executive phone into thinking Spike can really talk so that she can make them steal cookies for her. But in the end, it is Spike who truly saves the day so we have the babies watching a tv show which is kind of akin to like uh it's like lassie mixed with crypto the super dog which is called oodles the talking poodle and we have you know spike uh just laying there and tommy is thinking maybe spike can talk so we have another episode in which you know oh it's, it could be a possibility that a character could be a superhero it's very similar to superhero chucky Except that I think that Superhero Chucky does it a little bit better than this episode. I thought th- this episode was amusing because of because of all the tricks Angelica would play 
on the babies while pretending to be Spike through the through Cynthia walkie talkie. Yes, it is true that uh, Angelica is a lot more clever and tricky in this episode as opposed to just being out downright mean to Chucky. I actually kind of do really like this episode, but that's just me. That's fine, that's fine. Well, why don't you explain why? Because it's Angelica is our most, de- uh, is most devious and... I said devious, not devious, by the way, and... Intelligent and clever and uh, all the shenanigans she puts the babies through are just stuff to remember by for years. I mean, I always laugh so much whenever I watch this episode and it gets old for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Angelica decides to put her executive phone into a bow that she ties into Spike's collar. And she basically just talks to... She uses the phone so she can talk out loud to the babies, and the babies think that Spike is talking. Which, they should be questioning on, where did the bow come from, and why isn't Spike's mouth moving? But I guess since they are babies, I guess they didn't really, like, you know, put two and two together like that. So they basically get the cookies for, um, for Spike... And leave it outside, even though that Spike is not outside, and they hear eating. And so they find Angelica's executive phone, and then they capture Angelica eating the cookies. Spike then realizes what's going on, and so he um, goes over to Stu and Dee Dee and barks at them, uh, asking to follow him, which is definitely very akin to Lassie. I was expecting, you know, Stu to say, like, what is this, Spike? Tommy fell down a well? But, no, of course not. But God, uh, 1950s entertainment. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So then we have uh, Stu and Dee Dee finding out that Angelica ate all the cookies, and so they drag her into the house. And then we have Tommy saying he may not, you know, be a talking wonder dog, but he is a wonder dog nonetheless, which is very nice. So, yeah, we've had a few Spike-centric episodes throughout this particular season alone. We've had... Um, the dog broomer we've had um the seven voyages of cynthia and uh no bones about it so yeah it does seem like they're focusing a little bit more on spike uh they do give uh, a bit more episodes on spike in this season as opposed to the last season where they do give him episodes like the monster in the closet or um fluffy versus spike and he also does play a rescuing role in the barbecue story so i guess they decided that because uh you know they wanted to flesh out more of their characters and wanted to give more variety into the stories they decided to have a few more spike centric episodes I think that really worked to their advantage. Yeah, for sure. So, overall, um, I personally think that the episode is just okay. I think that when it comes to, like, Spike-centric episodes, I think that The Seven Voyages of Cynthia shows him it is absolute, as as is his most heroic. And also, I think that when it comes to, like, superheroes, I think that superhero Chucky plays it a little bit better. But that's just me. Yeah, that that's, yeah. Um, you're entitled to your opinion i did love this episode it's actually one of my favorites if not my favorite entire series <sighs> but i could just be saying that because i'm an angelica fan that's fine all right let's go over to our next episode we have episode 35a which is called the slide and it was written by joe and celibate hair and it premiered on march 28 1993 oh this episode i definitely relate to Oh, this episode is fantastic, absolutely. It's definitely one of the best Chucky episodes throughout the early season. Uh, Chucky is afraid to go down the playground slide after accidentally using a giant slide at a pizza place. After Angelica intimidates him, the babies consult Susie, so she trains Chucky to be the bestest slider in the whole wide park. Now, this is Susie at her absolute core, being the anti-Angelica, because the last episode that we saw Susie in, she was constantly crying because she couldn't find her room. So now we see Susie being incredibly confident, incredibly kind, as well as standing up to Angelica and saying of how absolutely wrong she is that chucky cannot conquer his fears so i think this is the episode where her character is really 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 cemented yes so yeah we have chucky who is trying to go up into the slide but he is constantly scared and he tells the story on why because he used to love going on the slide that was like his favorite thing to do in the park 
And then he explains about how he was, he and his dad went over to some, like, pizza place, similar to, like, Chuck E. Cheese. And he would, he went over to the big kid slide by mistake. And he looked down and he saw that he was there and he con, and he was just, didn't want to go down and he was crying. And when you see the kind of slide that Chucky actually climbed up to, it is terrifying. It looks like it's, like, all the way up ab- above the ceiling and it has, like, loop de loops akin to a roller coaster. I don't blame Chucky for being afraid of going down that slide. I mean, yeah. I mean, to be, tell you the truth, I've had a similar experience. Back when I went to a farm when I was a kid, there was a slide there, and I tried getting on it, and it was a long line. I mean, like, it was a very, very crowded slide where everybody was on top of each other, and I tried to go down it, and then somebody, and then somebody offered to get on top of me, and I was really scared that I was really scared that I was gonna die and I was gonna stay there forever so I started so I started crying and this was when I was a kid as well Mm. did you ever conquer your fear of going back to that slide again I don't think I ever went back on that slide oh I see So yeah, we have um, Angelica calling Chucky a scaredy cat, and we have Angelica, and you know, Chucky believes that Angelica's telling the truth because we've seen Chucky being a constant scaredy cat throughout the entire, uh, throughout the entire series at this point. And then we have, um, you know, Susie saying, oh, you don't believe what they say. You're not a scaredy cat. You're a big, you're a big, brave dog. And then he starts, you know, saying it over and over again, saying, I'm a big, brave dog. I'm a big, brave dog. I'm a big, brave dog. And then finally we have the moment in which when he's going over to the slide and he starts slowly conquering his fear and then we have the confrontation between Angelica and Susie, which would play off in an episode that we'll be talking about a little later, where, you know, Chucky is deciding on which one does he feel like he is. Is he a, is he going to conquer his fear of going down the slide or he's not? And then when Angelica and Susie are arguing about whether he is a scaredy cat or a big brave dog... Chucky yells out, no, I am not an animal, I am a human being, which is actually a reference to John Merrick, Uh, that was the line that he said in the movie The Elephant Man. And that's when Chucky decided that he was going to... The reference writers know that movies. Well, I mean, we've mentioned it many times before, I mean, we've seen many references to movies and TV shows from westerns to Doctor Who, so the Rugrats writers clearly know their pop culture. Yep, and as you get older, you understand them a lot more. Yeah, for sure. And then we have... Um, so then we have the next day, and Chucky decides that he is going to conquer his fear and climb up the slide. And then finally, he slides down, and he claims that he had a great time going down the slide. And I even like the fact that Angelica was able to bet to Susie about if Chucky chickens out, that she'll win, like, two ice cream popsicles. And... Um, finally, when Chucky does go down the slide, Susie takes them instead, which I thought was actually pretty funny. And then we have the babies cheering on for Chucky, and they decide to go down the slide as well. So this is definitely one of the best episodes in season two, and actually a really great Chucky-centric episode, conquering his fear of something that is genuinely scary for a, a young toddler like him. I agree. I mean, it did help me be a little more brave because I could understand the situation that Chucky went through, considering I went through it myself. And I think now if I went back on the slide, well, it would be too late because I'm 23, nearly 24. But I guess if I was a little bit older than I was when I initially went down the slide, I guess I'd counter my fears due to this episode. This was apparently based on uh, John Zilber's, his daughter's fear of going down the slide. He wrote for her, apparently. I'm not too surprised because if we, if we recall that Tommy was based off of Paul Germain's son, then yeah, I wouldn't be surprised that the fact that this conflicting this conflicting uh, st- it, not I mean like stories in the press right basically the same that uh, that he was named after Paul's son, but it was what was based on Arlene's son, whereas Paul clarified that it was actually both him, it, both based on his son and named after his son. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I know that Arlene says many times that, oh, it was based off of my son, but knowing Arlene and her, you know, claims for things, I mean, it's not too surprising how sometimes she can, like, 
change her mind off of you know something that she hated saying that she liked it as well as saying that she you know came up with the idea for something when she didn't so it's not too surprising all right all right so let's go over to our next episode we have episode 35b which is called the big flush it was written by lisa latham the baby's mistake of swimming pool for a giant potty and set out to find the flusher meanwhile Stu is struggling to overcome his fear of diving so we have two characters in this episode overcoming a fear chucky overcoming his fear of going down the slide and Stu overcoming his fear of diving in a huge diving board so we have the babies they're going to the swimming pool for the very first time and they think that the swimming pool is a giant potty which you know considering that sometimes people actually use number one down there it kind of is sort of <laughs> yeah they have that right yeah I, I mean i have no idea what is up with the, the the swimming teacher when she says that the you know that the babies have to in order for the babies to learn how to swim they have to be the water and they're constantly like dipping the children in the water over and over again it's like geez that is that looks incredibly dangerous so throughout the adult plot we have Stu constantly trying to learn how to do some diving at the small diving board and he's not doing a very good job at it and we have Chaz and Howard talking about like you know don't go near the giant diving board because you'll be stuck up there like last time and Stu wants to prove them wrong until eventually he does climb up there and he sees um the, the the pool and he gets frightened by it and then the lifeguard has to come up into saving him and he's just panicking which i can definitely relate to because i do have a slight fear of heights me too i'm almost 24 and i still get afraid of heights i mean like i'm barely afraid of anything and heights are one of the few things i'm actually kind of terrified of especially they're really high yeah I took a swimming class last semester for school, and for our last exam, we had to jump off a diving board. And Whoa. yeah, exactly. So we have to drop. We have to jump. Well, I mean, I'll just let you know that it's nowhere near as high as the diving board that Stu had to jump on. But we still had to jump on it so we can be able to get some high points for our grade. And. Um, I had to practice it a couple of times in order for me to conquer my fear from it. And one of the tricks that I learned when I was going up there was like, don't look down, look straight ahead. If you look straight ahead and you just step away, uh, if you just like step towards the edge of it and you just fall down, then you can be able to just go through the pool pretty quickly. And, you know, just like fall down and then just swim yourself back up. So, yeah, if you are afraid of heights and if you're ever thinking about going to the diving board... First off, don't look down, just look straight ahead and just step a little bit towards the edge off of the pool and then either just jump off or just walk out of it and then just fall down naturally. And if you're worried about sinking, then I would suggest that you do, you know, practice on a smaller diving board or even wear a life jacket and then just jump off of it. I use that for practice when we were learning how to, you know, uh, you know, do the techniques for doing the diving in the diving board. Anyway, so continuing on. So when Those screams are hilarious, though you have to admit that Jack Riley Spice acting here is phenomenal and believable. Like he really hits high notes um, when he screams. Because if you do it, I might, I might just jump. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jack Riley does a phenomenal job in this episode when he has to, you know, play off as being frightened while into the while in the diving board, and then he sees Tommy Chucky feeling a little in the small diving board because they think that the diving board is actually um, the trigger to pull down to flush the toilet, and so they jump up and down, and then he has to jump down so that he can be able to save them, and just in time too because the moment that uh, Tommy jumps slightly off. He starts falling off of the board and Stu grabs him right before he fell down into the pool. And there's also a side plot in which when uh, Dee Dee and Betty go over to the steam room and they get themselves trapped because um, I believe it was Phil or Lil who pull on the, the, the bar to make it extra hot and then it just seals the door. So throughout this entire episode, they're like stuck in there, completely hot. So I thought that that was pretty funny. And then it just concludes. Especially the reaction at the end. 
Yeah, they, they they turn out to come out as you know red as a beet. All right, so then uh, so overall, I do have to say that this episode is uh, another relatable one because it does conquer a fear, but this time it's the fear from the adults where uh, Tom, you know, where where Chucky had to go conquer the slide. We had Stu trying to conquer the. Um, the the diving board. So I do enjoy this episode a lot. All right, so let's go Me over. Too. To- I think it's a classic. Yeah. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. It's uh, 36A called King Tenpin. It was written by Doria Biddle, and it premiered on April 4th, 1993. Grandpa competes in a bowling tournament where Tommy and the others inadvertently help Grandpa win by exposing his bowling rival as a cheater. And the bowling rival is played by Tom Bosley. Some of you guys know Tom Bosley for a bunch of roles. Uh, He was in Happy Days. He was in uh, Murder, She Wrote. But some of you guys, uh, for Nickelodeon, and he was known as the voice of David in David the Gnome. So, yeah, he already has Nickelodeon roots. He does, yes. Uh, right, so let's get... So, basically, it starts off with um, Grandpa Lou getting himself ready to go to a bowling tournament. And... He is very nervous about it because it reminded him of um, a bowling tournament that he was a part of many years ago where he never actually completes the story because he's constantly being interrupted. And so they're wondering about, you know, what is bowling and what is going on with Grandpa. And then Angelica explains that um, Grandpa Lou is going to play um, a bowling game, which is involves with a giant ball where you not, knock down milk bottles so you can win the championship, which is the biggest chocolate chip in the world. And the babies... Oh, God, that makes me hungry. Yeah, I want <laughs> I want some chocolate too. So yeah, basically that you know they want to help um, they want to help find the chocolate chip so that they can be able to give it to Grandpa. And then we have the scene in which when they're taken over to the little daycare area by the bowling alley, and they're being zombified by watching the Dummy Bears VHS. And it definitely just goes to show you about how the Rugrats writers felt about you know certain television shows about how they're just basically draining your kids out of any knowledge of any um, cognitive thought. And it's just like, you know, enjoy it for the entertainment and don't even worry about thinking at all. So it's definitely like a social commentary on that. I concur with you on a social commentary on what? Yeah. So we have... Um, no, I mean, social commentary on what? Yeah, yeah. That was really spot because the whole reason Rugrats was created in the first place was like an antithesis to kids programming in the 1980s about how saccharine and kiddish they were and condescending. Exactly, for sure. And so then we meet up with uh, the rival uh, that, um, you know, Grandpa Lou is fighting against, and they seem to be neck and neck at first. And then eventually we have him being incredibly nervous that he's losing, and so he decides to cheat. He calls somebody who's actually behind the bowling pins, and he's setting up these um, hollow... uh, He set up these, like, weighted bowling pins so that if you try to knock them down with a bowling ball, it won't go down very easily. And so he uses that so that he could be able to have Grandpa lose lose some points, and he can be able to gain some more points with his strikes. And so then, um, eventually, we have, you know, Tommy Chucky feeling a little going back there so that they can be able to find the chocolate chip, and they seem to find the guy and thinking that he's a monster. And the reason why they think that is because while they were slow, while they were just about to give up, they actually um, go into an arcade game talking about like, are you ready to fight against the cha- the the champion? Are you ready to find the championship? And then they were like, oh yeah, we need to find the chip. And they were like, how do we do that? It's like, you have to fight the monster. And so they think that the monster is right behind where the bowling pins are. And so they actually do um, scare it enough so that they can be, he can be able to go down. And he is caught for being a cheater. And so eventually Grandpa Lou does win. And he is able to uh, you know, bring in the trophy. And the prize was a chocolate chip cake. That, that the babies are enjoying eating, which I'm I'm kind of sad that Angelica didn't get to enjoy it because she was still zombified with the Dummy Bears VHS tape. It just goes to show that even though that Angelica is smart for her age, all in all, she is still a toddler and she still has weaknesses. Yeah, exactly. 
So overall, this episode is pretty nice. We get to see, we get to have a really nice grandpa centric episode where um, it involves with bowling, and there'll be a lot of Nick tunes that will be focusing on bowling. We've had an episode with uh, there's there will be a Doug episode about bowling. The Angry Beavers had one about bowling. Rocco's Modern Life. So this wouldn't be this would be an episode that they, that would be played off uh, multiple times throughout Nickelodeon shows, and uh, yeah, it, it's nice to see you know that you know Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil are able to try to look for the the championship and we have angelica zombified with the dummy bears vhs tape so overall i did enjoy this one me too it was really entertaining and definitely ranks up with season two's finest yeah all right so now we go over to our next episode episode 36b runaway angelica written by steve vixton angelica runs away from home and hides in the pickles backyard after being sent to her room for ruining her father's office she later realizes her mistake when it starts raining and she has to live in spike's doghouse and thinks her father is happy that she ran away this is definitely one of the more memorable episodes of angelica uh in season two because uh, we have Angelica, who is a nuisance throughout the beginning of the episode because she ruins her de- her father's fax machine and copy machine, making a whole bunch of crazy paper um, figurines and such. And f- her father is, and Drew is furious, by the way. And Angelica does doesn't like really, you know, care to apologize or really mean the fact that. I, mean, I, I think that Angelica just, you know, I'm sure that Angelica sees her father, Drew, angry so many times that she decides that she's going to play it off sweetly and she's going to say that she's, you know, she promises that she'll never do it again. But she's not being sincere of it at all because she thinks that she can be able to get away with it. But she's actually grounded and sent to her room and she is pissed off by it. Angelica definitely uh, one of the most angriest. You, you definitely don't want to take her off. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, then we have when Drew approaches Charlotte discussing about what happened with Angelica, and I do like the fact that um, you know Charlotte was able to bring about the fact that Angelica needs to be her own independent woman in this day and age. She needs to eat, br- uh, eat, live, and breathe self esteem, which is definitely very um, akin to how women were in the '90s, in which they needed to build up their independence. Because during the '70s, that was when women were starting to get more jobs. That was when they were starting to be less house- here's something that's really notable mm-hmm. that's been revived this decade it's like uh, it it's like i think it's well it's not one of the things that has come back in style but it does remind me of the 90s fem- feminist movement but i think now it's even stronger because women are finally getting recognized in society a lot more and being unhelpful and uh in some ways being treated more with respect but i think that there's a lot of ways to go before that really happens in society unfortunately that is true yeah i think it was during a point in which when um it was definitely um you know how in every decade we seem to um take homages from decades that happened like 20 or 30 years ago well it was definitely when the 90s came along it was definitely akin to what was going on throughout the 60s and 70s in which that was when women were starting to get a lot more independent they were they were less home there were less homemakers and more women in the office and that was when we had the yuppie movement of the 1980s in which it was a lot more of people working in um you know offices as opposed to like being at home taking care of the children and cooking and cleaning we've seen this a lot more in uh you know films such as um a working girl and also in you know in, in various other films so nine to five yeah nine to five office right. space office space mm-hmm yeah, so it was definitely that kind of movement at the time. And Charlotte was definitely a, a, an example on that because she was the president of her company and she was also a major executive. She was constantly busy with her work. So, you know, seeing people like her and Betty who were all about like extreme feminist um, power empowerment. So we, we definitely do get to see akin to what was going on at that time. And uh, with, and you know, that was how you know charlotte felt that angelica should be she should be her own independent woman but in this case we have angelica who's uh, acting like a complete brat 
and where she is sent to her room because she was the one who ruined her father's office supplies. And so she decides that she's going to run away from home that way that she can have her parents feel sorry that they basically yelled at her and saying that they you know that they um that she they were wrong for punishing her and this will be played off a uh, multiple times throughout the ep- uh, throughout the series uh, we'll be discussing more about that in season 3 but in the meanwhile so she gets into her fancy car and she drives away and she heads over to the pickles residence and she meets up with Tommy Chucky Phil and Lil and you know asking her t- ask- asking them to bring her food because she wasn't able to pack any she was able to have time to pack up her toys but she didn't have time to pack up snacks logic Anyway, continuing on. So we have Angelica asking the babies to bring her some cookies. And due to the fact that the babies can't reach all the way that high, they decide to give her some doggy treats, which are shaped like cookies. And she is okay with it at first until she realizes what exactly they are. And so she asks them to give them to give her real cookies and some other snack foods. And she's actually pretty nasty about it when she gets it because the, the babies were the ones who got her the food and then she starts eating it and not even giving her one whatsoever. I like how Angelica's uh, New York slash New Jersey accent comes out when she's mad in the sequence. It really does come out. Mm-hmm. It does really showcase more of the, you know, angry personality with her for sure. And so I wasn't, I wasn't saying that everybody from there... It, from there gets angry what I meant to say is like her accent really shows that oh yeah I know what you're saying so uh, so the, all of a sudden it starts raining and the baby starts to go inside with Angelica having to stay outside because she actually ran away from home and so she's inside Spike's dog house and she decides that she's going to kick Spike off and she's going to be able to watch Spike's TV from the inside while she's watching Spike Go- TV <laughs> ah, that's funny. Yes. So she watches Spike's uh, portable television and she's watching Gilligan's Island. But then the power goes off and she is just stuck in the doghouse all by herself. And she watches uh, Stu, Drew, and Dee Dee laughing. And she offhandedly hear- hears a conversation about how, you know, sometimes it's good to, you know, not having to have the worries of children. And she assumes that because she ran away that her father is happy of her not being around. And so she rushes into the house and she starts crying and apologizing for everything that she does and asking her to bring her back. Yeah, I have to admit that that scene's actually pretty emotional and intense. I mean, I actually genuinely felt like crying during that scene. Yeah, definitely. And it does, once again, showcase about how Angelica does have a nice side to her, especially since, um, you know, she is perceived mostly as a very angry and very um, overreacting child. In that sense, she's a lot like me. I mean, like, a lot like how I was as a kid and even still to this day. This is why I identify and relate with her. I mean, identify with her and relate to her more than other characters on the show. I think that's why a lot of people back then really loved Angelica as a character. And even for a while, Angelica was like the fan favorite throughout the series. And she was even voted as like one of the top 50 characters according to TV Guide's most, uh, you know, 50, uh, the top 50 most uh, iconic uh, cartoon characters. And Angelica was r- ranked up there. I don't blame them. I mean, like, she was pretty much a breakout star of the show, even though that Tommy is the main character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll be discussing more about Angelica's popularity when we discuss more about the Rugrats movie. So then we have, um, you know, Drew explaining to Angelica that he didn't even know that she ran away and that no matter what she did, he'll always love her. And so then he, the babies start coming in and asking if and what Angelica was saying was the truth and that he'll that she'll change her ways. And of course, she says, no, I don't think so. Give me a break. Oh, she said, get real. Yeah, get real. And so I think that's basically pretending to the status quo because she's gotta keep her reputation up. Yeah, exactly. And I think that I think for a lot of people, especially when it comes to like modern cartoons, they kind of see this as like extremely stagnated. And in fact, when it comes to like um, you know, returning to the status quo, a lot of people point that out as like a trope of bad writing. But <sighs> Uh, I think that, you know, when you have to consider that at the time, episodes of a TV show or a cartoon were supposed to be very formulaic and as well as also episodic, then something like this was pretty common back then. We didn't have cartoons that had story-driven plots. Avengers time pretty much 
made that a lot more mainstream for a while. I think cartoons are getting a lot more comedic and episodic again these days rather than continuity driven. No, I mean like, well, they are continuity driven, but I mean like like story arc driven, like they were in the early to mid two thousand tens. I think Milo Murphy's Law was like would be like a template, like a prototype for that type of cartoon. So overall, this is definitely one of the more memorable episodes featuring Angelica. You know, I mean, I'm sure at some point, and you know, for a kid, you know, they're treated so badly by their parents that they wish that they could run away. And, you know, showcasing this as a point that, you know, sometimes running away isn't always the answer. We need to accept our punishment and learn our lesson from what our parents give us because they love us and they want us to lead toward the right direction. I very much agree. I mean, like, when I saw this episode as a kid, I could really see a lot myself in Angelica, even though that I don't have the issues with my mom that, I, that Angelica does with her parents or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so let's go over to our next episode, which is episode 37A. It's called Game Show Didi. It was written by Andy Houts and debuted on April 11th, 1993. Now, David Houts was a production assistant on The Simpsons, and he wrote a few episodes of Rugrats, Duckman, Our Real Monsters, and various other shows right before his unfortunate passing in 1997. So, in this episode, Dee Dee appears on a TV game show where it guest stars Alex Trebek and Charles Nelson Riley. So, Dee Dee is uh, watching a game show because she's going to be participating as a contestant. The game show is called Super Stumpers, and it does feature Alex Trebek as our host. And um, we have the contestant, who is this self-proclaimed genius, and he, um, and he, as mentioned before, he is voiced by Charles Nelson Riley. Now, Charles Nelson Riley is a very well-known actor, especially if you grew up with Don Bluth films. He was the voice of Killer from All Dogs Go to Heaven, and um, he was the voice of uh, the little owl from Rockadoodle and the the king from A Troll in Central Park. He he pretty much had like this uh, voice in which it was like portrayed as very cowardly and always like being the pushovers and the assistants to everybody he's with, but. Um, in this episode, he makes he he sounds like the complete opposite. For a th for a minute, I thought he was actually voiced by uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman because Philip Seymour Hoffman, if you ever see him in various movies, he always plays as the intelligent, pompous jerk. I recognized his voice as a kid, and now and as an adult, I learned why I recognize his voice. Yeah, for sure. And for anybody who grew up with Don Bluth films, you would definitely recognize his voice. And so Dee Dee is just blown away by his intelligence because he answers every single question correctly and not and and, and the and the pre and the other contestant next to him can't even answer it whatsoever. It definitely kind of reminds me of um, you know, the 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 previous winner of Jeopardy, James Holmheiser. Um, in which you know he's con he con I think he was the one who beat uh, Ken Jennings' record of winning the most amount of money in Jeopardy. So basically, Dee Dee feels completely defeated, but she dis but she wants to try to win against the guy anyway. And so she's being trained, and Tommy and Phil and Lil are wondering about what she's doing, um, but they don't really truly understand. They think that they're just he's just looking. You know, Tommy thinks that he, that Dee Dee's looking for a bedtime story. And then, um, offhandedly, when he's being put to bed, Dee Dee says that she'll never find her place in the sun. And Tommy thinks that that's what, exactly what Dee Dee is looking for, her place in the sun. So they're at the TV studio, and they're looking for the sun, while Dee Dee is competing against the genius. And at first, the genius is completely, you know, demolishing her. But then slowly she starts gaining her confidence and she starts answering the questions correctly. I thought the the joke about when she answers the first question and she says, what is this? And then um, the host says, that's correct, but you don't have to answer in the form of a question, which is the complete opposite of Jeopardy, in which you get, are given the answer first. And then you have to say the answer in the form of a question, which I thought was actually a pretty funny joke since you know we have alex trebek in, as a guest in this episode i thought the shenanigans that the babies went through in this episode it was kind of like a wreak havoc episode by the first season but i thought like it was a lot more fleshed out it was really funny here because of what because of what they what they would do with several buttons and uh it would make the tvs go 
all crazy. But oh, by the way, did you know that Dee Dee mentions that one of the answers to the questions is Rosemary Clooney? And guess who dated George Clooney for a while? Who? E. G. Daly. Oh, that's a very interesting fact. Yeah, for sure. That was probably like during the like late eighties, early nineties, right? Correct. Hmm. It's actually a pretty... In- yeah, and uh, for those who are wondering, yeah, Rosemary Clooney is uh, George Clooney's aunt. And um, so, yeah, she was also a very well-known actor in her in her time. So, uh, yeah, once again, very similar to Baby Commercial. I definitely relate to the TV studio and uh, when Tommy enters into the technical director's room where you got to see the multiple screens of all the TV shows that are being filmed. And... Uh, the fact that you know he's pushing the buttons and the 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 monitors go incredibly haywire, and then Tommy sees a bright light which he thinks is the sun, and he tries to reach over to it until it was gone. And then we have Phil and Lil, who sees a talking donkey by the name of Wuggles, and it's like, wait a minute, is the donkey actually talking? Because, I mean, I know that we have Oodles the talking poodle, so I take it that in this world... In the Rugrats universe, we have actual talking animals. Because, I I don't, I mean, Ruggles, I mean, is not a guy in a suit, and he's not a cartoon. So, yeah, your question, your guess is as good as mine as how, you know, where Ruggles and Oodles, the talking poodle, fit we into live, this world. Uh, well, it's a world where babies can talk, so basically anything could happen. I guess so, but still, it's just weird. Uh, then we have uh, Tommy, Phil, and Lil just meeting up together, saying that they couldn't find the sun, and Stu and Grandpa Lou, they find them, and they bring him back to where the the game show is being filmed, and uh, they're, and they hope that uh, the, uh, and then they see that Dee Dee actually won the prize, and uh, Stu hopes that um, Dee Dee would pick a, um, a fondue set, uh, a dinette set, and also uh, Grandpa Lou hopes that they'll pick out like some fishing gear or a year supply of stewed prunes. Uh, Stu hopes to get the bug zapper, but instead we have Dee Dee choosing a gold Dalmatian statue, and uh, we have you know Tommy going over to uh, Dee Dee and hugging her, saying that he found that you know she was able to find her place in the sun, and it's kind of ironic because the logo of the game show is actually a giant sun, so that's how Tommy came to the assumption that she was able to find it. And yeah, overall, this episode is really nice. It's, it's actually nice to see a Dee Dee centric episode for once because we haven't really had a lot of those. Well, I mean, I guess with the exception of vi- you know the visit with Doctor Lipschitz, but yeah, it's actually nice to see uh, Dee Dee getting f- focused here. Me too. I mean, like she's really fleshed out as a character, and we see Marta besides being worried about parenting. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we go over to our next episode, which is thirty seven B. It's called Toys in the Attic, and it was written by Carol Mine. Tommy and Angelica are left to stay with Dee Dee's parents for a weekend where they discover toys and some fa- family history with their attic. So, yeah, basically, uh, we have Tommy and jo- Angelica are being babysat by Grandpa Morris and Grandma Minka while the grown ups are going over to a cruise vacation. And. Then we have, um, you know, Tommy and Angelica causing a whole bunch of mayhem the moment that they arrive because they have so much um, antiques and they have so many broken, um, you know, they, they have so many easily broken items that the, to- the that Tommy and Angelica assume are toys and Boris and Mika immediately are completely overwhelmed with taking care of them. I even like that moment in which when, you know, Boris and Minka were talking about, like, turning on the Sesame Street so that, could, that the children could watch, which is a reference to Sesame Street. I actually laughed so hard when when they mentioned, Ses- when they mentioned Sesame Seed. Go, on, go and put on the seed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then they and start... funny fact, and I mean, like, I meant to say, fun fact, Arlene actually worked on Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess it would be like a little reference to that, which is not too surprising. So, yeah, basically they decide that they were going to take a nap instead. And we even have a second reference to the Dybbuk. Uh, We already mentioned this uh, in the episode Monster in the Garage, that a Dybbuk is a monster from Jewish mythology who is a um, who is basically an evil spirit. So when Angelica describes to Tommy about that, it's kind of like a ghost. Yes, it's true, but it does not haunt your bed. That's not what it does. And it's not a 
giant ghost. It's just like a regular spirit. Anyway, so uh, the one thing that I really did enjoy was uh, when Tommy was asking Angelica about like why you know he should follow her because earlier in the episode when they were going up into the attic to get uh, Tommy's crib down, uh, a ball is actually bouncing through the stairs and Angelica grabs it and she exclaims that that's what's up in the attic, toys. And so she uh, convinces Tommy to come with her so that they could be able to go to the attic together. And uh, then we have Tommy saying, where's Chucky when you need him? Be which is kind of hilarious because usually it's Chucky who doesn't want to do the adventures and Tommy's the one pushing him. And now Angelica wants to do something and Tommy is not interested in doing it because he's scared. Yeah, I <laughs> normally, actually in many ways, and I do like Angelica, but <laughs> Tommy's actually braver in many ways than Angelica, but here he's... He's actually afraid to do it this time, and Angelica's, like, the one who's trying to push him to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I kind of understand why Angelica would be, you know, forcing Tommy to go up into the attic because she's completely bored at Boris and Minka's house. You have to remember that Boris and Minka are not Angelica's grandparents. Those are Tommy's grandparents because Boris and Minka's are Didi's Dee parents and they come from, you know, Tommy's mom's side of the family where Angelica is not related to her in that way. She's related to Didi Dee Dee by marriage, not by blood. So she has absolutely no interest in being with Boris and Minka, but she has no other choice because her parents are gone away for a vacation. And the only way that she can be at least a, at least remotely interested is with, um, you know, playing with toys. And so then they slowly climb up to the attic and they look around to see if they can find the toys. And they're looking around the old junk that they have. Uh, there's um, a bunch of clothes. There's a bunch of chests. Um, then you have the record player. And then you have the uh, the model that is used for Minka when she was like sewing dresses a lot, uh, when she was younger. And then finally they were able to find the toys. And then Grandpa Boris finds out that they're, they're missing. And so he goes upstairs to the attic. And he uh, finds uh, Tommy and Angelica, but not without, you know, the window being opened and the sheet going on top of him thinking, and now they think that he's a ghost. But before we get to that moment, I really do enjoy the reference uh, when Tommy and when um, when Boris actually goes outside and retrieves two kids and Minka looks and she says, good work, Mr. Columbo, but there's a problem. You got the wrong kids. Uh, Columbo just so happens to be a reference to uh, a TV series around the 60s and 70s where it is our uh, Columbo is the name of a detective. So there's your little reference there. And he was played by Peter Falk. So uh, we have uh, Boris you know, and Minka coming up and they were able to find Tommy and Angelica safely with the toys. And then that was when they discussed their, about their family history, when they were looking through some old photo albums. And finally, a few days later, we have uh, Stu and Dee Dee and Drew coming back and picking them up. And Angelica talks about how much she had a fun time. And probably one of my favorite lines in the episode where she was saying like, you know, cable schmable, who, who needs TV when you have family by your side, which I thought that that was a really excellent lesson that you don't need to have television to be entertained yeah i love how angelica went from being bummed out because there's no cable to realizing that you don't need to have cable as long as you got your family by you Exactly. So overall, I did enjoy this episode. I did enjoy that we got to see Tommy and Angelica together, which we haven't seen in a bit. I think that the last time we did see them together was like in Family Reunion. But here, I think that the episode was able to utilize them a little bit better, probably because we didn't have too many cousins to be in the way. And also, it was a lot more tightly um, knit with only just one location as opposed to a giant farm. And it does get a bit of a creep factor to it. It kind of reminiscing of the stuff from season one like um candy bar creep show and monster in the garage so and and also we got a little bit of family history involved so uh yeah i did enjoy this episode me too so it was a nice little sentimental and uh nostalgic piece yeah all right so let's go over to our next episode episode 38a it's called driving miss angelica uh, it was written by jonathan greenberg and premiered on may 2nd 1993 after, after Angelica saving Chucky's life, he becomes her personal slave. Now, the reference to the title is based off of the movie um, 
driving Miss Daisy, in which we have the we have the guy, uh, we have the driver who's played by Morgan Freeman, and he's constantly driving around and taking care of this old woman who's just absolutely nasty to her. But over time, she grows to like him more. So it's basically a reference to that. So the episode begins with um, Tommy, Chucky, and Angelica outside enjoying, um, you know, join you know playing outside. And Tommy is asking Angelica about why the sky is blue, and she's like, you know, why would what what else what else color would it be? And then he said, I don't know, maybe green. And then we have Chucky who sees a candy, uh, who sees a piece of candy on the sidewalk, and he decides to pick it up. But then we have these older kids who are skateboarding and biking, and Angelica saves his life. And so the reason why she did was not to save Chucky, but to prevent the candy from being crushed. So she eats the candy and it was coconut and then she decides to give it to Chucky again. And then with the talks about like, um, oh, uh, Angelica, you saved Chucky's life. And then she decides to take advantage of it with Angelica, you know, asking Chucky to be her personal slave for the rest of her, for the rest of his life. Which is definitely, uh, you know, with the whole, oh, you need to be my servant thing has been played I before. I kind of hate these types of episodes, but here is the exception because of how differently was pulled off and the creative risks and everything yeah i mean this episode this episode yeah this plot point has been done before uh with doug we've had doug accidentally breaking some sort of weird statue and judy decides to force doug into being you know her purse you know her personal slave on you know that prevents his mom to finding out that he actually broke something and then we have hey arnold i think that hey arnold is probably the closest to similarities between the two but the exception is that um Sid wants to be his sl- wants to be Arnold's personal slave because he wants to uh, pay back the deed of him saving his life from being crushed by the, the by the Mister Chicken and Halibut sign. So um, I think that uh, you know Rugrats was one of the first that played into this trope, but it would be playing off many times afterwards. And we have. Angelica forcing Chucky to do various things like giving her toys, cleaning her room, driving her around in her car, which is a much different car than what she got in Runaway Angelica. And, uh, you know, in the first one, uh, it was actually one of those like mechanical cars that you actually get to. uh, It's one of those like mechanical electric cars that you akin to like a Barbie car. But this one is more like one of those pedal cars. But anyway, so then we have Angelica seeing that Drew got some chocolates and she asked Chucky to get her some. And then we have uh, Chucky getting her the chocolates with Drew uh, confronting Angelica that the chocolates are not for uh, eating right now. They're for after dinner. And then she forces Chucky to climb all the way up to the top of the closet to retrieve the chocolates and... Then she gets locked into the closet with her completely panicking, and Chucky opens the door and saves her life, apparently, and then there's a nice reversal that Angelica is being Chucky's slave, which I thought was pretty hilarious, a nice um, role reversal at the end of the episode. I've noticed that a lot of regular episodes do that, like, normally uh, Angelica would basically try and get them to do something or uh, use the babies as a part in their game. And yet, in the end, it turns out to be the other way around. What a clever twist. I think that it makes a lot of sense for Angelica to get these kind of Um, you know, moments where she is portrayed at first as, like, being really mean and nasty, but then gets her comeuppance in the end. I think that episodes, I think that um, a character growth like that is very important, especially since um, I'm sure that if um, she were able to get away with it, I'm sure that that would make her a much more unlikable character. So Much like Alan Gregory, who gets away with pretty much everything he does. I don't think anybody likes that show. That's true. Overall, I did enjoy this episode with um, with uh, Chucky having to do everything that Angelica says, and then eventually uh, Chucky was able to save her life, and Angelica was able to, you know, become Chucky's servant at the end. And the fact that. Um, you know, Angelica was able to manipulate Chucky like she always does with manipulating the other babies, thinking that, you know, they have to do this in order for this to happen, which is classic Angelica. So, um, overall, I did enjoy it. Me too. It was 
Angel Her Her A K but I think that was really well written and I really think that worth watching again. Yeah. All right, let's go over to episode 38B, which is called Susie versus Angelica, and it was written by Joe and Zolabahir. When Susie attempts to defend the babies from Angelica, the two compete to see who is the best. So this is the episode that I think was long overdue at that point. We already had been established in the slide that Susie was essentially the anti-Angelica. And we already saw this it... Go ahead. For the hits on home with that. Yeah, for sure. I think that an episode and the fact that um, I, I think that this was an and I think this was done really well. So we essentially have the babies playing with a brand new ball, and Angelica decides to toss it away, which is akin to something that she did in Barbecue Story in the second episode. And then we have Susie coming along, uh, saying to Angelica that she's not the best in the world, and that Angelica and Susie do have a major argument until eventually they decided to compete against each other with a whole bunch of um, obstacles, such as holding breath and eating chocolate pudding, jumping on the bed to see who goes the highest, swinging on a swing to see who jumps the high, the, jumps the farthest, and Angelica loses every single time, and she constantly is asking for more but she ends up losing and Susie is the one who ends up at the top then we have the moment in which they're going on the swing and Angelica jumps way far and then Susie's like you know I think this is not a good idea let's just say that you win and Angelica's like no way I'm gonna prove that I'm the best and then Tommy comes up with the suggestion that whoever um you know whoever wins this next one is the best of them all and so they decide to have a race and so Angelica uses a fire tr uh, um, a fire truck, and Susie has a tricycle. And then we have uh, the race going on with Angelica cheating because, of course, she does. And Susie actually wins, you know, at first with Angelica yelling out, saying, "You're not supposed to win. I am," which is kind of pretty mean, but that is to be expected with Angelica. Hey, what's this ball doing here? Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about the ball. Yeah. So this guy... So, yeah, the next-door neighbor actually sees the ball, and he... Is, it real? is, it, is he a bit of a caricature of Paul? He, I think he is. I think he is a caricature of Paul, which is ironic, because we'll be discussing about that in the first episode of Season 3, but we'll be discussing about that next month. I think that they do a lot of these uh, things, like caricatures, in several different episodes... A lot of background characters are caricatures of Rugrats staff. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if anybody's actually ever pointed it out. Like, Paul is an easy one for sure, but I don't know if there's ever been uh, a dedicated, um, you know, YouTube video or website that ever actually pointed out the references to the Klasky Chupo staff who worked on Rugrats. I know Hey Arnold's done this a lot because Craig Bartlett actually posted it on his Facebook discussing about, like, oh, you know, in this episode, you know, this person and this person are in the background or, you know, in this scene right here, this store is named after one of the writers or something like that. So, yeah, Craig Bartlett is better in documenting the references to the staff more than Rugrats has. But if there is a website or a YouTube video that has documented that, then please let us know. Anyway, so continuing on, so we have um, the ball. So yeah, we have Paul Germain throwing the ball from next door and landing over towards where Angelica was, and she crashes the that she crashes the tr the fire truck and swoops over to the side, and. Then we have um, basically the the race being over with it kind of being a tie, and then she's asking about like who's gonna how are we gonna prove who's the best the biggest and best kid, and then um, you know Tommy Chucky Phil and Lil basically just say you know I don't think it really matters about who is the biggest uh, who's the biggest and best, you know each one of you guys are really good in everything in your own way, and so they decide to call it a truce. That is of course they start arguing about who has the best hair. So, yeah, the argument starts all over again. Yep, they yep they ended they ended it with the truce. It, I mean, they originally ended it. With, they called it off with the truce, and then ended it with a fight. Yeah. So yeah, this episode is pretty good because it gave us it gave us something that has been 
kind of hinted at for the longest time an episode that has Susie and Angelica competing against one another I wouldn't be surprised if maybe the reason why Susie was created well not only because of you know adding diversity into the show but maybe at the time there were some complaints from parents saying like Angelica was a bad role model for kids able to Cheryl said that in the slime book I think complaining about her being a bad role model for kids but she didn't think that she was oh i know i I know i'm just saying like i'm saying about like parents you know you know how parents tend to complain about various cartoons like oh this is a bad oh this is a bad uh show that is uh you know bad for my kids or whatever i'm forbidding them from watching it or something like that i think that the reason why uh you know one of the reasons why Susie was created was because they needed to give a character that was a good role model as opposed to angelica who acted like a bad role model for kids so I think that this episode is uh, justified for its existence. And also the competition is, you know, the competitions with Susie and Angelica are pretty hilarious. And, um, you know, seeing the final race was actually pretty gripping and, and action-packed. So I really enjoyed this episode. Me too. I give it an A. All right. Let's discuss about the last episodes of season two. We have 39A, which is called Tooth or Dare. It was written by Paul Germain and Jonathan Greenberg and premiered on May 9th, 1993. In this episode, Angelica schemes to pull out and steal Chucky's teeth in order to get money from the Tooth Fairy. So we have a sub so we have a plot about the Tooth Fairy because we have an episode in which when Angelica learns that Susie's brother lose- lost a tooth and was able to get some money, she wants to be able to do the same in which she wants to find a tooth and so she can put it under her pillow so that she- you know she can be able to get some money. And so she doesn't want to pull out anything from her mouth, so she decides to get from Tommy, but as men, as seen before in the episode Weaning Tommy, he only has one tooth. But then Chucky actually has two buck teeth, and she thinks that that would be perfect for a tooth to be pulled out from the tooth fairy. And as as you probably know that... Yeah, it's not going to be pulled out very easily because at Chucky's age of two years old, he's too young to be having loose baby teeth. I know, I didn't really think that one through. Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, it's kind of difficult to for Angelica to assume that, you know, anybody's teeth are automatically loose. I mean, for example... Yeah, because she's three years old. Exactly, she's only three years old. So, Edmund is actually older... She's actually, she's, she's actually quite bright for a three-year-old, though. That is true, yeah. But the concept of, you know, loose baby teeth, I think it's a little, I think she's a little too young to understand the concept because, you know, depending on how old you are, you can lose your baby teeth as young as four or as old as seven or eight. So she she probably had at least another year until she would understand the concept of losing baby teeth. Exactly. So, yeah, because Edmund is actually slightly, uh, because Edwin is slightly older than Susie, then he was able to be old enough to lose baby teeth. And uh, I think, and Buster, for sure, I think he already lost all of his baby teeth. And Alicia, she's 16. So, yeah, her baby teeth was gone a long time ago. So, because um, Edwin is like the third oldest, it would make a lot of sense to focus on him losing his baby teeth. So then, so basic. Uh, then Angelica tries a whole bunch of plans for pulling Chucky's tooth off, but none of them work. There's a there's actually a pretty terrifying scene where she actually grabs Tommy's ball and puts it in a toy chest and grabs a screwdriver to see if she can be able to pull it off, and it completely pops. And Chucky's afraid that that would happen to him if that were to happen, uh, if Angelica were to able to pull off his tooth. And then we have um, Angelica, you know, creating some sort of, like, toy mountain and tying string to Chucky's tooth. And that didn't work either. And then finally they come up with the idea of tying string to Spike's tail with Chucky's tooth being pulled and it would come off. But that didn't work either, especially when Angelica is being pulled away by Spike, which, you know, happened again in the episode Angelica's in Love, in which when Sp- uh, Angelica was being pulled by Spike in the wagon. So then eventually Chucky was like, I can't do this anymore because I'm too scared. And so Angelica actually talks sweetly at first, but then she starts pulling off the guns and she actually grabs some pliers and saying, That's I'm getting the thing those. With Angelica. You never know how she's going to be. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, Angelica goes into a complete scary mode when she pulls out some pliers and she yells out that she's going to get those teeth if it's the last thing she does. And they run away from her frightened until eventually they, you know, separate her from a wall and Angelica crashes into it with her teeth falling out, with, with her baby tooth falling out. And then... Then the next day, we have Angelica coming back into the house and saying that the only thing that she was able to receive was a lousy dime. And Chucky was more than happy to receive it, but uh, Angelica just felt like she was gypped. And so that's how the episode ends. So overall, this episode is pretty good, especially with the introduction of uh, the babies learning about the tooth fairy and Angelica trying a whole bunch of schemes to pull off Chucky's tooth. And... The amazing shot in Freud a moment when she eventually does get money from the Tooth Fairy, but it doesn't turn out to be enough for her liking. And Chucky does end up getting some money, and he didn't even have to pull off his tooth at all. Here's, here's something to know. South Park did a similar episode years later. Oh, really? Yeah, it's called The Tooth Fairy's Test 2000. Oh, okay. The one where they keep trying to get money so they can buy a sacred dream cast. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that, yeah. Uh, I, the the, epi- the shows that I can think of that kind of reference, like, Baby Teeth and The Tooth Fairy are... I think Arthur had an episode about that. D- uh, yeah, Arthur had two episodes about that. One about Arthur wanting to lose his baby teeth because he felt like he was too old to not lose his first tooth. And then we had DW, who actually tricked The Tooth Fairy into using a shark tooth that she got from the aquarium... And Arthur decides to give his money over to DW that way that the Tooth Fairy wouldn't, ru- wouldn't you know, be angry that she got gypped. Yeah, this plot point has been done uh, in many shows after Rugrats. So let's go over to our last episode. It's uh, 39B. It's called Party Animals, and it was written by Holly Hunkins. The grown-ups throw a costume party, and the babies think that everybody's costumes are real, including a man dressed as a baby after they rub the magic lamp. And so the episode begins with Grandpa Lou reading the babies Aladdin um, with Alibaba and the Forty Thieves. And considering that this episode came out in um, 1993, and this was like uh, less than a year before the movie, less than a year after the movie Aladdin, and the fact that it was like hugely popular, I take it that that's why they decided to write an episode akin to that. I think that's why they got the idea for the episode from. Yeah, for sure. Because Aladdin and this was... episode was really funny because of uh, the pull my finger baby. Oh, God. Yeah, we have D- we have another family member who's introduced um, in this episode that belongs to Dee Dee. We have Dee Dee's cousin, Bucky. Which, is it just me or is that just John Candy? Yeah, I think that she... I think that he's pretty much inspired by John Candy. Yeah, exactly. I I mean, think about it. You have the curly hair, the fact that he's like this overweight man who acts like a complete child. Uh, It's like that, you know, it's like Uncle Buck, you know, that movie with John Candy and Macaulay Culkin. I I I watched it as a kid. Yeah, I think that that was where the name Cousin, you know, I think that's where his name came from, from Uncle Buck, you know, Cousin Bucky. So I think that, you know, yeah, I think it's no coincidence that the character was inspired by John Candy. After finishing the story, after Grandpa Lou finishes reading the story of Aladdin to the babies, Angelica then gets her Cynthia lamp and she decides to make a wish. And her wish is, is that, um, that, you know, her and, you know, that there will be animals and there will be, um, you know, crazy and, you know, that there'll be animals walking about and it'll be like a huge party and a huge circus happening. And, um, and at first the wish doesn't come true at all. And so she decides to go to bed until the babies hear some music downstairs and they realize that their wish may have come true. We have all the adults dressed up in costumes. And um, then there's, you know, the fact that uh, Chucky was like, oh, I don't know if, the, you know, if that wish is true. And then he sees a giant moose walking by, which is something that he personally wished for. And then Tommy just goes up to him and says, any more questions? And then to- Chucky's like, no. Which I thought that was really funny. Me too. Not only does it have a nice moral the end, but... The gags in this episode really do work. Leave you laughing for hours. Especially the twist at the end. What it's do. 
Oh yeah. So yeah, there's this actually there's this a uh, bit of a debate between um, you know, Stu and Drew about who is the king of the jungle. So we have Stu dressed up as Tarzan and Drew dressed up as King Kong. And they're constantly arguing about like, oh, you know, who's the king of the jungle? It's like, oh, it's Tarzan. It's like, no, no, Tarzan's not the king of the jungle. He's the king of the apes. King Kong's the king of the jungle, which is actually a really good question. Who is the king of the jungle? Because, I mean... I guess it depends on how you see the king of the jungle. I mean, a lot of people say that, I mean, sure, a lot, I mean, Tarzan is technically called king of the jungle, and King Kong is called the eighth wonder of the world. So, yeah, maybe that should be a really interesting question. Maybe I'll actually make a poll out of this, in addition to the poll of, uh, you know, which is your favorite episode of season two. Yeah, who is the king of the jungle, Tarzan or King Kong? That should be really interesting for you guys to think about, and I'll reveal the answer in next month's episode. What do you think, ZL? Who is the king of the jungle, Tarzan or King Kong? I would definitely say Tarzan because he's had more experience in the jungle. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. I I mean, I guess it, you know, it's actually interesting about, like, we don't even know how old King Kong is. King Kong is a giant ape. He's, like, 27 feet tall. So, you know, I mean, if we were to assume that if Tarzan was the king of the apes, would he have the ability to control King Kong with his size? I mean, he was able to, I mean, King Kong has been known to fighting giant dinosaurs and giant spiders and other creatures and stuff like that, Um Tarzan is a very similar fate in which he fights against, like, a whole bunch of creatures in the jungle and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's a very hard decision to um, pinpoint on who is the actual king of the jungle. But with that, um, so we have Stu... Uh, so we have Stu being kicked out of the house by Drew, and Stu's trying to climb back up to Drew's house so he can be able to enter back into the party, and we have the police coming on by thinking that he's actually sneaking into the house as a criminal, and they are actually laughing at his costume because they don't believe that he's actually part of this costume party, and they think that it's hilarious that he's king of the jungle. And while that's going on, the babies are wishing for their parents to come back, but then they realize that the wish they made made all of the parents turn into these animals, and they're afraid. So they decide to go back into Angelica's room to wish for everything to be back to normal, but then we have the giant baby showing up. Pull my finger. Pull my finger. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that was... That's, when then Angelica that's, screamed. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That moment was hilarious, by the way, where Angelica... I agree. I Angelica sees the... I was, Angelica sees... Yeah, Angelica sees the uh, giant baby in the bathroom, and then he's yelling out, Pull my finger! And then she screams, like, bloody murder. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but, um, Cheryl's got a lot of lungs on her, that's for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. And then we have the police officers just basically making fun of Stu, talking about like how he's Tarzan, king of the jungle. And while they're in the diner, the, the, the waitress is like, oh, I thought that King Kong was king of the jungle. And then they just laugh it out. And that's how the episode ends. So overall, this episode is a lot of fun. We have, you know, Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil interacting with like these uh, grown-ups dressed in costumes. And we have Cousin Bucky, who I kind of wish he would have shown up in more episodes because he was so hilarious. But unfortunately, this would be the only episode he would appear in. And um, I end that moment with Angelica and meeting up with the giant baby and the argument between, you know, Tarzan and King Kong, whether they're king of the jungle. So, yeah, this episode was a ton of fun to watch and kind of a nice way to end off season two. I agree. I actually thought it was one of the best episodes of the season. And not only and not only that, just one of the funniest too. I, all the gags are so ingrained in my brain that I can easily recite the script for these episode for this episode. Yeah. All right. So that is every single episode of Rugrats for season two. So overall, um, what did so? Yeah. How would you compare Rugrats season two to season one? A lot of the characters and stories and animation got a lot more refined and cleaner and everything got a lot more fleshed out and the strengths that the first season had were expanded upon and it really found itself it really gained its identity but i think that season i think that season three would bring even further changes yeah we'll we'll get we'll get that next time yeah exactly 
But yeah, you're right. Absolutely, that season two was a major improvement over season one. This is where I feel that the series first started. Now, not to say that the episodes in season one are bad, but I just, I, I it's the exact same thing I'm just going to say out right in the bat that, but season one was just a bit rough around the edges. Like, the animation wasn't fully polished. The voice acting was just starting to get into the groove on how they would act, especially with Tommy's voice. I didn't even mention this in the first episode of View from the Crib, that Tommy's voice is a lot more raspier and a lot more quieter in the first season, whereas season it two... Doesn't, it doesn't sound like E.G. Daly normally. Yeah, exactly. It would sound like uh, along the lines of uh, Tammy Holbrook, the woman who voiced uh, Tommy in the pilot. But... I think that AG was probably trying to imitate her, and then uh, as the series progressed, she found her own voice. Yeah, I was just about to say that for sure. That I think that um, in the first season, EG was trying to intimidate Tammy, but then uh, around season two, I think she started to find her own voice into uh, Tommy. So the voice that everybody's familiar with. Yeah, but that would change when the revival would happen. But we'll get to that later. Um, but overall, um, yeah, this episode is a massive improvement over season t- uh, season one. Uh, they do sometimes rely on the same formula of the first season where the babies would be going to some place new and they would cause a whole bunch of wacky shenanigans and such. But this time around, they use a lot more of the imagination of um, the babies that would play off a lot more in season three, like uh, the box and Mirrorland and... Um, you know, and, and various episodes. It has a lot. It had a lot more episodes with bigger stakes, like um, the big house and showdown and teeter totter gulch. It, it it also has a better balance of focusing on more characters. Like most of the episodes on season one were about Tommy. And this time around, it does feature a lot more of the characters. We've had some episodes with Chucky. We've had some episodes with Phil and Lil. We've had some episodes focusing on Angelica. We've had some episodes focusing on Spike and Grandpa Lou. I'm going to be honest. Go ahead. Even though Tommy's the main character, I think Angelica is the real star of the show. Yeah. And I think that season two was able to um, elevate her stardom and showing off what she can, what, what she was really capable of. I agree. I very much agree on that. Yeah. A great so, a great season that is a major step up from season one and is where the show would start to go into new territory and um and uh, be what it really intended to be from the beginning. Yes. Well uh, well, not intended to be but became would become the right. series that everybody knows and loves. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's discuss about our f- top five ev- favorite episodes of season two. So, uh, what were you? S- what would you say are your five favorite episodes of this season? Spike the one, the dog, Runaway Angelica, Susie versus Angelica, Angelica's in love, trying to miss Angelica. All right. Um, my okay. My favorite episodes in season two are uh, Toy Palace, The Big House, Angelica's in love. Reptar on Ice, and The Santa Experience. I was really close to putting episodes such as Grandpa's Date and um, Let Them Eat Cake, but these five episodes I feel like are some of the best. So, all right, that should be it for our discussion of Season 2 of Rugrats. And tune in next time as we're going to be discussing about Season 3. So stay tuned for that, everybody. We'll see you then.